Peace TV, the solution for humanity. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Dear brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh My name is Muhammad Abdul Hadi and inshallah we will begin today's program with the recitation of the Holy Quran by brother Farig Zakir Naik أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قاف والقرآن المجيد بل عجبوا أن جاءهم منذر منهم فقال الكافرون هذا شيء عجيب أئذا متنا وكنا ترابا ذلك رجع بعيد قد علمنا ما تنقص الأرض منهم وعندنا كتاب حفيظ بل كذبوا بالحق لما جاءهم فهم في أمر مريج أفلم ينظروا إلى السماء فوقهم كيف بنيناها فوقهم كيف بنيناها وزيناها وما لها من فروج والأرض مددناها وألقينا فيها رواسي وأنبتنا وأنبتنا فيها من كل زوج بهيج تبصرة وذكرى لكل عبد منيب ونزلنا من السماء ماء مباركا فأنبتنا فأنبتنا به جنات وحب الحصيد والنقل باسقات لها طلع نزيد رزقا للعباد رزقا للعباد وأحيينا به بلدة ميتا كذلك الخروج كذبت قبلهم قوم نوح وأصحاب الرس وسمود وعاد وفرعون وإخوان لوط وأصحاب الأيكة وقوم تبع كل كذب الرسل فحق وعيد أفعينا بالخلق الأول بل هم في لبص من خلق جديد صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله خيرا The translation of the verses that Brother Farag just recited 
which are from Surah Qaf, Surah number 50, Ayat, verses 1 to 15. Qaf, by the honored Qur'an. But they wonder that there has come to them a foreigner from among themselves. And the disbelievers say, this is an amazing thing. When we have died and have become dust, we will return to life? That is a distant return. We know what the earth diminishes of them, and with us is a retaining record. But they denied the truth when it came to them, so they are in a confused condition. Have they not looked at the heavens above them, how we structured it and adorned it, and how it has no rifts? And the earth, we spread it out, and cast therein firmly set mountains, and made grow therein something of every beautiful kind, giving insight and a reminder for every servant who turns to Allah. And we have sent down blessed rain from the sky, and made grow thereby gardens and grain from the harvest, and lofty palm trees, having fruit arranged in layers as provision for the servants, and we have given life thereby to a dead land, thus is the resurrection. The people of Noah denied before them, and the companions of the well and Thamud, and Ad and Firaud, and the brothers of Lot, and the companions of the thicket and the people of Tubba, all denied the messengers, so my threat was justly fulfilled. Did we fail in the first creation? But they are in confusion over a new creation. Before I call upon Dr. Zakir Naik, I would like to give his brief introduction. A medical doctor by professional training, Dr. Zakir Naik is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir Naik is the president of Islamic Research Foundation, Mumbai. Dr. Zakir clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts, he is 43 years old. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last 12 years, by the year 2008, Dr. Zakir Naik has delivered more than 1,200 public talks in the USA, Canada, UK, Italy, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Botswana, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Guyana, Trinidad, and many other countries, in addition to numerous public talks in India. He has successfully participated in several symposia and dialogues with prominent personalities of other faiths. His public dialogue with Dr. William Campbell of USA on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science, held in Chicago, USA in April 2000 was a resounding success. His interfaith dialogue with prominent Hindu guru Sri Sri Ravi Shankar on the topic, the concept of God in Hinduism and Islam in the light of sacred scriptures, held at Palace Grounds, Bangalore on 21st Jan 2006, was highly appreciated by people of both the faiths. In the issue dated 22nd February 2009, 
of the Indian Express list of the 100 most powerful Indians in 2009. Amongst the billion plus population of India, Dr. Zakir Naik was ranked number 82. In the special list of the top 10 spiritual gurus of India, Dr. Zakir Naik was ranked number three. After Baba Ramdev and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar being the only Muslim in the entire list. Dr. Zakir Naik stood out most eloquently for Islam and Muslims in the present times on one of the leading and most respected news channels of India, NDTV 24-7. During the Guest This Week interview program, Walk the Talk, conducted by host Shekhar Gupta, editor-in-chief of Indian Express, telecast on 7th and 8th March 2009. Sheikh Ahmed Didat, the world-famous orator on Islam and comparative religion, who had called Dr. Zakir Didat Plus in 1994, presented a plague in May 2000 with the engraving awarded to Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Nayak for his achievement in the field of da'wah and the study of comparative religion. Son, what you have done in four years had taken me 40 years to accomplish. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Dr. Zakir Nayak appears regularly on many international TV channels in more than 200 countries of the world. He is regularly invited for TV and radio interviews. More than a hundred of his talks, dialogues, debates, and symposia are available on DVDs and VCDs. He has authored many books on Islam and comparative religion. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajmain. Amma abad. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Wal muahzad al hasna. Wajadun billati ahasan. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa yassirli amri. Wa ahlul ugdata min lisani yafqaw kawli. My respected elders and my brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Alhamdulillah, it is an honor and a pleasure for me to be invited for the third time by the Dubai International Holy Quran Award organized by the Dubai government under the patronage of Sheikh Muhammad Ashid al Maktoum the Vice President and Prime Minister of UAE and the rule of Dubai. Today's lecture is Misconceptions about Islam. It is the duty of every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. It's compulsory for every Muslim to do dawa. Dawa means an invitation a call to the non-Muslims. It is the duty of every Muslim that he invites the non-Muslims towards Islam. There are various different methodologies as well as strategies used by Muslims as far as Dawah is concerned. 
the most common strategy is whenever a Muslim meets a non-Muslim, he speaks 100 good things about Islam. Even if that non-Muslim agrees with all the 100 good things that the person has spoken about Islam, yet that non-Muslim will have few negative points behind the mind. He may say, yes, I agree about all these 100 good things about Islam, but you are the same Muslim who is a terrorist. Ah, you are the same Muslim who is a fundamentalist. Ah, you are the same people who spread your religion with the sword. You are the people who subjugated the women. Ah, you are the Muslims who marry more than one woman. These few negative points at the back of his mind will prevent him from accepting the beauty of Islam. That's the reason. Whenever I meet any non-Muslim, I ask him up front, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? With your limited knowledge, whether right or wrong, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And I make him comfortable that he can criticize Islam. If he wants, he can attack Islam. I make him comfortable and I ask him, what does he feel is wrong with the religion of Islam? And after he's made comfortable, he poses about three or four questions about Islam. And in the past couple of decades that I've been in the field of Dawah, I have realized that there are about 20 most common questions which the non-Muslims have regarding Islam. When the non-Muslim poses three or four questions about Islam, invariably, these three or four questions fall amongst the 20 most common questions. If all the Muslims know the reply to these 20 common questions posed by the non-Muslims with reason, logic, and science, with the quotation from Quran and Sahih Hadith, and the quotation of the scripture of the non-Muslim, even if he cannot make the non-Muslim accept Islam, at least he can neutralize the animosity that is there in the minds of the non-Muslims. At least he can neutralize the negative feeling that the person has regarding Islam. That's the reason it's very important that we Muslims are aware about these 20 common questions. How do these 20 common questions arise in the minds of the non-Muslims? Every day, the non-Muslims, they are being bombarded by the international media regarding misinformation about Islam. There is virulent propaganda regarding Islam in the international media. Whether you read the international newspapers, the international magazines, the radio broadcast stations, the television satellite channels, the internet, we find there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. And depending how the media portrays Islam, these 20 common questions, they keep on changing. The 20 common questions that were there a couple of decades earlier, they were different than what they are today. The 20 common questions a couple of decades later may change again. Depending upon how the media portrays Islam, similarly, the 20 common questions keep on changing in the minds of the non-Muslims. And believe me, by Allah's grace, I have traveled to most of the major countries in the world. USA, Canada, UK, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Malaysia, South Africa, India. Wherever you travel, these 20 common questions are the same. There may be an additional one or two questions depending upon the local surrounding and the environment of that place. For example, if you go in the Western countries, there may be an additional question. Why does Islam prohibit the taking and giving of interest? But the remaining 20 common questions are the same. If every Muslim masters the reply to these 20 common questions, he will be able to do the fard, the compulsory act of da'wah to the non-Muslims. When you appear for an examination, if you at least want to pass with a good grade, not excellent, at least good grade, what you do, you read the guide. You know, in India, we have the Nauni 21 most likely questions. If you want to appear and pass favorably well, then you study 
the most common questions. In India, we have Navneet, 21 most likely questions to appear in the examination. In every country, you have such books that if you want to do a shortcut and at least pass as far as the exam is concerned. Similarly, these 20 common questions will at least make you a part-time die. If it cannot make the non-Muslim accept Islam, it will at least remove the animosity that is there in the mind of the non-Muslim. Time may not permit me to cover all the 20 questions in this time due to the limited time that I have. You can surely go on the internet, on our website, www.irf.net, where all these answers are given in detail. There may be certain non-Muslims who may go out of the way and read material against Islam. For example, they may go to the anti-Islamic sites. They may read books which are written against Islam. As far as these non-Muslims are concerned, who go out of the way to find additional material against Islam, for that, we have another 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims who have gone to anti-Islamic sites and have read material against Islam. That we won't discuss today. That is, if you want to get, you know, maybe first class or distinction, you have to do that. The reply to these 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims who go to anti-Islamic sites is also given on our website, www.irf.net. As far as today is concerned, I will try and cover the major questions, the first, more than 50 percent at least, of the 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims regarding Islam. The first number one misconception regarding Islam, the top of the charts, is regarding jihad. Today, jihad is the most misunderstood word regarding Islam. It is not only misunderstood by the non-Muslims, it is even misunderstood by many of us Muslims. Non-Muslims and main Muslims think that jihad means any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for power, whether it be for wealth, whether it be for land, whether it be for language, any war fought by any Muslim for any reason is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for money, whether it be for power, whether it be for land, whether it be for language. Jihad is an Arabic word which comes from the word jahada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. In the Islamic context, jihad means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclinations. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad also means to fight against oppression. Jihad also means to fight in self-defense in the battlefield. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. For example, if a student is striving and struggling to pass in the examination, in Arabic, we say the student is doing jihad, he's striving and struggling. Many people have a misconception and they think that jihad can only be done by a Muslim. There are many verses in the Quran which say that even non-Muslim did jihad. Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail, the mother bore you, and in pain did she give you birth. Immediately after praising the parents, especially the mother, the verse continues. Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 15 says that, but if your parents do jihad, strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, besides Almighty God, of whom you have no knowledge, then don't obey them but yet live with them with love and companionship. Here the Quran is talking about non-Muslim parents doing jihad, striving and struggling to make their children do shirk, worship somebody else besides Allah. A similar message is given in Surah Al-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 8, that we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. But if their parents do jihad, they strive and struggle to make you worship, 
somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, besides Almighty God, then don't obey them. So here the Quran is talking about non-Muslim parents doing jihad. And there are various such examples of Quran mentioning non-Muslims doing jihad. Now this type of jihad, in Arabic, we say jihad fi sabil shaitan. Jihad in the way of the Satan. What we Muslims should do is jihad fi sabilillah, jihad in the way of Allah. And whenever the word is mentioned individually about jihad, in the Islamic context, it is understood it is jihad fi sabilillah. Most of the non-Muslims, including many so-called Muslim scholars, inverted commas, they translate jihad as the holy war. Holy war, if you translate in Arabic, it means harbu muqaddasa. If you read the Quran, if you read the Hadith, there is no Quranic verse, there is no Hadith which uses the word harbu muqaddasa. The word holy war doesn't exist in the Quran, neither in the Hadith. Jihad, as I mentioned, basically means to strive and struggle. And one type of jihad is also fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is kital in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But jihad doesn't basically mean a war. One type of jihad, the various jihad for nafs, one type of jihad is fighting in self-defense in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we see the history of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu the first 13 years of his prophethood that he lived in Makkah, there were many Quranic verses that were revealed, all the Makkan surahs. Many a time in these verses, the word jihad was used. And never did the Muslims ever fight, physically fight. Only when they migrated to Medina, then the wars took place. But yet you find the word jihad in several verses of the Quran which were revealed in Makkah. Many examples I can give you. For example, the Quran says in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, that those who do jihad in the way of Allah, those who strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we open up the pathways for them. When the verse was revealed, there was no war at that time. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 52, that do not follow the unbelievers, but do jihad against them, strive against them strenuously with the Quran. That means you do jihad with the Quran. Jihad with the Quran means strive to convey the message of Allah. Do you think you're going to fight with the Quran? So here we realize that this misconception regarding the word jihad, it is depending how the media portrays. This word jihad wasn't a problem a couple of decades earlier. After 9-11, it came on top of the charts, number one. Previously, it wasn't there. So depending how the media portrays Islam, these misconceptions arise in the minds of the non-Muslims. For more details on jihad, you can see my lecture, my talk, Terrorism and Jihad and Islamic Perspective. The second most common question today, according to me, that is there in the minds of the non-Muslims is that Muslims are fundamentalists. And many a time we Muslims feel ashamed and we don't know how to reply. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist by definition means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject. For example, if a mathematician wants to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. For a person who wants to be a good scientist, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. You cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. If we have a fundamentalist robber in the society, whose profession is to rob, he's a bane for the society. 
On the other hand, if we have a fundamentalist doctor whose profession is to save thousands of human lives, he's good for the society. So depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. As far as I'm concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim, and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. Because I know, follow, and I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be a few fundamentals which the non-Muslims may think it is against humanity, but the moment you reply to them or tell them the logical reason why these things are in Islam, there is not a single human being who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. When we go back in history, we come to know that according to the Webster Dictionary, fundamentalism was first time used to describe a group of American Christians in the early part of the 20th century. These American Christians, they protested against the church, and they said, previously the church believed that the complete message of the Bible was from God. These Protestant Christians, they protested against the church and said, not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If someone can prove that every letter, every word of the Bible is from Almighty God, then this movement is a good movement. On the other hand, if someone can prove that every word, every letter of the Bible is not from Almighty God, then this movement is not a good movement. When we read the Oxford Dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient or fundamental doctrines of any religion. But when we read the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary, there's a slight change. It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient scriptures or fundamentals of any religion, especially Islam. Especially Islam has been added in the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary. The moment you hear the word fundamentalist, immediately you start thinking of a Muslim. The Muslims, they're fundamentalists, they're extremists. And we Muslims, we are becoming apologetic. No, 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 I'm not a fundamentalist. No, no, I'm not an extremist. I say, I am an extremist. I'm extremely honest, I'm extremely just, I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely merciful, I'm extremely loving. <laughs> Can anyone tell me why being extremely just, extremely honest, extremely loving, extremely merciful, extremely kind is bad? What's wrong in being an extremist? The Quran says you have to be extremely honest. You can't be partly honest when benefits you, you're honest. When doesn't benefit you, you're dishonest. The Quran says you have to be extremely honest, extremely just. So if you are a practicing Muslim, you have to be extremely kind, extremely honest, extremely just. We have to be extremist in the correct direction. We should not be extremist in the wrong direction. But a Muslim should be extremist in following the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 28, Allah says, Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. You can't say partly. So why are the Muslims becoming apologetic? The media is attacking Islam, and unfortunately, we Muslims, we have the best deen. But why are we afraid? Why are we apologetic? It's time that we turn the tables over. The third most common misconception is Muslims are terrorists. And after 9-11, you had the 7th July, that's the London bombing, and there was a common statement which said, all Muslims are not terrorists. But all terrorists are Muslims. And it was very common on the media, and that gave rise to a new lecture of mine, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? Time does not permit me to 
speak in detail about Ishtar is the Muslim monopoly, but you're most welcome to see on the Peach TV or on our website. We know from the media that many a time two different labels are given to the same individual for the same activity. For example, more than 60 years back, there were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. These people, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But we common Indians, we call these people as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government that they had a right to rule over India, then you have to call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that Britishers came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, then you have to call these people as patriots, you have to call these people as freedom fighters. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. And I very often attend the media. And while having interaction with the Indian press, I ask them a question that do you consider Bhagat Singh as a terrorist? So he said, no. I said, why? The same Western media, when they call Bhagat Singh as a terrorist, you say, no, he's not a terrorist. Why? Because you know the background of the history of India freedom. Even I consider Bhagat Singh as not to be a terrorist. But the same Western media, today, when they call Muslims terrorists, why do you agree? Have you done research? They started to laugh. Quran says in Surah Jura, chapter 49, verse number 6, whenever you get information, you check it up before you pass to the third person. The point to be noted is that when the British government called Bhagat Singh a terrorist, you didn't agree. Now why would you agree with them? Why these double standards? And you have several such examples. When we read the history of the American Revolution, in 1775, during the American Revolution, George Washington, he was called as the terrorist number one by the British government, when the British was ruling America. The British has called George Washington as terrorist number one. Later on, when America gets its freedom, George Washington is made the president of USA. Imagine, terrorist number one becomes the president of USA. And he happens to be the godfather of all the presidents to come, including George Bush. And you find several such examples, several. You have the example of Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, several decades earlier, when South Africa was ruled by the white apartheid government, Nelson Mandela was arrested and was imprisoned in Robben Islands for more than 25 years. By the white apartheid government, Nelson Mandela was called as terrorist number one. Later on, when South Africa gets its freedom, and the white apartheid government is removed, Nelson Mandela is given freedom, and he gets the Nobel Prize for peace. <laughs> Imagine terrorist number one of the world gets the Nobel Prize for peace. Not that he was bad and he became good. For the same activity for what he was called a terrorist, 30 years later, he gets the Nobel Prize for the same activity, Nobel Prize for peace. <laughs> so we realize whoever is in power, Whatever label that person gives, that gets stuck on to that person. This is media. Media is very powerful. According to me, it is the most important weapon today. It can convert black into white, day into night, hero into a villain, villain into a hero. This is media. Unfortunately, we Muslims, we are very backward as far as media is concerned. Our technology, you know, whatever technology is halal, what is permitted in Quran and Sunnah, we have to use it. We have to convert it to halal. Television per se is not haram. I do agree, 99% things that come on television is haram. We have to convert the haram into halal. And that's how we have to convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best way today that you can convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the satellite channel, it is the media. At least we can give shahada, we can tell on the Day of Judgment 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least we tried our level best to let the message of Islam reach every home, or at least as many homes as possible. And alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, since three and a half years after the launch of Peace TV, now the viewership of Peace TV is more than 100 million. Alhamdulillah. People may be wondering that, you know, why are there so many cameras? People are saying, why 12 cameras required? One lecture, one man, 12 cameras. One man and 12 cameras. The television channel says, oh, we only use two or three cameras. 12 cameras because we want to present Islam in a beautiful manner. When you have rock show, that time 12 cameras, no problem. When Dai gives a lecture, why only two cameras? See, today is the age of science and technology. When we want to convince the youngsters, the media is taking them on the wrong track. We have to use the same media to get our youngsters on the right track, from wrong track to the right track. And believe me, we know, I agree, that majority of the media is haram. But as long as we don't break any rule of the Sharia, of the Quran and Sahih Hadith, we can use this media to the benefit of the spread of Islam. The fourth most common misconception in the minds of the non-Muslim is Islam was spread by the sword. What is the meaning of the word Islam? Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word silm, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. Islam, in short, means peace acquired by submitting our will to Almighty God. So if I translate, Islam was spread by the sword, it means peace was spread by the sword. It's contradictory. How can peace be spread by the sword? And we know that every human being in the world would not want peace to prevail. Islam is a religion of peace. Its main aim and objective is to spread peace. But every human being in this world would not want peace to prevail. That's the reason every country in the world has a police force. This police force many a time uses force to maintain peace in that country. They don't use force to disrupt peace. If the anti-social elements want to disrupt peace, the police of the various countries, they use force to maintain peace in that country. Similarly, in Islam, Islam is against violence. It's against fighting. It's against using force, except as a last resort to maintain peace. Similarly, Islam does give permission to use force to let justice and peace prevail in that land. And the best reply to this allegation that Islam was spread by the sword is given very well by a very famous historian by the name of Delisi O'Leary. In the book, Islam at the Crossroad, on page number eight, history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic myth that historians have ever repeated. I will like to repeat his statement. Delacy O'Leary says in the book Islam at the Crossword, page number eight, that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races, is the most fantastic myth that historians have ever repeated. Which sword? We Muslims, we ruled Spain for 800 years. We didn't do the job. We didn't convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. Later on, the Crusaders came, the Christians came, and they wiped out the Muslims. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the azan. If you read history, the religion that was spread by force was the religion of Christianity. If you read history, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in the name of Christianity. And today, these same people are telling that Islam was spread by the sword. We Muslims, we have been the rulers of the Arab land for the past 1400 years. 
For a few years, the British have came. For a few years, the French came. But as a whole, the Muslims have been the rulers of the Arab land for the past 14 years. Yet today, there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means the Christians in generation. These 14 million Coptic Christians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam wasn't spread by the sword. We Muslims, we ruled India for more than a thousand years. If we wanted, we could have converted each and every Indian at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. Today, more than 80% of the Indians are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was spread by the sword. Today, the country which has the maximum number of Muslims, it is Indonesia. Which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army went to Malaysia? Malaysia has more than 50% Muslims. Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? The reply is given by Thomas Carlyle, a very famous historian from Europe. He writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship, and he places Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his hero. And he writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship, that which sword? First, you have to find your sword. Which sword? First, you have to find your sword. Every new idea originates in the mind of one. In one man's head, it dwells alone. One man against the whole world. It will do little good that he picks up a sword and propagates it. You have to find your sword. He's talking about the sword of intellect. Which sword has made hundreds and thousands of human beings to accept Islam? He's talking about the sword of intellect. And I started my talk by quoting a verse of the glorious Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, he says, Udu hasna, wajadun asan. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. It is the sort of reason, logic, which is conquering the hearts of the people. It's not the sort of metal. Even if we had the sword of steel, we could not use it. Because Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 256, like Rahafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. But truth stands out clear from error. Thomas Carlyle is talking about the sort of intellect, the sort of reasoning. There was a survey done by the reader Rajesh Almanik yearbook in 1984. And the article was reprinted in the Plain Truth magazine. It did a survey of the increase in the major world religions in a span of 50 years, from 1934 to 1984. And in that survey, the religion that spread maximum number one, it was Islam, 235%. <laughs> Christianity, only 47%. I am asking a simple question. Which war took place in the span of 50 years between 1934 and 1984, which forced tens of thousands of human beings to accept Islam. Which war? Today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. I am asking, who is forcing these Americans and Europeans to accept Islam? Which thought? Today, the media it's attacking Islam and saying Islam subjugates the woman. Do you know, out of those accepting Islam in America and Europe, two-thirds of them are women. If Islam subjugates the woman, why are the American women, why are the European women accepting Islam? Who's forcing them? <laughs> Yesterday we saw, mashallah, a Westerner, a lady. Mashallah, she gave shahada, she accepted Islam. Who forced her? Did we use the sword? We use the sword of intellect. The sword of reasoning. To end the answer to this question on was Islam spared with the sword, I'd like to quote to you the saying of Adam Pearson. Adam Pearson says, people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry 
will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb, the bomb of peace, has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. The fifth most common question asked by the non-Muslim is, why does Islam allow a Muslim man who have more than one wife? What does Islam say? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number three, marry women of a choice in twos, threes, or fours. But if you can't do justice, marry only one. Quran says, marry women of a choice in twos, threes, or fours. But if you can't do justice, marry only one. That means only if you can do justice, can you marry two, three, or four. Otherwise, marry only one. Quran also says in Surah Nisa, chapter four, verse 129, it is difficult to be just between your wives. But don't turn away from them altogether. Many people think it is compulsory in Islam that you should have four wives. It is not compulsory in Islam to have four wives. It is optional. Marrying more than one woman is optional in Islam. It is mubah. But if you marry more than one woman, and if you don't do justice, then you're in problem. So if you marry more than one woman, you should be able to do justice between them. Let us analyze what are the logical reasons why Islam permits a Muslim man to have more than one wife. By nature, we know males and females are born in equal proportion. But in the pediatric age itself, you ask any medical doctor, he will tell you that medically, the female sex is the stronger sex. The female child has more immunity than a male child. The female child can fight the germs and diseases much better than the male child. So in pediatric age itself, there are more deaths among the male children as compared to female children. So in the pediatric age itself, there are more females as compared to males. There are wars taking place. In the wars, there are more men who are being killed as compared to women. As life goes on, deaths take place due to accidents due to alcoholism, due to drug addiction, due to disease. In all these cases, more males are dying as compared to females. And today's statistics tell us that the average span of a woman is much more than the average span of a man. Today, there are more females in the world as compared to males. In some third world countries, like India, where I come from, the female population is less than the male population. And the reason is, because of female infanticide and female feticide. There's a program by the name Let Her Die. Under the banner assignment, it came on BBC, where a British reporter by the name of Emily Beckenin, she says that every day, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they're females. In India alone, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they're females. If you multiply this number by 365, the number of days in a year, we get a figure of more than 1 million fetuses are being aborted every year in India after they identified that they're females. And according to the report of the Government Hospital of Tamil Nadu, out of 10 females born alive, four are put to death. If this evil practice of female infanticide and female fetuses stops in India. Even in India, in a few decades, the female population will outnumber the male population. Today, when we analyze throughout the world, there are more females as compared to males. In New York alone, there are 1 million females more than males. In USA alone, there are 7.8 million females more than males. In UK alone, there are 4 million females more than males. In Germany alone, there are 5 million females more than males. In Russia alone, there are 9 million females more than males. And God alone knows how many millions of females are more than the males throughout the world. If I agree with a non-Muslim that every man should marry only one woman, and suppose my sister, or suppose your sister happens to live in USA, and if the market is saturated, every woman has found a life partner for herself. Yet, there will be 7.8 million females who will not find husbands. And if, unfortunately, your sister or my sister 
happens to live in USA, and if she's amongst one of those 7.8 million females who has not found a husband, what is the option she has? The only option she has is that she either marries a man who already has a wife, or she becomes public property. <laughs> public property? Many people say, Dr. Zakir Nai, such a harsh word. It is the most sophisticated word I can use. I cannot think of a better word. There's no option. She either marries a man who already has a wife or becomes public property. In America, having mistresses is very common. The American statistics tell us, on an average, a man has eight different sexual partners before he settles on with one. Eight different. Some may have five, some may have 10, some may have 20. Eight different sexual partners before he marries. After marry, how many has the statistics doesn't say that. But before he marries, he has on an average eight different sexual partners. Having mistresses in America is common, no problem. 10, 20, no problem. Having two wives doesn't go down their throat. You know, when a woman becomes the second wife of a man, she gets honor, she gets a right. She lives a very peaceful life with grace, with honor, with all her rights. And when a woman is a mistress, she doesn't get her rights, she has no protection, she leads a life of disgrace. Therefore, Islam permits some men to have more than one wife to protect the woman. And I do agree if someone tells me that no woman would like to share the husband, I agree with them. I don't argue. I agree with you that no woman under normal circumstances would like to share the husband. But the Islamic Sharia says, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. That means a good Muslimah who knows the situation of the world would not mind sharing a husband to prevent her sister from becoming a public property. You ask any modest woman, would she prefer becoming the wife of a man who already has a wife or becoming public property? Any modest woman would choose the first one. Sixth most common question. If Islam allows a man to have more than one wife, why does not Islam allow a woman to have more than one husband? As far as marrying women is concerned, the categories of women a man can marry is clearly specified in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 22 to 24. And it's mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 24, that you cannot marry a woman who's already married. That means in Islam, a woman cannot have more than one husband. Before I give you the real reason, imagine there's already a scarcity of women finding husband if a woman has more than one husband, this scarcity will increase. It will multiply the problem. Let's analyze what are the logical reasons that Islam prohibits a woman to have more than one husband. When a man has more than one wife, and if any child is born out of that wedlock, you can easily identify who is the father as well as who is the mother. But if a woman has more than one husband, and if a child is born, you can identify the mother, but you will not be able to identify the father. <laughs> and if you go to admit that child in school, and if they ask you what is the name of the father, you may have to give two names. <laughs> and today, psychology, they tell us that identifying the parents is very important for a healthy childhood, especially the identity of the father. If you cannot identify the parents, the child has a lot of mental trauma. Today, after science has advanced, I'm aware that there is DNA testing and genetic testing where you can identify who is the father and who is the mother, though it's not very accurate. But even if I agree that maybe after a few years it becomes accurate, yet it has happened recently. All these years it wasn't there. And this is not the only reason why a woman is not allowed to have more than one husband. There are various other reasons. For example, today science tells us that a man is more polygamous in nature as compared to a woman. 
Today, science tells us that because of the various behavioral and psychological changes that take place in a woman during menstrual cycle, she cannot do the role of multiple wives simultaneously. Whereas a man, he can do the role of multiple husbands simultaneously. Furthermore, if a woman has more than one husband or more than one sexual partner, and if all of them are loyal to each other, yet there are high chances that venereal diseases and sexual transmitted disease will emerge. And it can be retransmitted back to the man. Whereas if a man, today medical science tells us, that if a man has more than one sexual partner, has more than one wife, and if all of them are loyal to one another, there are hardly any chances of venereal diseases or sexually transmitted diseases emerging in them. So scientifically also, and medically, it's no problem for a man to have more than one wife, but it's problematic for a woman to have more than one husband. The seventh most common question, or the seventh misconception in Islam, in the minds of non-Muslims is that, why does Islam subjugate the woman by keeping her behind the veil? Why does Islam subjugate the woman by keeping her in hijab? Before I discuss the reason of hijab, let us analyze what was the status of the woman in the past civilizations. When we read the history of Babylonian civilization, it says that women were ill-treated. And if a man committed murder, his wife was put to death. This was the law. If you read the history of the Greek civilization, known as a very great civilization, at that time, they believed in an imaginary woman by the name of Pandora, who was the cause of all the evil in the society. In that great Greek civilization, women were used for sex and pleasure. Prostitution was common. When you read the history of Roman civilization, even in Roman civilization, the women were looked down upon. Nudity and prostitution was common. When we read the history of Egyptian civilization, the woman was considered as an evil, and she was called as an instrument of the devil. When we read the history of Arab civilization, before Quran was revealed, the Arabs, very often, they buried the female alive after she was born. Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. After the revelation of the Quran, this evil practice has stopped, but yet it persists in other parts of the world. Islam, alhamdulillah, uplifted the woman. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, was the major benefactor in giving the rights to the woman. And after Islam has given rights to the woman, it has even shown us a way how that woman should maintain her status. Hijab has been prescribed to the woman so that she maintains the status and doesn't go back to the old days. Normally, people talk about hijab for the woman, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then speaks about the hijab for the woman. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman, if any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes, he should lower his case. This is what the Quran says. Once, there was a Muslim man who was staring at a girl for a long time. I told him, brother, what are you doing? This is haram in Islam. He told me, a beloved prophet said, the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited, I have not completed half my glance. <laughs> what did the prophet mean when he said, the first glance is forgiven, second is prohibited? What the Prophet meant was that if you unintentionally look at a woman, don't look at her again. That does not mean you can look at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying, I have not completed my glance. The next verse of Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 31, speaks about the hijab for the woman. That whenever a woman looks at a man, and if any breath and thought comes, she should lower her gaze. There are basically six criteria for hijab given in the glorious Quran and Hadith regarding the clothing of hijab. The first is the extent. 
as far as for the man is concerned, the extent is from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only parts that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria for the man and the woman are the same. The second is the clothes they wear, they should be loose. It should not be tight fitting so that it reveals the figure. The third, it should not be transparent or translucent so that a person can see through it. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. These are basically the six criteria for hijab regarding clothing, but this does not constitute the complete hijab. The complete hijab besides the hijab of the clothing also includes the behavior, the conduct, the attitude, as well as the intention of the person. Besides the hijab of the clothing, there's hijab of the eyes, hijab of the heart, hijab of the mind, hijab of the thought. It even includes way a person talks, the way a person walks, the way a person behaves. This is the complete hijab. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 59, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak, they should put on the jilbab, so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. Quran says, hijab has been prescribed for the women so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. I'd like to ask you a question. Let's suppose two twin sisters who are very beautiful, who are equally beautiful, if they are walking down the streets of Dubai, walking down along the Cornish, and if one twin sister, she's wearing the Islamic hijab, the complete body covered, except the face and the hands up to the wrist, and the other twin sister, she's wearing the Western clothes, the mini skirts or shorts. And if both of them are walking down the streets in Dubai, along the Cornish, and if on the side there is a ruffian who's waiting for a catch, who's waiting to tease a girl, I'm asking the question, which girl will it tease? Will it tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab or will it tease the girl wearing the Western clothes, the mini skirts or short? Which girl will it tease? Which girl? But natural, the girl wearing the Western clothes, the mini skirts or short. If you're inviting, then you'll receive. Quran rightly says that hijab has been prescribed to prevent the woman from being molested. And after this, if anyone rapes any woman, the Islamic Sharia says death penalty. Many non-Muslims will say death penalty. In this age of 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless law. But when I ask this question, and I've asked this question to thousands of non-Muslims, that suppose, God forbid, someone rapes your mother or someone rapes your sister. And if you are made the judge and the rapist is brought in front of you, what punishment will you give him? Believe me, all of them said, 100%, we will put him to death. Some went to the extreme of saying, we will torture him to death. So someone rapes your mother, your wife, your sister, you want to put him to death. Someone rapes somebody else's mother, somebody else's sister, you say, death penalty, barbaric law. Why these double standards? Why? And do you know, America, USA, which happens to be the most advanced country in the world, do you know it has one of the highest rates of rape in the world? The country which has one of the highest rate of rape in the world is USA. According to the FBI statistics of 1990, every day, 1,756 cases of rape took place. According to the statistics of U.S. Department of Justice, in 1996, every day, 2,713 cases of rape took place. 1990, 1,756. 1996, 2,713. Maybe the Americans got bold, bolder. In six years' time, they got more bold. If you calculate, every 32 second, one rape is taking place in America. You know, we are here in this auditorium for the past one and a half hour. Already 150 rapes may have taken place in USA till the time we are here. I am asking you the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia 
any man looks at a woman, he should lower his gaze. The woman should be modestly dressed, complete body covered, accept the face and hands up to the wrist. And after that, any man rapes any woman, capital punishment, death penalty. I am asking you the question, will the rate of rape in America, will it increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia, you get results. That's the reason the least rate of rape in any country in the world, it's in Saudi Arabia. You implement the Sharia, you get results. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman when it speaks about women's liberalization, it's nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of a body, deprivation of a soul, and degradation of honor. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman have actually degraded her to a status of concubines, butterflies, and mistresses, which are mere tools in the hands of pleasure seekers and sex marketers hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. In the name of art and culture, the Westerners, they're selling their daughters, they're selling their mothers. And you see it very common. In most of the ads, invariably, you have to find a woman. You see an ad of a motorcycle, how many women ride motorcycle, yet you see a woman in the ad of motorcycle. In the ad of a car, percentage-wise, a small percentage of women drive cars. Yet you'll find a woman in that of a car. And I was told about a very famous advertisement ad of the BMW. You know BMW car? It's in competition with Mercedes. The youngsters, they prefer BMW. It has a better pickup. It is fast. Someone told me in one of the very famous ads of BMW, there was a woman who was standing in front of the car with a bikini, and the ad read, test driver now. Who, the girl or the car? So in the name of women liberalization, they are selling their daughters. They are selling their mothers. We love our daughters. We love our mothers. We love our wives. If the hijab subjugates the woman and protects her, we love this subjugation. We love this subjugation and we love this protection. If this is your freedom in the name of women liberalization, selling your body, selling yourself, we are very happy with our religion. Islam has prescribed women hijab to protect her and to uplift her. And we see today the same thing is happening in the Western world. Same thing what happened in Greek civilization, Roman civilization, women in the name of liberalization, art, culture, modeling, fashion, TV, all this you see, what are they doing? Going back to the old age. The eighth most common question, as by a non-Muslim, is that why does Islam permit a Muslim to have non-veg food? You know, killing animal is a ruthless act. So why does Islam permit a Muslim to have non-vegetarian food? I would like to mention at the outset that a Muslim can be a very good Muslim even by being a pure vegetarian. There's no verse in the Quran that, that says it's compulsory for the Muslim to have non veg food. But since the Quran and our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have given permission for the human beings to have non veg, why should we not have? The Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number one Ya Yolazina Amnu, O you believe, fulfill your obligations and eat of the four footed animals with the exception name. Eat of the meat of the four footed animals with the exception name. Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 5, we have created for you cattle, and from it you derive warmth and many benefits, and of the meat you can eat. Quran says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21, that verily in the cattle is an instructive sign for you. We give you to drink from what is within the bodies, and you derive many benefits from them, and of the meat you can eat. So when Quran has given permission to have the meat of the lawful animals, then why should we Muslims not have it? Let's analyze the scientific as well as the logical reasons for having non veg food. Today, science tells us that in non vegetarian food, it is a wholesome food. It's rich in protein. And the body requires amino acid. There are eight amino acids which are not created in the body 
it has to be given by the external diet. It's known as essential amino acids. Only in the flesh food do you have all the eight essential amino acids. Therefore, the meat is called as a complete protein. There is no vegetarian food which has all the essential amino acids in it. Furthermore, meat is rich in niacin, vitamin B, and it's a wholesome food. There are many non-Muslims, especially the Hindus, they say that why do Muslims have non-veg? Indians, besides India, they're present throughout the world, 20% population of the world. You go to any part in the world, USA, Canada, UK, Dubai, you'll find Indians there. So it has become a common question throughout the world. I tell them that if you analyze the set of teeth of the herbivorous animals, cow, goat, sheep, they only have vegetables. If you see the set of teeth, they have a flat set of teeth called as herbivorous set of teeth. If we analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animals who only have flesh food, lion, tiger, leopard, they have pointed set of teeth. They have the canine set of teeth. If you analyze the set of teeth of the human beings, if you go in the mirror and see, we have flat teeth as well as pointed teeth. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did he give us the pointed teeth, the canine teeth? For what? <laughs> to have non-veg. Furthermore, if we analyze the diocese system of the herbivorous animals, cow, goat, sheep, they can only digest vegetables. If they take flesh food, they will not be able to digest it. If we analyze the digestive system of the carnivorous animals, the tiger, the leopard, the lion, they can only digest flesh food. They cannot digest vegetables. But the digestive system of the human beings can digest veg food as well as non-veg food. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did he give us a digestive system which can even digest non-veg food? But natural to have it. We have a small intestine as well as a large intestine for having both veg food and non-veg food. We are neither herbivorous, neither carnivorous. We are omnivorous. And many of the Hindus have a misconception that Hinduism prohibits a human being from having non-veg food. If you read the scriptures of the Hindus, in several scriptures, several places it says that sages, saints, had non-veg food. If you read Manusmriti, chapter number 5, verse number 30, it says that the eater, if he eats the flesh of the thing which is to be eaten, then it is good, even if he does it day after day. Because God has created some to be eaten, and some to become eater. When you read Manu Smriti, chapter number 5, verse number 31, it says that eating meat in sacrifice is not a sin. It is the law of the gods. It's mentioned in Manu Smriti, chapter number 5, verse number 39, as well as 40, that God created sacrificial animals. So killing animals in sacrifice is not considered as killing. Furthermore, when you read Mahabharat, Anushasan Parv, chapter number 88, regarding the Pandavas, the five brothers, the eldest brother Yudhishthir, he asks Bhishma that while they were doing puja, yagna, for the ancestors, he asks Bhishma that what should we give in puja, in yagna, so that our ancestors will be satisfied. So Bhishma replies that if you put in the puja herbs, vegetables, and fruits, the ancestors will be satisfied for one month. If you give fish, two months. If you give meat, three months. If you give hair, four months. If you give meat of the goat, five months. If you give bacon, meat of the pig, six months. If you give birds, seven months. If you give deer, eight months. And the menu continues. If you give a buffalo, 11 months. And if you give cow, our ancestors will be satisfied for one full year. That is beef. And if you give rhinoceros meat or red meat of goat, our ancestors will be satisfied inexhaustibly. 
There's a big menu, imagine. Vegetables, fish, meat, hair, what, everything is there in the menu. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, it was permitted to have non-veg. It is later on, when the Hindus were being influenced by other non-Hindus, and tried to take their philosophy that they converted and tried to make their religion into vegetarianism, though all Hindus aren't vegetarians. Now when we ask these people, that why are you a vegetarian? They tell us that killing animal is a sin. Because killing living creatures is a sin. So I said, I agree with you. If a person can live without killing living creatures, I'm with you. Today, science tells us that even the plants have got life. Previously, people did not know that plants and vegetables had life. So now the logic has changed. No, no, we understand, we realize plants have got life, but plants can't feel pain. Therefore, killing animal is a bigger sin as compared to killing a plant. Now science has further advanced and we have come to know that even the plants can feel pain. Though we cannot hear the cry of the plant, but even the plants can feel pain. They don't have a very well-developed system, but they can feel pain. And there was a research done in America that a farmer had made a gadget where you could make the cry of the plant be heard to the human ear. Because the human ear only hears between 20 cycles to 20,000 cycles per second. Anything below and above this, the human being can't hear. Like this is below 20 cycles, I can't hear. If I do fast, I can hear because it's above 20 cycles. You know the dogs, they can hear up to 40,000 cycles per second. So you may have heard about the silent dog whistle. You blow the whistle, the frequency is between 20,000 and 40,000 cycles per second. The human beings can't hear, the dog here and comes to the master. So the cry of the plant cannot be heard by the human being. So there was a research done in America where a farmer makes a gadget and whenever the plant wanted more water, it would cry out, he used to convert the cry and he could hear it. So today, science tells us that even the plants can feel pain. So now, there is a non-Muslim argument to maximize it. Okay, but Zakir, I agree with you that plants have got life, the plants can feel pain, but you know, plants have got about two senses less as compared to animals. You know, animals have got five senses, plants have got three senses. So I say, okay, for sake of argument, I agree with you. The plants have got three senses, animal has got five senses. So I ask him the question that suppose if you have a brother who's born deaf and dumb, and if someone comes and kills him, Will you go and tell the judge, me Lord, give this murderer less punishment because my brother had two senses less? In fact, you'll go and tell the judge, give this murderer double punishment. My brother was masoom, could not hear, could not speak. Give him double punishment. So where is the logic two senses less or so less punishment? In Islam, it does not work two senses less or two senses more. Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter two, verse 168, Eat of the things which are good and halal for you. What is permitted and what is good you can have. So what is halal, what is lawful, and what is permitted and what is good you can have. As far as non-Muslims who are against eating non-veg, you know, if I agree that, fine, we should not kill any animals, you know, the population of the cattle, it grows so fast that if we stop eating animals, there'll be overpopulation of cattle in the world. So now we have overpopulation of human beings in some countries, India, China. We'll have problems with overpopulation of cattle. And personally, if non-Muslims don't have non-veg, I've got no problem. Believe me, I've got no problem. Because if in India, all the non-Muslims start having non-veg, then maybe the price of mutton and beef will go up. So for me, no problem. If they don't have non-veg, I've got no problem. But if someone tells me that eating non-veg is haram, it's a sin, that's the time I give all this logical explanation. The ninth most common misconception asked is that non-Muslims say, we don't have any problem that Muslims have non-veg food, but why do the Muslims slaughter the animals so ruthlessly? No, Zabiha, slowly you torture and kill the animals, slowly and steadily, you are ruthless people. So once there was a Muslim, who was having an argument with the Sikh. In India, we have Sikhs, those who wear the turban. So the Sikh was telling, you Muslims are ruthless, you are merciless. Why do you torture the animal? One jhatka, fatak, an animal dies. So the Muslim told him that you Sikhs, 
You all are cowards. You all attack the animal from behind. We are Marth ka bachcha. We are masher. We attack from the front. <laughs> this is his hikma. This is not the reason why we do zabiha. It is his hikma. He had no argument, so he said, "We are Marth ka bachcha, masher. We attack from the front. You all are cowards. We attack from behind." The real logical scientific reason is that why do we do zabiha? Why do we slaughter in the Islamic method? In the Islamic method of slaughtering, the knife should be very sharp. It should be swift, so animals feel the least pain. Secondly, we cut the throat, the windpipe, and the vessels of the neck without damaging the spinal cord. If the spinal cord is damaged, the nerve going to the heart can be severed. They can be cardiac arrest. That is the reason the spinal cord should not be cut. We only cut the throat. the wind pipe and the vessels of the neck and let the heart beat when the heart beats majority of the blood flows out of the body of the animal today science tells us that blood is a very good medium of germs bacteria and toxins so when we let the blood flow out of the animal's body what are we doing we are cleansing the animal we are removing the germs bacteria and toxins it's more hygienic furthermore an animal slaughtered by the islamic method of zabiha remains fresh for a longer time as compared to an animal slaughtered by the stunning method because there's less blood in the animal it remains fresh for longer time furthermore people have a misconception people think that in the islamic method of slaughtering the animal dies of pain true science tells us that when we slaughter when we cut the throat the wind pipe and the vessels of the neck the nerve supply going to the brain is also cut which is responsible for feeling of pain so the animal does not die of pain the animal dies a peaceful death unlike in stunning many a time the animal dies after hours together so the islamic method is the most peaceful method and the animal dies a peaceful death the animal kicks and writhes not because of pain because the muscles are contracting and relaxing so that the blood can flow out of the body animal writhes because of the flow of blood not because of pain so the islamic method of slaughtering is the most hygienic and the best and the humane way of killing the 10th most common question is or the misconception about islam is that non muslims many of them say you muslims you eat animals and you behave like animals violent and ferocious you muslims you know you all have non veg food and you behave like animals violent and ferocious i have to agree today science has tell us that what you eat has an effect on your behavior and i agree with them that what you eat has an effect on your behavior that's the reason we muslims we are not allowed to eat ferocious and violent animals like tiger leopard lion which are ferocious we are only allowed to eat the peaceful animals like cow goat sheep because we are peace loving <laughs> the herbivores animals the peaceful you know we say allah mein ki gaay hai in hindi we say we are only allowed to eat the peaceful animals the cattle quran says in surah araf chapter number 7 verse number 157 the prophet commands you that which is just and prohibits you that which is evil he allows you that which is lawful and good and prohibits you that which is bad and impure allah repeats the message in surah hashar chapter 59 verse number 7 take what the prophet assigns to you and abstain from that which the prophet prohibits to you so whatever allah and his rasul prohibit we muslim abstain from it and there are various sahih hadith in bukhari in muslim ibn majah that speak about the prohibition of these violent animals these carnivorous animals it's mentioned in sahih muslim in the book of hunting and slaughtering hadith number 4752 also in ibn majah chapter number 13 hadith number 3232 and 3234 the various types of food that the prophet has prohibited amongst them is animals that have carnivorous set of teeth the carnivorous animals that belong to the cat family like lion tiger cat dog wolf hyenas all these are prohibited 
certain rodents like mice, rats, rabbits with claws, certain reptiles like snakes, alligators, all these are prohibited. The Prophet also prohibited birds which have talons and claws like vultures, eagles, crow, owls, etc. All these are prohibited. Now we'll discuss the 11th most common question asked by the non-Muslim is, the 11th misconception in the mind of the non-Muslim is that if Islam is against idol worship, why do the Muslims bow down to the Kaaba? The reply to the allegation is, no Muslim ever worshipped the Kaaba. Kaaba is the Qibla, is the direction. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 144. That wherever you are, bow in the direction of the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Qibla. For example, if the Muslim want to offer Salah here, some will say less face, north, some will say south, some will say east, some will say west. So for congregation, for unity, all the Muslims face towards one direction, that is the Kaaba. So Kaaba is our Qibla. And the Muslims, they were the first people who drew the world map. And al udrusi in 1154, was the first human being who drew the world map. And when the Muslims drew the world map, they had the South Pole on top, North Pole down, and Kaaba in the center. Later on, the Western cartographers came and they turned the map upside down. North Pole top, South Pole down, yet, Alhamdulillah, the Kaaba is in the center. So whichever part of the world you are, and if you're in the north, you face towards the south. If you're in the south, you face towards the north. If you're in the east, you face towards the west. If you're in the west, you face towards the east. Kaaba is the center. Now, when we Muslims go to Makkah, and during Umrah, or Hajj, or while doing Tawaf, we circumambulate around the Kaaba. Now, why do the Muslims circumambulate around the Kaaba? Because it's the commandment of Allah and our Rasul, we do it. But the logical reason that I can think of is that when we circumambulate, we know that every circle has got only one center. So when we're circumambulating, we're testifying that God is only one. Furthermore, the statement of the second Caliph of Islam, Hadrat Umar Malla be pleased with him, Radiallahu An, he said it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, in the book of Hajj, chapter number 56, hadith number 675. Hadrat Umar Malla be pleased with him said, pointing at the black stone, Hajj Aswat, this black stone can neither benefit me, can neither cause me any harm. Only because I've seen the Prophet kiss it, that's the reason I'm kissing it. This statement that the black stone, Hajj Aswat, can neither benefit any Muslim nor harm any human being is sufficient to prove that we Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. And furthermore, during the time of the Prophet, there were many Sahabas who stood on the Kaaba and they gave the Azan. No idol worshipper will ever stand on the idol he or she worships. This is sufficient proof to show that we Muslims, we don't worship the Kaaba, the Kaaba is only the Qibla. The twelfth most common question asked by non-Muslim is that if Islam is a universal religion, then why aren't non-Muslims allowed to enter Makkah and Medina? If Islam is a religion for everyone, then why aren't the non-Muslims allowed to enter Makkah and Medina? The reply to this question is, every country has certain areas which are called as cantonment area. Cantonment area means only the military and the people who are involved in the defense of the country are allowed. Though I am a citizen of India, I am not permitted to go in the cantonment area. I cannot say, I am a citizen of India, why am I not allowed to go in the cantonment area? No. Only those who are involved with the defense and the protection of the country, they are allowed to go in the cantonment area. Similarly, Makkah and Medina, both the Harmain, they are the cantonment areas of Islam. So only those who believe, love, and are willing to die for Islam are allowed to enter Makkah and Medina. That there is in Allah says in Quran, from this day, do not allow any non-Muslim to enter in these two areas. Once Allah has prohibited, we agree with it. The other reason is that whenever you enter a country, whenever you want to visit a country, you have to first obtain the visa. No visa, means you cannot enter the country. 
And one of the most difficult countries to get visa is USA. So they ask you so many questions. And nowadays they ask you, are you a terrorist? <laughs> As though anyone will write yes. I want to ask the American government, has anyone written yes? Do you belong to any terrorist organization? Ajib. <laughs> I want to ask them, has anyone written yes so far? Yes, I'm a terrorist. Yes, I belong to terrorist organization. They have so many questions. So you have to fulfill the requirement, otherwise they won't give you visa. And I had gone to Singapore the first time in 1986. And it was mentioned in the immigration form, death to drug traffickers. Means if you're caught with drugs, death penalty. You can't say, oh, death penalty, very barbaric law. If you want to enter Singapore, you agree with the law, otherwise don't enter. So if you want to get the visa, you have to agree with the law of the land. Now, the visa to enter Makkah and Medina is to say with your lips, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There's no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. If any human being says with his lips, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, he can get visa to enter Makkah and Medina. These two holy places are a cantonment area, and the visa is to agree there is no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Due to time limitations, I'll just give the reply to one more misconception, or one more common question. Then we can have the common questions from this audience, inshallah. At least I'm touching more than 50%. The 13th most common question today, according to me, is that why does Islam prohibit a Muslim from eating pork, the flesh of swine? The answer to this question is, Quran says in no less than four different places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 173. Surah Maida, chapter five, verse number three. Surah Anam, chapter six, verse number 145. And Surah Nihal, chapter 16, verse 115. Wama ulla li labi. Forbidden for you for food are ah, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken. So there are no less than four different places where it says that eating the flesh of swine is prohibited. Quran says that, we Muslims believe. This prohibition is also mentioned in the Jewish and the Christian scriptures. It's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8. The flesh of swine is unclean. Though it has cloven foot and divided hoof, it chews not the cud. Its flesh is unclean. Thou shalt not eat its flesh, nor touch its carcass. That means the Bible says, eating the flesh of swine is prohibited, even touching it is prohibited. The same message repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8, that the swine, though it has divided hoof, it chews not the cud. Its flesh is unclean for you, its carcass should not be touched. The same message repeated in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 65, verse number 2 to 5, that you should not have the flesh of swine. So according to the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures, eating pork is prohibited. If you read the Hindu scriptures, even in Hindu scriptures, eating pork is prohibited. It's mentioned in Manusmiti that a Brahmin, a twice born, should not eat cock or onion or dung heap pig. It's further mentioned in Vishnu Shutra. Anyone who sells the meat the forbidden meat, that is pork, you should chop off the opposite hands and limbs. Punishment. It's not there in the Quran and Hadith, Hindu scriptures. Chopping off the hands, if you sell pork. Let us analyze what are the logical reasons. So according to the religious scriptures, whether it be Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, it's clearly mentioned in all these scriptures that eating the flesh of swine is prohibited. Let us analyze what are the logical reasons and scientific reasons for the prohibition of eating of pork. Today, medical science tells us that if a person has pork, he has chances of having no less than 70 different diseases. Pinworm, roundworm, hookworm, you name it, it is there. Many helminths. One of the most dangerous helminths is called as tinea solium. Tinea solium, in layman's terminology, it is tapeworm. And it harbors in the intestine. It's very long. And the eggs, the ova, via the bloodstream, 
can enter different organs of the body. If it goes to the brain, it can cause memory loss. If it goes to the eye, it can cause blindness. If it goes to the heart, it can cause heart attack. If it goes to the liver, it can cause liver damage. It can damage almost all the organs of the body. And by the time you realize you are suffering from this tinea solium, it's already too late. The other dangerous disease is, if a person has poke, is trichura trichuriasis. And many people have a misconception that when you cook your food very well, these helminths die. According to a research, out of 24 people suffering from trichura trichuriasis, 22 have cooked the food well. That means the food that you cook in your house, the normal temperature you reach, cannot kill the germs and bacteria and the ova that are there in the poke. There are various other reasons why a person should not have poke. Today, science tells us that eating pork has got fat-building material. It has very little muscle-building material. Because of the fat-building material, a person has high chances of having hypertension, atherosclerosis, heart attacks. That is the reason more than 50% of the Americans, they suffer from hypertension because most of them are pig eaters. Today, we know that one of the most filthiest animals on the face of the earth is the pig. Wherever you find feces, muck, filth, you'll find the pig there. It's the most dirtiest animal. Some people say, in certain countries like Australia, I know, they breed the pig very well, you know, very hygienic. I tell them, even in Australia, in the sty, the pigs are kept together. You know, the pig, when it excretes, it eats its own excreta. So do you have man 24 hours manning wherever he excretes, he picks up the excreta? No. So even in Australia, the pig is dirty. It's one of the most filthiest animals. And one more reason I can think of besides many is that today science tells us pig is the most shameless animal on the face of the earth. It is the only animal that invites its friends to see when it's having sex with its mate. When the pig is having sex with its mate, it invites its friends to see him having sex with the mate. You know, in America, modern society, they have dance parties. After the dance parties, they're swapping of wives. You sleep with my wife, I sleep with your wife. You eat pigs, you behave like pigs. <laughs> Due to limitation of time, I will not be able to complete all the 20 common questions, but you're most welcome to go to the website www.irf.net and get all the answers in details. I would like to leave the rest of the time for the open question answer session. I'd like to end the speech with the verse of the Quran of Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, Wakul jal haq wa zakal batil. Innal batil zauka. When truth is heard again, falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Wakhru dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Jazakallah wa khairan, Dr. Zakir Naik, for a very profound, informative, and an enlightening talk. Now, we move on to a very interesting part of this program, the open question and answer session. To analyze the topic, misconceptions about Islam, adequately for all present here today, in the limited time available, we would like the following guidelines to be followed during the question and answer session. Questions asked should be on the topic. Questions not relevant to the topic, including any general question on religion, will not be allowed. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you will have to go back of the row again and await your second chance to ask your question. Non-Muslim brothers and sisters will be given first preference to ask the question. Three mics have been provided for the questions from the audience in the auditorium. The first mic on my left. The second in the middle aisle for the gents. The third mic in the ladies section. Please stand in a queue at one of the mics if you wish to put a question to the speaker 
and speak into the mic only when the mic handling assistants hand over the mic to you. We will allow one question at each of the mics in clockwise rotation. Kindly state your name and profession before putting forth your question. May we begin the first question. Brother, please state your name and profession before you pose your question. Yeah, I'm Dr. Chabra. I'm an eye specialist. I'm in Dubai since 1984. I had a chance to listen to Dr. Zagir a few times, and it's always fun to listen to him every time. He's so informative, so educative, so eye-opener, and I always enjoy asking him some questions. So I'm lucky to be the first to ask him the question. My first question is, you said the holy place is in the center so that it is equal from everywhere. But to my mind, I may be wrong or right, the God is all-prevailing, omnipotent, omnipresent, omnivorous. Then he need not to be present in one place. He is everywhere. A non-Muslim brother asked a good question, and he enjoyed hearing my talk, he enjoyed asking questions. And I enjoy answering your question, brother. He asked the question that God is omnipotent, omnipresent, so why should he be in the center? Brother, when you heard my answer, I think you misunderstood. I never said God is present in the center. I didn't say that. I said the Kaaba is in the center, not God. Kaaba is the Qibla, the direction. And the Kaaba is only direction for unity. When we worship Almighty God, we face in one direction for unity. Not that God is only there. Quran clearly says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse 177, it is not righteousness that you turn your face to the east and west. It is righteousness that you believe in Allah. So you misunderstood. Kaaba is the Qibla direction. So for unity, they have kept the direction in the center. God is not in the center. God is on the arsh, he's on the throne. What we realize that for unity, we have to face in one direction. So the Kaaba for unity has been kept in the center. So all the different people, different human beings from different parts of the world can face for unity in one direction because we believe when we offer prayers in Salah, we believe in congregation, believe in unity. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you very much. Can we have the next question from the lady's side? I'd request that if there are any non-Muslim that are most welcome to come on the microphone, this is the opportunity. You can ask any questions on Islam, on comparative religion, even if it's criticism, even if it's attacking Islam, attacking Quran, I can take it, I'm young. No problem. So any non-Muslims have any questions, any clarification, not that you have to agree with everything what I say. If you think I've said something wrong, you're most welcome to correct me. If I'm wrong, I'll correct myself or I will clarify your misconception. This is the opportunity. It's not common that you have open question answer session after religious talk. Very few times you have. This is the opportunity. We give more time for question answer session. You can clarify your misconception. What you agree, no problem. What you disagree, you can clarify. This is the opportunity. The non-Muslim would be given the first preference. So I request all the non-Muslims to come on the microphone, the three microphones for the gents on the right, on the left, also for the gents, and one behind for the ladies there. Please come on the microphone. You can break the queue and come in the front. Yes, sister, most welcome. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Amuta. I'm working in Indian Embassy. So I just want, I have a lot of questions, but for time being, I'm saying little bit questions. So in Islam, why there is no caste system? Yes, sister. Okay, my second question. Sister, ask the first question. After okay. I reply, then you can ask the second question. <laughs> okay, fine. Give me the answer. Sister, ask the question, why in Islam there's no caste system? Because in Islam, we believe that all the human beings are equal. Unlike in Hinduism. Okay. Quran says, Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum in zakin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila alitarafu inna khalaqnaakum in the law yatkaakum inna la alimun khabir O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person as taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Almighty God, 
for a human being to be superior to the other human being. It's not sex, it's not caste, it's not color, it's not wealth, it's not age, but it is taqwa, it is God consciousness, it is piety, it is righteousness. The only way one human being can be superior to the other human being, it's not by wealth, it's not by age, it's not by sex, but it is by piety, it is by God consciousness, it is by righteousness. Unlike Hinduism, when we read the Vedas, it's mentioned that Almighty God, He created the Brahmin class, the learned class from the head. That's the first caste. Then He created the warrior class, the Kshatriyas, from the chest. Then from His stomach and thighs, He created the business community, the Vaishyas. And from the feet, He created the Shudras, that's the untouchables, that's the lower caste. So this is what is mentioned in the Vedas. In Islam, we believe that all the human beings are equal. We don't believe that one human being is superior to the other human being because of birth, because of profession, because of wealth, because of color, because of caste. So Islam is a universal religion. Unlike in the Vedas, what they say that you have to stick to your profession because it was mainly controlled by the Brahmins, which is again, small percentage, minute percentage. And they say that if you're born as a Shudra, you remain a Shudra, you serve the Brahmin, next life maybe you may become a better person. No, this is all ideology. So that, you know, they want to keep the person, low person will remain low, and the rich and the top people remain top. In Islam, we believe in equality. And Islam is religion for all the human beings. That is the reason Islam is against caste system. Hope that answers the question, sister. Okay, sir, I have one more doubt. So why you are saying uh, the Muslim is Sayyid Muslim or Sunni Muslim or Shia, so what is that? Sister said that why am I saying Sayyid Muslim and Shia Muslim Sunni? I never said Sayyid Muslim, Shia Muslim. Muslim is the one who submits his will to Almighty God. In Islam, there is no sect. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 103, Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. There is no Sayyid Muslim and Sunni or this. Yes, the family. Fine, you may belong to a family. You may belong to a Sheikh family. You may belong to Sayyid family. To know your roots, that does not mean a person is superior. A Khan is superior to a Sheikh or a Sayyid. No. It is belonging to your roots. Like how you may come from some family so that you have come from particular land or particular area. If you have come from Kokan region. So this is family background. It doesn't mean one person is superior to the other. The only way one human being can be superior to the other human being is by piety, is by righteousness, is by God consciousness. Hope that answers the question, sister. Okay, second question. Why in Islam Allah says no horoscope is seen? Sister asks the question that why in Islam during marriages no horoscope is seen? Because, sister, we don't believe in horoscope. Yes, sister, I'll come to it. I will tell you what Hinduism says, because I studied Hinduism. In Hinduism, they believe in horoscope. Kundli, Kundli. You know Kundli? Yeah, I know. I it's know. called Kundli. Yes, you know, sister. When Kundli, you tell your date of birth, then they say that this sun was there, and this shagun, and this, this grahan came. This is a science. But this science is not established science. It's a hypothesis. It says that if you are born on this date, then this grahan comes and this planet goes there and this. It is a science, but it's not an established science. It's not hard science, like what we read in our college, biology, physiology, embryology. It is what they believe. It's an assumption. And then they talk about future. Everything what they mention in the Kundalini does not come out to be true. We in Islam are against fortune telling. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya Ladina Amanu, in Namal Khamru al Maisuru, O you believe, most certainly intoxicant and gambling, while Anzabu al Aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich some minamili shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First, Tanibullah Lukum Tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Quran says, this fortune telling, divination of arrows, they are Satan's handiwork, abstain from it that you may prosper. So in Islam, we do not believe in this. Many a time, you go in a machine, you put your date of birth, then it comes out there. Something good is going to happen to you in the next one week. 
Even if 100 bad things happen, one good thing will surely happen. <laughs> the next person goes, it comes horoscope, something bad is going to happen in the next one month. So these are statements that are made which are so ambiguous. And all this, you know, parrot goes and picks up, a parrot goes and picks up a chit, and you come to know your kundali or what your future. So in Islam, we don't believe a parrot can pick up and tell you what is your future, or by reading the palm, or looking at the stars. Islam is against this. And many a time, you get fooled into believing that it is true. And there was a research done that once a psychologist, he was teaching a class, class of 100 students. And after one week, he said, now I have understood your background, everything. I will write about each individual person, about his past and everything. But don't open the chit until I tell you. So he wrote to all 100 students, details about the past. Then he said, okay, now open the chits and give me gradation. How much am I accurate? Believe me. More than 95% of the students said the professor was more than 90% correct. The secret was the professor wrote the same thing for everyone. These are such ambiguous statements. What we have to realize, sister, Islam is against fortune telling against knowing about the future. That's the reason there's no kundli required. If the kundli was there yet, we find that so many marriages are being broken in Hinduism. Why? What we believe that we have to choose our life partner. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sai Hadith, that whenever you choose your life partner, you look for four things. Beauty, wealth, nobility, and virtue. The best is virtue. The best to choose from a life partner is a virtuous life partner, not kundli. Whether born in October, September doesn't make a difference. The virtue should match. That is the reason a woman in Islam, sister, is called as a muhasana. Muhasana in Arabic means a fortress against the devil. In other religions, including Hinduism, the woman is referred as an instrument of a devil. In Quran, the woman is referred as a muhasana. In Arabic, it means a fortress against the devil. So if you marry a virtuous woman, inshallah, she will prevent the husband from going in the wrong track. Hope that answers the question, sister. Shall I ask the third question? Sister, let's give a chance. When the chance comes to you, you can answer. Okay, thank no problem. You. So you can stand there. We'll ask the other non-Muslims. We'll allow them to give a question. If any other non-Muslims come, give them a chance. Then you can ask, sister, so that we give everyone equal opportunity. Yes, brother. I have a question yes. that uh, how can you convince a Sikh about Islam based on the comparison between the Guru Granth Sahib and the Quran? Furthermore, did you encounter any contradictions in the Guru Granth Sahib when you read it, when you read it and understood it. A brother who asked two questions yesterday night is a job seeker. I think you're a truth seeker. Huh? <laughs> he asked that, can you compare, when you compare Sikhism, Guru Granth Sahib, what are the similarities you found and did you find any differences in Sikhism? I did mention some point yesterday that as far as Sikhism, I told you yesterday that it was a religion of 10 Gurus and it was founded by Guru Nanak Sahib and the 10th Guru was Guru Gobind Sahib. It originated towards the end of the 15th century in the land of Punjab, the land of Five Rivers. And Guru Nanak was very much influenced. He belonged to a Shatra family and was influenced by the Muslims. Therefore, you find many of the teachings are quite common and scholars say it's an amalgamation of Islam and Hinduism. As far as the teachings are concerned, the basic Sikh comes from the root word Sisya, means a student, a seeker, a seeker of truth. Therefore, I told you you are a seeker of truth, not a job seeker. And in Arabic, we say Talib. You know, Talib. Talib means a student, person who does Talab, who seeks. As far as the five Ks a Sikh is supposed to maintain in Sikhism, he has to maintain his Kesh that uncut hair. He has to have a kanga, a comb, to keep his hair clean. He has to wear a kala, a bracelet, a metal bracelet. He has to keep a kirpan, a dagger. I don't know whether you have one. No. The Dubai police won't allow you here. Huh? <laughs> and the fifth is the kacha, the underdaws, the long underdaws. So these are the five Ks that a Sikh should maintain. If you ask me similarities, some are right. Even the Prophet said 
that you know we have to keep an arm with sunnah. Therefore, when you go to Oman, most of the Omani has a dagger. Like they say, Oman, you saw the Omani. So, you know, because they said sunnah, fine. A prophet said that you be prepared, always have a weapon, help you in self defense. So, it's matching. So, it's not a fard, it is sunnah. In Sikhism, it's a fard. So, that's the difference is there. As far as uncut hair, our religion doesn't say that you should cut or should not cut. So, there are many teachings which are similar, some are different, some are optional. As far as I told you yesterday, that regarding the basic concept of God, I feel it is almost similar. The concept of God in Sikhism and the concept of God in Islam is almost similar. And as I told you yesterday, that the first verse of the Guru Granth Sahib, Adi Granth, that is the Japuji, first volume, first verse says that the God is true. He is the creator, the unbegotten, free from fear and want, great, compassionate. This is similar to the concept of God in Islam, of Surah Ikhlas. And Sikhism is a monotheistic religion, which believes in one God. It is against Autarvada. It does not believe in idol worship. And in the unmanifest form, Almighty God is called as Ek Omkara, and manifest form as Omkara. And there are various attributes, what I mentioned yesterday of the similarities. Many attributes given to Almighty God in the Guru Granth Sahib and Sikhism is the same as in Islam. Almighty God is called as Akal, that's eternal. He is called as Sahib, that's Lord. He is called as Kartar, that is Creator. He is called as Parvardigar, that's the Cherisher. He is called as Rahim, the Merciful. He is called as Kareem, the Beneficent. He is also called as Vahe Guru, the One True God. Now, what we realize as far as Sikhism is concerned, as I mentioned, it's an amalgamation, as the scholars say, of Hinduism and Islam. There are many points which are similar. What is not there, because it's a religion that came after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's one of the new religions. There are very few religions that came after it. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So therefore, it does not mention about the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. All the other religious scriptures that you find, Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, they mention about the coming of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, Sikhism, because it's a new religion, it came after the demise of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's no mention that I came across about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As far as Islam is concerned, the basic two points to be noted, after believing that there's only one God who deserves worship and obedience, besides that, you also have to believe in the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Though Guru Nanak did respect Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did praise him, but I don't know of any scripture where he mentioned him as the messenger. So this is one point which I feel is, which is then the other scriptures of the other religions. Where it's clearly mentioned, besides believing in one God, besides believing in Tawheed, about the coming of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is not mentioned in the Sikh scriptures. And the practice of Sikhism has deviated and have gone on the wrong track, as I said, that they worship the Guru Granth Sahib, the Adi Granth, which was not told by Guru Nanak. Neither worshipping the fire has been told. So what we realize that all these are interpolation that have come. And many of the acts of Hinduism have crept into Sikhism, and that's how you have a different religion. But what we say Quran is the Furqan, is the criteria to judge right from wrong. Whatever matches with the Quran, we say we have no objection accepting as the word of God. Which contradicts, we say is wrong. What does not match and does not contradict, we say maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. Hope that answers the question. Well. Shall we have the next question from the brother's side in the middle of the aisle? Yeah. Good evening, Dr. Zakir Naik, and to one and all. My name is Srinil Patne, and uh, we have a family uh, restaurant business. Well, my question is, as we all know, God is the Almighty, the one and all. If he's, uh, sorry, he or she, I wouldn't genderize him. If God is so powerful, why doesn't he come down himself or clear all the sins in this world? Make it the perfect place to be in. Why does it have to take so much of time? Like, as we all know, there is hell and there is heaven. Uh, the people who do good deeds go to heaven and the people who do bad deeds go to hell. He's testing us. Why does it take God 6,000 years to test us? Brother, that's a very good question. 
that why isn't God so powerful that he can come down and clear all the misconceptions? Why is it taking 6,000 years or more to test us? It's a very good question. And Quran says that if Almighty God wanted, he could have made everyone as Muslims. Quran says in many places. That means he could have made everyone believe in Almighty God. But the Quran says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah khalaqal mawata wal hayata. It's Almighty God has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. It's like you telling me that we have gone to school. After 10 years, we appear for board examination. SSE board, CBSC, IGCSC. Now, why is the teacher taking test? Why doesn't teacher pass everyone? If teacher passes everyone, everyone will get admission into medical college. And everyone will become doctors and they start killing people rather than curing. So in the medical examination you say, why is our medical teacher failing us? He's failing us to know whether you're worth treating a patient or not. So similarly, Almighty God has created the human beings and have given the human beings a free will. All the other creations of Almighty God don't have free will, except the human beings and jinn have free will. The angels have no free will. Whatever God says, they follow 100%. But the human being is a superior creation than the angels. After Almighty God has given us a free will, then if we obey the commandment of God, we are superior than the angels. If we don't obey His commandments, we are inferior to the angels. So now, Almighty God has given us a free will. And before we came in this world, Almighty God asked us, who would like to become a human being? If you don't become a human being, you have just passed. You may either become mountain, they are Muslim, tree, they are Muslim, animals, they are Muslims, angels, they are Muslim. Muslim means submitting the will to God. All the animals are Muslims. All the stars are Muslims. All the plants are Muslims. All the angels are Muslim. Now, human being is a unique creation. It is the best creation of Almighty God. So God asked, who would like to become a human being? The Quran says, we human beings were fools who said we want to become human beings. That means, just pass, or if you become a human being, you may get distinction. All of us thought we'll get distinction. How many get will come to afterwards? So we have been given the free will. And now we are undergoing the test. So if Almighty God passes everyone, then I will say Almighty God is unjust. If Almighty God puts everyone in heaven, then I will die. I was such a good man. I did not rob. I was honest. That man, robber, rapist, even he's with me in heaven. I will object to Almighty God. Why did you put this person in heaven? So Almighty God, the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 40, he is never unjust in the least degree. So therefore, Almighty God is merciful. He gives us a chance. He forgives us. But finally, he's also just. So based on this, we are undergoing this test. This life is a test for the hereafter. So we are a unique creation of Almighty God. And the purpose of this creation, as the Quran says in Surah Darya, chapter 51, verse 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That Almighty God has created the jinn and the human beings not but to worship Him. By worshipping Him, that means obeying His commandments. If you obey his commandment, we pass in this test. Otherwise, the Quran says, if he wanted, he could have made all the human beings Muslims very easy for him. But we are a better creation, a unique creation. If we obey him, after free will is given, we are superior. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you. Shall we ask the next question from the sister's side? Good evening, Dr. Zakhir. My name is Jal, and I work here for Emirates Bank International. My question to you is, which other religion says that they are awaiting the coming of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, other than Muslim and Christianity? Sister asked the question that which other religion besides Islam and Christianity says that Prophet Muhammad sallam, will come? Sister, besides the religion of Christianity and Islam, most, if not all, most of the religions that came before Islam prophesied about coming of the last and final messenger of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I've given a talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the various world religious scriptures. Besides Christianity, you also find in Judaism about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18 about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 19. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. In the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Christianity is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16. Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 26. Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse number 7. Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. There are many verses in the Old Testament and the New Testament prophesying about the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Since your name is Jal, and I assume you're a Hindu sister, correct? Yes. I've even given the talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Hindu scriptures. I can give a talk for a few hours only on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Hindu scriptures. Time will not permit me to go into it. I'll just give the references. If you read the Hindu scriptures, the Hindu scriptures are of two types. One is Smriti, the other is Shruti. Shruti means the word of God, in which you have Vedas and the Upanishad. Smriti is the word of human being in which you have Manu Smriti, you have Ramayan, Mahabharat, epics, etc. You also have the Puranas. If you read Bhavishya Purana, it's mentioned Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyay 3, Shlokas 5 to 8, which speaks about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's mentioned Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyay 3, Shlokas 10 to 27, talking about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the Malaysia. He is mentioned in, he is mentioned in, Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 6. Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 7. He is also mentioned in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 127, verse 1 to 14, which is called as Kuntap Suktas. Kuntap means hitting. It speaks about the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he will be the praiseworthy, he will have 60,000 enemies, etc. He is also mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 1, Chapter number 53, verse number 9. He is mentioned as Ahmad, which means one who praises in Uttar Chik. Mantra number 1500. It's mentioned in Indra, chapter number 2, verse number 152. Yajur Ved, chapter number 31, verse number 18. He is also mentioned in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 126, verse number 1 to 14. He is called as Narashansa. Nar means man, person. Shansa means coming from Prashansa, praiseworthy. A man who's praiseworthy. If you translate Nara Shansa, man who's praiseworthy into Arabic, it means Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's prophesied as Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 13, verse number three. In Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 64, verse number three. He's mentioned Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number three, verse number five. Rig Ved, book number five, hymn number five, verse number two. He's also mentioned Yajur Ved, chapter number 20, verse 37. Yajur Ved, chapter number 21, verse number 31. I can go on and on and on, mentioning only the references of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in Hindu scriptures. Due to limitation of time, I will just touch on one prophecy a little bit in more detail. He has been prophesied as the Kalki Autar. You know, when you read the Kalki Purana, book number two, verse number five, seven, nine, eleven, fourteen, he is prophesied as the Kalki Autar. And it's mentioned there that his father's name will be Vishnu Yas. Vishnu means God, Yas means servant, servant of God. If you translate to Arabic, it's Abdullah. The father of the name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was Abdullah. His mother's name will be Sumati. Sumati means serenity, peaceful. If you translate in Arabic, it means Amina. The name of the mother of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Amina. It says he will be born in a city by the name Sambala. Sambala means a place of peace and serenity. That is Makkah. He'll be born in the house of the chief of the village of Sambala. He was born in the house of Quraysh. It says he will be born on the 12th you clap at every point, it will go on for hundreds of class, mashallah. <laughs> he'll be born on the 12th month of Madhav, that the 12th Rabbi Awal. It says that he will be a teacher for the whole of humanity. And we know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent to the mercy of the whole of humanity. It says he'll get the first revelation in a cave known as Gare Hira. It says he will migrate northwards and come back. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went from Makkah to Medina northwards and came back. It says that he'll be given eight supernal qualities. It says that he'll have four companions, talking about the first four Khulfa Rashidin. It says that he'll be helped with the angels in the battlefield. We know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam held in the battle of Badr with angels. I can go on and on talking only about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if you're a Hindu, and if you believe in the Hindu scriptures, you also have to believe the last and final avatar, the last and final messenger in Hinduism is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him.
however dhaka uh, according to hinduism the kalki avatar is still being awaited so are you uh, is it that if you are, have not just not aware about it you said the kalki avatar is yet awaited if you have not recognized the kalki avatar you are to blame not me I have given you so many similarities. Now you have to disprove it. You say my scripture says Vishnu Yas, father's name. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam father's name was not Vishnu Yas. You have to disprove me. Now this has been done by pundits of Hinduism. Hindu scholars have also written this. Now the Hindu scholars are preventing the truth from you. They are hiding the truth from you. You as a logical girl, as intelligent girl who is working in a high post. It's your duty to realize that if your priest are hiding the truth from you, we can have a debate with your priest. You can call the doctors of divinity. You know, I have had dialogues with pundits. You know, one of the very famous is Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. He never disagreed. He agreed. He agreed with what I said about oneness of Almighty God. Has got no images. He believed in Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He did not accept that's a different thing because he will lose his following. Therefore, sister, do you have a following? So you have no fear to lose the following. So when I've given you so many references with giving quotations, I'm not pulling a fast one. You can very well go and check and verify. But after you verify, do you accept in the last and final messenger? Do you? Yes. So do you believe in Prophet Muhammad? Peace yes. be upon him. Mashallah. Do you believe that there's one God? Yes, I do. Do you believe Almighty God has got no images? Yes, I do. So you believe there is God and He has no images? Yes. And do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God? Yes, I do. Then you are a Muslim sister. <laughs> what you said is the Shahada in English. Do you want to repeat in Arabic if you want, sister? What you said is in English that there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger. Would you like to repeat in Arabic, sister? I do. Okay, I'll just repeat it, and you have to continue, sister. Ashadu. Ashalu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashalu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Ablu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa rasulu. I be. Mashallah, sister. May Allah. Mash, mashallah, sister. May Allah reward you. You have joined a family of religion of peace of more than 1.3 to 1.5 billion. May Allah reward you, and may Allah grant you Jannah, inshallah. And believe me, sister, it requires guts. I feel that, mashallah, I really admire your guts more than Shri Shri Ravi Shankar, mashallah. And I pray that may give you hidayah and may guide you, inshallah. And sister, if you have any questions, any queries, there are local organizations in Dubai who can surely clarify your misconceptions. To understand Islam, look at the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. They are the best guides. If you have any queries, you can even write to the email at islam at irf.net. It's my pleasure to reply. And do pray for me also, sister. The next question from the brother's side. Good morning, Tayo, doctor. I'm Mr. Alan Sinko. My question is, I want to embrace and accept Islam. So what can I do to become Islam? Mashallah. Our Filipino. Our Filipino brother, Mashallah. May Allah accept his effort. He wants to accept Islam. In Islam, if you accept Islam, you only have to believe that there's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is a messenger. Do you believe that there's one God? Yes, brother. Do you believe that no one deserves worship besides Almighty God Allah? Yes, I do. Do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? Yes, I believe. So I'll just say in Arabic, repeat it, then we'll say the translation, inshallah. Okay. Ashadu. 
اشهد الله الله اله الا الله الا الله الا الله واشهد واشهد ان ان محمدا محمدا عبده عبده ورسوله ورسوله ما شاء الله I bear witness <laughs> Marshal Aljas Brother, I'll just repeat. Brother, I'll just repeat what you said. The meaning in Arabic. I bear witness. I bear witness that that there is no God. There is no God but Allah. But Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad. That Prophet Muhammad is is the messenger. The messenger and servant of God. And the servant of God. Mashallah. This is the translation of what you said. Yeah. And I like to pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. the mashallah may accept your efforts and it's good mashallah to see that in the city of dubai alhamdulillah that people may have come here for earning a living believe me what you earned here is less than what you'll earn in the akhira what you learn in the akhira inshallah will be much more and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you jannah inshallah thank you brother thank you so much shall we proceed to the next question from the brothers yes um yeah my name is rahul I am a telecoms engineer working in Dubai since 2002. I want to ask a few questions. Coming from my background, I think religion is something that following that you are safe from making um, having problems in your life, yeah. Um my first question is I recently read a report by a doctor saying that because of marriages in first cousins in Islam it leads to a higher probability of the fetuses being born uh, as handicaps yeah it increases the probability of the babies born without hands or without legs so if it was something that could potentially cause harm it should not have been allowed in islam another point to, i would like to add to the same question is recently i suffered a little bit of a bp and i went to the doctor and the first thing he said to me is that stop eating red meat which is again allowed in islam so i would uh, think that if these things could be harmful to the human body these should not have been allowed by who has created us so if you can clarify me on that the brother has two questions the first question that is talking about consanguineous marriages consanguineous marriages means marriage between close relatives in english it's called as consanguineous marriages and in consanguineous marriages medical science tells us today there are high chances of genetic problems and i do agree with the brother mm. so why does islam permit that yes it's clearly mentioned in the quran in surah nisa chapter number 4 verse number 22 to 24 the woman who you can marry and the woman who you cannot marry is mentioned there amongst them it's clearly mentioned you cannot marry your sister and a lady cannot marry the brother it's mentioned neither the father neither the mother you cannot marry the brother of your father the ladies and you cannot marry the sister of your father that means the important close relatives are mentioned in the quran brother sister cannot marry son and mother father and daughter paternal uncle maternal uncle can't marry but as far as first cousins are concerned islam does give permission now as far as consanguineous marriages are concerned the maximum problem comes when you marry your direct blood brother and sister consanguineous marriage even if you marry your direct father daughter mother and son or your uncle the chances are also there if you marry your first cousin but negligible very negligible so no, islam that's not that's not what the report said the report said that because of marriages in first cousins not your brothers and sisters it let leads me, to this problem and it was from a doctor let, let it me was complete. published in gulf news as well actually brother let me complete when i am a doctor ah okay fine even i am a medical doctor yeah it mean medical doctor with that doctor yeah the chances in direct relatives a very high yeah if a sister and brother marry the chances are very high yeah if a father and daughter are very high you have read only one report you haven't read the other report yeah so you only read gulf news i read medical books so right. gulf news is better or medical books is brother 
right, so your that. point is your point is marrying in first cousins uh, the lesser, chances of getting problem is negligible as compared to brother and sister as compared father, to as, as compared, compared, to, yeah. compared but still but still there is a brother will you let me complete my answer or sorry yeah please so you have more faith in gulf news no no not really i'm here ah. to find the truth so, that's right <laughs> so what do you realize that consanguineous marriage and i agree with you i didn't say it's not there yeah so i'm not trying to beat around the bush but compared it is negligible compared to direct blood brother and sister now mm-hmm. i do agree that there are medical genetic problems in various ways but this report is there when you have continuously generation after generation according to dr ahmed sakari says the prophet said do not marry first cousins generation after generation ah, if you do it once okay. or twice it is no problem yet even if you marry not cousins also you can get a problem do you know that yeah yeah that ah, so that doesn't mean that you stop marriage only right so there is a hadith ah, which says yes. do not do it generation after generation yes but okay. otherwise generally there's no problem right fine okay. Okay. so coming to your second question yeah you went to a doctor and you said you had high bp yes doctor said you have red meat yes so why does islam allow red meat yes you know my friend went to a doctor and doctor said you have diabetes don't have sugar brother why do you have sugar right why don't have sugar my friend went to a doctor doctor said you have diabetes don't have sugar brother do you have sugar Yes, of course. Why you have to stop having sugar? Yeah, well, we can live on vegetables, easily possible. Can, can you live, live without having chicken? sugar? Can you live without having sugar? Even vegetarians have sugar, brother. Yeah. Are you true. educated? Yeah. yeah. Masha Allah. <laughs> the problem is that person had a problem with his pancreas. Yes. In the pancreas, there are islets of Langerhans, which break down the sugar. Because my friend had a problem in the pancreas. he could not break down the sugar therefore the doctor said don't have sugar right so well, you have some problem of red meat you should not have red meat others can have red meat right <laughs> the quran nice. says a general statement quran says eat what is halal and tayyab for you there's a verse in the quran eat what is halal and tayyab for you for a person suffering from diabetes sugar is not tayyab so according to the quran a person having diabetes should have less sugar It's a general statement. Eat what is halal and tayyab for you. That means certain things which is good for other may not be good for you. But there are certain things which are bad for everyone. Alcohol. Alcohol is bad for everyone. It is prohibited for everyone. Pork is bad for everyone. Therefore, pork has been prohibited for everyone. What do you realize? Certain food, because of the way your metabolism is made, because it's a problem for you, doesn't mean that everyone should abstain from it. Hope that answers the question. Brother. Sure. Okay. My uh, next question is. um islam allows marriages um i mean a husband to marry more than one wife four wives is it um compulsory to take the permission from the wife before marrying that second one because a lot of muslim girls have told me that you know they have to take permission from the first wife so our interests are taken care of i hope you don't intend to become a muslim and marry more than one wife huh no i don't because <laughs> because there's a new law in the indian government if a hindu converts to muslim and marries more than one wife then there's a problem Yeah, yeah. There's a no, new law that's passed. I don't intend to, but I just need to find don't out. Don't intend to marry or don't intend to convert. I well, <laughs> I won't answer that now. <laughs> <laughs> the other the question that is it compulsory that a husband should take the permission of his first wife before he marries a second wife? As a general rule, because it is mentioned in the Quran that a man can have more than one wife, it is not required for a man to take the permission of first wife. But it is preferably takes permission or at least informs her. Okay. Yeah. As far as permission, certain conditions become compulsory during a nikah, during a marital contract. A man or a woman before they get married, they can put any conditions which are permitted. If the woman puts the condition in the nikah nama that my husband will not take a second wife. as long as i live because marrying more than one wife is optional so if she puts the condition then it becomes compulsory for the husband to take the permission of the wife otherwise he cannot marry if this is not mentioned in the nikah nama if it's not mentioned in the marital contract it's not a must it is preferable okay, hope that answers okay. the question thanks my last question this la- my last question is yeah, brother you are most welcome just stand behind the queue okay, there may you. be one or two thank non muslims you. you can wait brother there may be one or two non muslim just stand behind the non muslims and we'll try and give all the non muslim the chance yes sister yes sir i just want to take shahada mashallah the sister 
the sister who asked the question earlier, and I believe you're a Hindu sister? Yeah, I'm Hindu. Yes, the sister who asked the earlier question, Mashallah, Allah gave a hidayat and she wants to accept Islam. I want to ask you, sister, do you believe there is one God? Yeah, I believe in Do you believe God. that Almighty God has got no images? Yes, sir, I believe. Yes, and you believe that there's no one to worship besides Allah? Mean? Do you believe that there's no God but Allah? Yeah, I believe Allah is the God. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger of this God? Yes, I believe. Inshallah, I'll say in Arabic and you repeat it, sister. Okay. Ashadu. I'll say in Arabic and repeat it, sister, slowly. Okay. Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abdu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa? Wa rasu. Wa rasuluhu. Luhu. Mashallah, sister. Sister, I'll just say the translation. I'll just mention the translation, sister. You just repeat the translation, which will be much more easier. I bear witness. I bear witness. I bear witness. That. That. There is no God. That there is no God. But Allah. But Allah. And Prophet Muhammad. And Prophet Muhammad. Is. Is. The messenger. Is the messenger. And servant of Almighty God. And. Servant of. Almighty God. Servant of Almighty God. MashaAllah, sister. You are a Muslim. May Allah smart to reward you. And may Allah grant you Jannah. And sister, as I mentioned earlier, if you have any question, any queries, please don't feel shy. You can contact the local organizations here. If you have any questions, you can even send an email to our organization, Islam at irf.net. We have a ladies' wing which takes care of any questions, any queries, any problems you have. And sister, see to it that as you keep on learning whatever about Islam, slowly and steadily. Main thing is Iman believing. The practice keeps on coming slowly and steadily. Whatever you learn, you can ask questions, you can keep on following, and slowly and slowly, inshallah, inshallah, you can keep on following all the trends of Islam. Thank you very much, sister. Sir, is there any organization which can teach me how to pray, how to do all the things? I'm sure there is an organization, Darul Bir. The organization I know in Dubai, Darul Bir, I'm sure there are lady organizations. And I think their sister Yasmin, who is the wife of my friend Brother Najmuddin, surely sister Yasmin would be somewhere in the ladies' wing. They have a ladies' organization. You can contact the volunteer, and inshallah, they'll help you out in teaching you how to pray, how to offer salah, and the other aspects of Islam. Thank you, sister. Yes. Can we have the next question from the brother? Morning, Mr. Zakir Naik. My name is Jamish Damani. First of all, I want to thank you for what you're doing here. I've really taken a, a lot away from here, I'm sure. Um, my question is on your point number three. Actually, I have three questions, if you could be so kind. But on point number three, first of all, I felt that you, it was very evasive, your, your answer. But what I'm going to ask you is very simple. When you talk about terrorism, when you talk about Islam, now this is a very Simple, straightforward question. I hope I can get a straightforward answer. With what's happening in Pakistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, just to name a few, I'm not stereotyping, I hope no one takes offense, but when you hear on the news that a woman is cooking food for her kids and then a suicide bomber comes and kills them, I want to ask you a simple question. What is that? Is that Islam or is that people who don't understand what Islam is and they have their own perception of Islam. And please, let me ask you one more thing. Can you give me an answer that is not in World War I or something there were more people that died or this is all propaganda and these are Americans killing people and that's well, your not answer, the, then you pass yeah, your comment, inshallah. Yeah, I want your just answer, that type of answer. Yeah. Your answer, then you can pass your comment. Huh? The brother has the question. That years in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, a woman cooking food, a suicide bomber comes and blows up and kills. As far as Islam, what the media is saying, forget about it. I'll give you ruling of Islam. Whether what the media says is right or wrong. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Any person kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, Unless it be for murder, 
off of spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if any human being saves other human being, it is as though he has saved the whole nation. So according to the Quran, killing any single innocent human being is prohibited. If a suicide bomber comes and kills a woman who's cooking she innocent, it is 100% prohibited, whether done in Pakistan or Afghanistan or America or Dubai. Is the answer clear? Okay. 100% no. wrong. Whoever was doing it, whoever was doing it, whoever was doing it, whether namesake Muslim or American or propaganda, whoever was doing it, it is totally prohibited. Okay. Fine. So is it clear answer? That is clear. 100% clear? 100%. Whether you do, anyone so does? wrong, yeah? 100% okay. wrong. It no. is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. There is no other scripture that I know of today. Okay. There is no other scripture that I know of today yeah. that gives the statement that if you kill one human being, it is as though you killed the whole human being, except the Quran. There is perfect, no other perfect. scripture that I know which says that if you say one human being, you have saved the whole of humanity. No other scripture. Perfect. Now can I ask you something? Yes, You've you are told most me welcome. this is wrong, yeah? 100% wrong. Fine, fine, fine. Now, why are you here? The way I look at it, all of these are innocent, loving people here. Why isn't this convention somewhere like Afghanistan and Pakistan trying to teach people that what they are doing is not Islam and is just some brainwashed chaos? And that they're going to go to hell and they're not going to go to heaven for killing innocent people, for the 911 attacks, for the London bombings. Innocent people died. If I don't like you and I kill you, it's more justified than if I don't like somebody, if I don't like Jews and I go and kill innocent Americans with families. Why don't you go and educate these people and have a better cause rather than converting four or five people here? Save thousands of lives. Brother has asked a very good question. He's telling me, why don't I go to Pakistan, to Afghanistan and spread this message and prevent this? Brother, I go every day, even now I'm going there. I'm on the satellite. We have peace TV reaching 100 million people. This is how much? That's what I wanted to hear. This is 20, 30,000 people. The audience here will be 20, 30,000 people, not more than that. You see the recording. Why do we the recording? So that I can go to Pakistan, I can go to Afghanistan, I can go to even America. And my lectures on jihad and terrorism, the maximum viewership, it has got more than 100 million people. And it is meant for the full world. I'm giving here, it is being recorded, being telecast. The thing is, I cannot force anyone at the point of the sort accept my message. Can I force you? Am I forcing you? Yeah. Am I forcing you to accept my message? No, no, no you're not forcing How can I force the people of Pakistan? How can I force the people of Afghanistan? At the same time, at the same time, at the same time, I also tell, the innocent people being killed, I agree with you. What's the numbers? You said, you know, four or five people converting here is better than telling that. My job is to deliver the message. Fazakrin naman tamazakir. Mentioned in the Quran, Surah Ghasha, chapter 88, verse number 21, 22. Our job is to deliver the message. We can't convert hearts. Allah told the Prophet, you are not the manager of affairs. It is Allah who gives the hidayah. I can talk. I cannot convert. It is Almighty God who converts. I can talk whether they understand or not in Pakistan. It is Almighty God. Coming to your basic question. According to me, you should see my cassette. Is terrorism Muslim monopoly? Is terrorism Muslim monopoly? If you see that cassette, your mind, your vision of terrorism will improve. Time does not permit me to give a talk here again. But I'll tell you for sure. According to me, the terrorists are mainly the politicians. It is they who create this. You go anywhere, you know in India, all the riots that took place, indirectly or directly, it's the politician. Babri Masjid, why did Babri Masjid riot take place? Why? Because the politicians. Gujarat riot, politicians. What happened about 9-11? See my cassette, it was an inside job. According to 72 scientists of America, they say 9-11 cannot be done by 19 Arabs. It's impossible. It was inside job. 72 scientists of America, not Zakir Naik. Inside job, who did it? George Bush, okay, Afghanistan, then wait, let me complete my answer. Afghanistan, thousands of people being killed. They are sending cluster bombs, cowards there. Thousands of people, you are talking about suicide bombs, that is haram. I'm not condoning it, I'm condemning it. But the bigger thing to be condemned is the Americans sending their fighters in Afghanistan, killing thousands of people, in Iraq, killing thousands of people. Saddam Hussein. 
I am not a fan of Saddam Hussein. He has done mistakes. The people of Iraq, they were fed up of Saddam Hussein. But after America came there, they are more fed up of the American than Saddam Hussein. Oh. That does not justify, just because Saddam Hussein was bad, that does not justify America to come and take over Iraq. Why are they doing it? For the money, for the oil. What is the main interest? It's the oil. Who created Taliban? When Russia came, the Americans supported the Afghanis, created Taliban. Now they want to take over the fighting back. Who is the creation? Americans. The biggest threats are going to me in this history, George Bush. Now he's no longer there. George Bush, yeah, number one. I'm with one. you on that. Sorry? I'm with you on that. You're with me on that. So I'm also going to America. I'm even going to America live and on satellite, giving the message to Americans. I was the first person that I know of in the public after 9-11 in Australia. I said, I'm a fundamentalist and I consider George Bush to be the biggest terrorist. It came at headlines. In December, in December 2001, when I gave a talk in Australia, when the Consul General asked me that what do you consider, who's a terrorist, I said George Bush number one. It came as headline, Dr. Zakir and I call themselves the fundamentalists and consider George Bush to be terrorist number one. Now, every Tom, Dick and Harry is calling him a terrorist. At that time, no one had the guts. What we realized, we are speaking the truth. Now, whether George Bush, you know, many people say, when I gave a talk in London on terrorism, very good talk, people enjoyed. A youngster comes and says, death to George Bush, death to George Bush. Full talk of mine gone. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were two staunchest enemy of Islam. Both were called Umar, Umarain. The Prophet prayed to Allah that give hidayah to one of these two Umar, and Umar bin Khattab. May Allah be pleased with him, who was the second color of Islam. Allah gave hidayah, who was the staunchest enemy of Islam, became the staunchest supporter. Therefore I said, may Allah give hidayah to George Bush. I cannot, I can speak, I cannot give hidayah. I can tell him what he's doing is wrong. I don't want to kill him. I want him to accept Islam. Killing is useless. What's the use of killing? Accepting is better. So that's the reason we are giving the message. Those whose hearts are opening, they're accepting. Inshallah, God will open your heart also one day. So when God opens your heart one day, I cannot do it. I can give the message, I can't force you. Unless God gives you, unless you strive. If you strive, God will help you. If you don't strive, your heart will not be opened. Some people ask question only for questioning. Are question pushne ka hai. But the true gentleman, Marat ka bacha, wo hai. When he gets the answer, he accepts it. You know, people just ask for questioning. My question pushne ke liye. You spoke very loudly. I am asking you, I gave a speech. I said so many things. Do you agree with it or not? Yes, I agree with it. Are you a Hindu? I'm actually your favorite. I'm an atheist. Atheist, That's what I heard you enjoy. You're atheist. You're my favorite. No, I'm not your friend, but I was told that you like having debates with such. Yes, yes, fav, atheist. Okay, brother, you're an atheist. Fine. I would like to congratulate you. You'd like to what? I would like to congratulate you. You know why? Why? The reason I congratulate you because all the others, all the human beings, they're blindly following. Father is a Christian, so son is a Christian. His parents are Hindu, he's a Hindu. Many of the Muslim parents are Muslims. You are thinking. I don't know their father was atheist. Father was atheist? No. no. Ah, good. So you're thinking. These are the people they worship, this almighty God who falls down and breaks. So you are thinking. And the reason I congratulate you is because you have said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha, there is no God. You have already said half the kalma. But not the second part. They have said the full kalma. You are half Muslim now. Atheist means half kalma, you know. La ilaha. Only thing I have to do is illa Allah, but Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. <laughs> I'm congratulating you because you have agreed to the other people who believe in wrong gods. First, I have to spend half my time in trying to convince them the God you're worshipping is wrong. You have already agreed there's no God. Only thing I have to do is prove to you about Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. Brother, suppose there's equipment which is bought. Equipment is bought in front of you. No one in the world has ever seen. No human being has seen is bought in front of you. And if I ask you the question, who is the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of that equipment? 
I have heard this speech and it's the creator. It's the creator. So the creator of that equipment will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of that object. You may say creator, you may say manufacturer, you may say inventor, you may say maker, whatever it is somewhat similar. Now I'm asking you a question. How did this universe come into existence? How did this universe come into existence? You are going to now mention the Big Bang and all No, I'm that. asking you. Yeah. Don't tell me what I'm going to mention. Well, I want to know what, if, what is the... If you no, you to... are... I'm asking you according to your knowledge. No, the thing is, I've actually heard this speech before. I'm Fine. actually a good fan of yours, you know that. Mashallah, you're a good fan. Good fan, theoretical or practical? If theoretical you're a practical fan, practical. you will follow. If I'm wrong, you correct me. If I'm right, you join me. No, I only learned about you about two weeks back, actually. Fine, so in two weeks, you became a great fan. Mashallah, I'm very happy about it. In two weeks, you learn about me. That means you know. You know about the creation, the Big Bang, yes, which yes, we came yes, to know yes, recently. That, Quran yes. mentioned 14 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30. Well, and I don't the, know the verses, but... Fine, but you know that. <laughs> yeah. Similarly, we did not know that the earth was spherical. We came to know recently. Quran mentioned 14 years ago in Surah Nadia, chapter 7 yes, and verse number 30, it is spherical. We thought first the light of the moon is its own light. Quran mentions 14 years ago, the light of the moon is not its own light, reflected light, which we came to know recently. Who could have mentioned this? There's biology. There is water cycle, which you learned in school. There is embryology. There is genetics. My question is, who could have mentioned all these things in the Quran? So if you have heard this, you also know the answer. Who could have mentioned in the Quran? Same answer. The creator. The creator. This creator who has mentioned in the Quran, we call as Allah. So that means you believe in the creator. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? The creator. The creator who created the human beings, the person who created all this universe. It can't be a human being who writes all this. So now do you believe in a creator? Well, there are different perspectives, you see, a person the has. You can we'll think discuss about later on. science or you can think about God. Now, the debate is which to follow. No, we can follow both. I believe but in as both. I, as I I'm said. A, I'm a student of science also. Also, I'm a believer in God. Both. As, as my opening question stated, what I asked about terrorism, I believe you also know those are certain facts that brother, we will come to terrorism later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 brother, we are talking brother, about brother, that. Brother, Why brother, I don't brother, believe. Brother, wait, brother, wait. You asked me direct question, suicide bombing, killing innocent wrong, I gave direct answer. Now I am asking you a direct question, you give me a direct answer. You ask me, you are happy with my answer. No beating around the bush. I am asking you directly, when you believe in the creator, why don't you accept the creator? I am asking you directly. So you ask me direct question in front of 30,000 people, I give a direct answer. I am asking you a direct question. You didn't believe in God, I congratulate you. Now I prove to you that the creator wrote the Quran. Now I am asking the question, why don't you believe in the creator? I didn't say that I believe in the Creator. No, I you was said just the mimicking your speech, oh, I which didn't, I watched. Brother, I didn't ask you to come here to mimic me, please. Did I ask you to come and mimic me? I asked you, who wrote? You said Creator. I didn't say, did I say that? No, but that's Even what in my you, speech, I don't what, say. That's what you said. Even I didn't say, speech. the questioner said. That means you haven't seen my speech correctly. Like how you are telling, when I ask an yes, yes, he gives the reply, Creator, not I. Not I. That means I haven't seen my speech correctly. It is a person like you, who I might have asked the question to, he gave the reply. Like how you gave the reply now. Did I ask you to mimic or did I ask you to give answer from your heart? So that means you are not a very truthful person, huh? You asked me a question, brother. I gave answer directly from my heart, correct? Yeah. I'm asking a question, you gave the answer, now you're saying that I'm mimicking. Okay, if I say the creator is what you want to hear, now, not what if, I want to no, hear. No, 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 no. Listen, hypothetically here. Not hypothetically. If, if we say that I agree to the Creator, now, what if I say that I agree to the Creator of what was written, but I don't believe what was written justifies everything? You're giving me six facts. Correct, you're correct, correct. Me, very good, very good. You're wait, telling wait, wait, me wait, wait. six things, but there's a lot in life that's not written there. Fine, fine. There's Come, nothing wait, about wait, 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 wait. gravity or. You're just telling me about light on the moon. Correct. Very the world good, very light. good, very good. The brother says he believes in the creator, but everything is not there. Brother, this book, the Quran, is not a book of science. S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. It's a book of signs. S-I-G-N-S. -S. It's a book of ayats. There are more than 6,000 signs, 6,000 ayats in the Quran, out of which more than 1,000 speak about science. It's not a book of science. 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, that's not written there. 
But the beauty of it is, what is written, we did not know. You mean me, did not me, the creator wrote. If it had everything of science, it would be a voluminous book as big as the World Trade Center. Or maybe it's Buruj Dubai, tallest yeah. building now. It is not a book of science, brother. Please don't misunderstand. It is to prove to the scientist that this is the word of God. This is the word of creator. What do you have to tell me to disprove it? You have to take out a mistake in the Quran. Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 82, Afala yadatabburun al Quran. Walau kana min in the garilla. Lavaju the fiqh tilaf and kafira. Do they not consider the Quran with K? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been contradictions in it. There would have been mistakes in it. So for you to disprove the Quran to be the word of Allah, we have to take out mistakes. That is the reason I said, please come up and take out mistakes in the Quran. Why? If it's wrong, I will leave it. If it's right, you join me. It's a two way, not one way. But uh, how old is the Quran? I don't exactly know. How the old Quran is, the Quran? is approximately 1400 years old. Okay, and how long have human beings existed in this planet? Human beings in millions of years. Millions of years. Uh, I'm not challenging you. Don't don't get this wrong. I've just I'm, no. I like I people challenging you, me. What is I the like reason? people challenging me. Yeah. Okay, if you want to challenge, then I'll I'll take that step then. Okay, what is the reason that? Uh, first of all, is I believe Christianity is older than. Uh, Islam. It's, no, uh, no, you're wrong. Years, uh, you're wrong. Is Christianity is not older than how, Islam. How, what's the difference? Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on the earth. Okay. From the first human being, it's already there. Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger. He came 1400 years ago. He was the last messenger. Quran is the last revelation, not the first revelation. This is the last testament. Hmm. Otherwise, Islam is there since time immemorial. Isa right. salam, Jesus Christ was a Muslim according to the Quran. Abraham was a Muslim according to the Quran. Peace be upon them all. So Islam means peace acquired by submitting our will to Almighty God. It is there since time immemorial. Okay, so getting to the point, I asked you the time scale that the Quran has existed and the time scale of human beings. After you Not time scale that, of Quran. Islam is there since time immemorial. Yeah, no, no, of the Quran, the book, Quran. No, uh, the holy book. Uh, not, not Islam, we can say Islam existed for forever, but why was the Quran invent, uh, placed on earth afterwards? Very and, good. And, and, very good, very good and, question. And uh, I also wanted to ask you something I always wanted to know about, that is the uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy on that, but why do you, do you believe in evolution or you believe man was placed directly? And the whole thing of apes, the science that has proved that human beings emanated from apes. Do you agree with Brothers that? Two questions that science... Two questions. Sorry about that. No problem. Two questions. Do you believe in Darwin's theory? Science has proved that human beings have been evaluated from apes. Do you believe in? Do you believe that human beings are placed? And second question, why was Quran revealed 14 years back? Why not before? Two questions. Regarding a correction in your question. Science hasn't proved that human beings have been all from Mabe. It is Darwin's theory, not Darwin's fact. It's a theory. There is no book today. There is no book today on the face of the earth which says the fact of evolution. It's theory. The fact of the origin of human beings. No, it's theory. And for your information, Darwin himself said that there were missing links in his theory. If you read his book on the origin of species, he writes in this on a ship by the name of HMS Beagle. He goes to an island by the name of Calatropis. And there he sees birds were pecking in niches, in holes. Based on the holes they pecked, the beak of the birds became short and long. Based on that observation, he propounded the theory of natural selection. He wrote a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson in 1861 that I have no proof for my theory of evolution, but because it helps me in giving replies to embryology, to genetics, that's the reason I'm propounding. He had no proof on it. That's the reason in our school, you know, to joke around, we used to say, if you were present at Darwin's time, Darwin would have been proved right. Trying to insinuate, I'm telling my colleague, he's an ape, he's a monkey. There were missing links. Furthermore, all the three stages today, science and advance, we have come to know that the first stage, the Australopithecus, and the ice man. The next stage that we have, Neanderthal man, Cro-Magnon. All these stages that we have, today of the human being that we found, there's no link between them. 
Certain things what Darwin said, that life is evolved from water. I agree with it. Quran says that Surah Anbiya chapter 21, verse number 30, wa ja'alna min al kulla shayin hai. We have created every living thing from water. I believe in that. But saying that we have evolved from one species to the other is a hypothesis. According to molecular biologist Hans S. Craig, he said it is letting your imagination run too wild to say that we have been evolved from apes. If that was true, today we'll find someone in between man and human being. You only find in mythology. You don't find anywhere in the world a monkey man. Do you find? So why do you think evolution has stopped now? It is a hypothesis and most of the scientists today disagree with it. There is only a small negligible percentage which yet believe in Darwin's theory. Majority of the scientists have already disproved Darwin's theory. I feel your knowledge of science is not up to date, brother. But Dr. Naik. Not but, wait. All right. You're asking me a question, I'm replying. Then we have to give chance to others. You have already asked five, six questions. No, Let's I thought do you were justice. just having fun, that's all. Sorry? I thought you were being entertained with Having fun? Oh, I'm, besides entertaining you, I want to entertain the other non-Muslim brothers. If all non-Muslim get over, come back to you. All so right, what so. we realize, Darwin's theory, brother, your knowledge on science is weak. We say Adam and Eve were the first human beings. That's what the Quran says. Furthermore, regarding your second question. Okay. I have to answer your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have not answered the second question, you want to put the third question. That means you're not listening to me. Or oh, you've forgotten you've asked two questions. No, no, I've asked you the first one. That means you're a good questioner, huh? Now you ask me the question, why was Quran revealed 1400 years back? Why not before? You know my son, he wants to become a doctor. He's telling me, Father, Abba, why do you put me in school and college? Why don't you put me in medical college directly? I said, son, first go to nursery, then go to primary, then go to secondary school, then go to college, then go to medical college. I can't put him in medical college directly. Why? He should know the basics. Similarly, Almighty God is our creator. He kept on sending other revelations. Almighty God, our creator, thought 1400 years back was the right time that human beings could absorb this message. He revealed it. He is our creator. He knows better than you and me. 1400 years back, he revealed his last message the Quran to the last and final messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5 verse number 3 on this day have I perfected my religion for you the perfect form and have complete my favor on you you talk to the human beings and has chosen for you Islam after this nothing new can be added into the basics of Islam nothing can be subtracted that's it so Almighty God knows when we can imbibe the message of the Quran and this is the last testament Last messenger, Prophet Muhammad, no other messenger come after this. Hope this answers your question. That and I hope that you even accept, besides being my fan, you also accept my teachings, inshallah. Maybe next time when you come here. Maybe next time. Maybe. You tell me I'll come again tomorrow. I'm flying tomorrow. I'll come back <laughs> fast for you alone. Shall we have the next question from the sister side? Finally, um, my name's Tanya. I work for Cisco. Uh, I'm not here to disagree with anything. But I've always had a lot of people, especially Muslims, well, not a lot of people, just Muslims, always telling me, because you're a Catholic, you're going to go to Jahannam, but we're Muslims, you need to convert and you will go to heaven. According to me, I'm a good Catholic. I try to be a good Catholic. I don't intentionally commit sin. But does that mean because I'm a Catholic, I'm going to go to hell? And if I'm a Muslim, I'm going to go to heaven? Sister asked a question that many of her Muslim friends say, because she's a Catholic, because she's a Christian, she will go to hell. That is it true that because she's a Christian, you'll go to hell? Sister, according to me, if you're a true Christian, if you truly follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, inshallah, you shall go to Jannah. Okay. But, but, <laughs> if you truly follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, seek ye the truth, and the truth shall free you. Correct? Now, what you are following, I don't know. Are you following your church or are you following Jesus Christ, peace be upon him? If you are following your church, the chances of going to Jannam is very high. If you are following Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, inshallah, inshallah, you shall go to Jannah. Now, if you read the Bible, there are sayings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. I don't know how much you are well versed with the Bible. Now, all the sayings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, are in red letter. Are in right. red letter. Yeah. Sister, do you believe Jesus to be God? Well, I'm a bit confused about that, so I'm not going to get into that. No, but I'm I asking just, yes or no. Well, 
confused God. It's, no, it's it's not confusion, but I don't want to answer something I don't know. And it's not funny. I'm not saying it's you know or not. Sister, I'm not saying you know or not. What do you believe I'm asking? No, I do believe he's God. Yes, yes that's it. I'm not saying yes. what you know. You may not I be do. able to prove it. Yeah, Fine. I do. Sister, I'll tell you one thing. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was born miraculously without any main intervention. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. Yes. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, they are going together. But one may ask, where is the parting of ways? The parting of ways is, sister, that most of the Christians, almost all, they believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is Almighty God. They believe he claimed divinity. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement. There is not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says, worship me. Sister, if you can point out a single unequivocal statement, a single unambiguous statement, anywhere from the Bible, in which Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says, worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity today. In fact, if you read the Bible, I'm not talking about you accepting I'll come to it. Or not. I'm I, not. I got my answer. Already. I'm giving you. Yes. I, I got my answer. You got half the answer. I'm giving the complete answer, okay. Insha. You can go ahead. You got half the answer. Okay. I told you that if you're a true Christian, you should go to Jannah. Yes. You don't know what a true Christian is. I'm giving you information about true Christian is. Okay. If you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God is a Muslim. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, submitted his will to God. He was a Muslim. He never said he was God. It's clearly mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse number 24. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that the words that you hear are not mine, but my Father's who has sent me. And it's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. Ye men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. So Jesus Christ is a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. So from the Bible you come to know that Jesus Christ was one of the most beloved messengers of Almighty God. We love him, we respect him. Do we follow his teachings? If you compare what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Bible, I told that yesterday that we Muslims, we follow more of the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Jesus Christ, according to the Gospel of Luke, he was circumcised on the eighth day. We Muslims are circumcised, most of the Christians are. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, you have to follow each and every law. Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, verse number 17. Everything of the Old Testament, you can't break one law or dot or a tittle. As I mentioned in my speech, it's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse number 8, in the book of Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2 to 5, and the book of Leviticus chapter number 11, verse number 7 to 8, that you should not have pork. We Muslims don't have pork, but most of the Christians have pork. It's mentioned in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18, book of Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1, you should not have alcohol. Muslims don't have alcohol, but Christians have alcohol. So if Christian means a person, who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. So if you become a true Christian and truly follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I go, shall I send him? It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that here shall he speak. He shall glorify me. Verbatim quotation from the Bible, King James Version. So Jesus Christ is prophesying about the coming of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you're a true Christian, 
If you truly believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, you have to believe in the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if you're a true Christian, you'll believe in Prophet Muhammad, and inshallah, you shall go to Jannah. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you. So sister, are you a true Christian or not? We would like all the questioners to keep their questions short and to the point so that we can entertain in the limited time as many questioners as we possibly can. Let us ask the next question from the brother's side. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Aditya Mashael Kar and I work for Dubai First. Uh, we are a finance company. Uh, I have a very simple one line question. Uh, what and why is the difference between Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims? Wa alaikum assalam, brother Aditya. May peace be on you too. MashaAllah, speaking Arabic, salam means may peace be on you. Islam is a religion of peace. He has the question, basic question, what is the difference between Sunni and Shia Muslim? Correct? Yes. Brother, there is no Sunni and Shia in the Quran. Read the Quran, there is no Sunni Shia in the Quran. Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 103, Wa tasimu bihablillahi jamia wala tafarraku. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. You have to follow Allah and His Rasul. Follow the Quran and the authentic Hadith. Shiaism came later on because of political differences. It has nothing to do with Islam. In Islam, there's no sect. Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 159, If anyone makes sects in the reign of Islam, O Prophet, have nothing to do with him. Allah will look after the affairs. There are many verses in the Quran which say, Making sect in the religion of Islam is prohibited. There is no sect. All these are because of political differences that came. But in Islam, there's nothing like Shia Sunni. There's only Muslim. Muslim is a person who submits his will to God. So in that case, uh, which belief is more correct, Shia or Sunni? The belief which believes in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith is correct. The belief. The person who believes in the teachings of Quran and the Sahih Hadith is correct. The moment you ask questions, if he gives reference from the Quran, he's correct. If he says, my sheikh says this, my sheikh said that, my imam said this. If the saying of the imam match with the Quran, we match with it. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 59, Ati Allah, obey Rasul, obey Allah and obey the messengers. And those who have been given the power of Amr, of commandment. But the verse does not stop there, it continues. But if the people of knowledge differ, go back to Allah and his Rasul. If two scholars say two different things, check up which scholar matches with Quran and Sahih Hadith. The one who follows with Quran and Sahih Hadith is on the straight path, is a true Muslim, the other is not. So brother, which one would you like to choose? Shia or Sunni? <laughs> well, sir, I'm, I'm a Hindu, so... Sorry? I'm, I'm a Hindu, I, I really don't know much, but it was just that I was curious to know uh, about, you know... No, uh, where did I thought... I thought now you have to decide. Should I become a Shia or a Sunni? <laughs> no, not really, sir. So I'm I thought born maybe, a Hindu and I die a Hindu. <laughs> born a Hindu, brother, even I was born a Hindu. I don't know that I die as Hindu. You know what the definition of the word Hindu? Hindu by definition means a person who lives in the land of Indus Valley. The people who live in India are called as Hindus. Correct. This word Hindu is not in any of the religious scriptures. It was first used by the Arabs. When the Arabs came to India, they gave the word Hindi, Hindi hai. You know, when I go to Saudi and here, they call me Hindi. Hindi means a person Hindi. coming from India. Hindi. It is not a religion. So you are a Hindu, I am a Hindu geographically. Hindu is not a religious definition at all. According to Pandit Jawal Nehru, if you read his book, Discoveries of India, he writes, the word Hindu doesn't exist in any of the Hindu scriptures before the advent of the Arabs to India. So Hindu is a geographical definition, brother. Even I'm a Hindu. I come from India. And the Arabs call me Hindi, Hindi. Hindi doesn't mean idol worshipper. Hindi means coming from India. So I know you're a Hindu. I'm talking about a religious belief. If you're religious belief, do you believe in one God? Well, sir, I know where we're going, but uh, I'm a very strong believer of the fact no that, i don't uh, i'm saying a statement would no, not no i'm not telling you brother i'm not you know, telling you to change your religion put me in a mosque i'm that, not telling i'm not telling change your religion if i ask you do you believe in god you said yes if i say do you believe in idols you may say no then i'll correct you okay okay uh, so so yeah, your question is do you believe in do one you believe god? in one god <laughs> no i oh. believe in a lot of gods okay we have fine 33 33 crore very good gods. very good now i want to help you don't become a muslim but I want to help you. 
because you are not a Muslim, I want to help you more. Now you said you believe in Thaitri, pro God. Where you got this from? The Hindu scriptures, correct? Now if you read Chandogya, I just heard about it, sir. From to be where? Very honest, oh, so you believe? Cited. Oh, mashallah. So you believe in anything? What do you hear? Why don't you believe in what you hear from me? Well, I, sir, am I your enemy, brother? I love you, brother. Well, sir, I love where, you. Where I come from, uh, it's it's not that uh, I've just heard it from one person the way you said it. Uh, but yeah, I've heard it from my parents, my uncles, and probably 1.2 uh, billion people in India believe Fine. exactly the way I believe. Fine. So, so, I, so it's not I that all of, all of us are all of us are doing something wrong. I'll correct you. There's something which you. we are doing right, which is common between us. I disagree. Us, which I believe is Hinduism. I disagree that 1.2 billion believe. I do agree majority of the Hindus believe, not all. I know many Hindus who disagree with what you have said, because those who have read the Hindu scriptures. Where you get this from? From the scriptures. Correct. Anyone says from the mind, if your father tomorrow says 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, will you believe? If, oh, your, sorry, father sir, I, I didn't you. if your father says 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, will you believe? Uh, well, not unless somebody corrects me. No, if your father tells you today, 2 okay. plus 2 is equal to 5, no, will you believe? I will not believe. MashaAllah, you're an educated man, therefore you won't believe, correct? correct? Now, I'm giving you reference from your scriptures. Okay. Right? You have to ask your father, in Hindu scriptures, as I mentioned earlier, there are two types of scriptures. One is Shruti, one is Smriti. Shruti means the word of God. Vedas, uh, Upanishads. Next comes Smriti. The Puranas, the Ithyas, Ramayan, Mahabharat. If you read Upanishad, the most superior, it's mentioned in Chandogya Upanishad. Chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. It's a Sanskrit quotation, brother. Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Sveta Setar Upanishad. Chapter number 6, verse number 9. Nakasya kasij janitana chadipa. Of that God, there is no superior. There are no parents. It's mentioned in Sveta Setar Upanishad. Chapter number 4, verse number 19. Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no image. Pratima in Sanskrit means an image, a photograph, a painting, a picture, a sculpture, a statue. Sveta Setar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19 says, Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there are no images, no photographs, no paintings, no pictures, no statues, no idols. If you read the Vedas, I am talking about the higher scriptures, I am not talking about lower scriptures. I am talking about Shrutis. Shrutis consists of Upanishads and Vedas. It's mentioned in Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Of that God, there are no images, there are no photographs, there are no paintings, there are no pictures, there are no idols, there are no statues. You will tell me, I know where you're taking me. I'm not taking you anywhere, I'm taking you to your scriptures. I'm taking you to your scriptures, fine? That's the different thing, your scriptures match with the Quran, what can I do? Furthermore, brother, if you read Yajur Vey, chapter number 40, verse number 9, it says, Andhat Prabhavishanti ya asambuti mupaste. They are entering darkness, those who worship the Asambuti. Asambuti are natural things like fire, water, air, etc. Who says that? Yajurved. And the verse continues. They are entering more in darkness, those who worship the Sambuti. Sambuti are the created things like table, chair, car, idol, etc. Who says that? Yajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. Now, when your father told you about Thaitri, pro gods, I don't know whether he gave you references or not. I am giving you references. You can take my references. Note it down, take the video cassette, go and ask your father. Go and ask your pandit. I am not telling you to believe me blindly, brother. You believed your father blindly, you did a mistake once. Don't do the mistake the second time. If you know where I'm taking you, I'm not in a hurry. I want you to be a firm believer, not just because my father said. So tomorrow you can quote the scriptures. Fine. Now, if you are a Hindu, true Hindu, you should follow the scriptures. Like the sister that came earlier, she asked me a question once, she asked me twice, she asked me third time, she got convinced. You don't get convinced, no problem. You take time. She got convinced with three questions. I'm not forcing you. It's not allowed in Islam. I'm only giving you guidance. I Thank cannot, you for that, sir. I cannot, Thank you. I cannot give it unless Almighty God puts it in your heart. So if you want to search the truthfulness in Almighty God, all these references you can go and check up. Go and ask your father, go and ask your pandit, 
I want not you. I want your father to come along with you, inshallah. Hope that answers the question. Thank you very much for all the information, sir. May God bless you. Shall we have the next question from the brother? Greetings to you in the mighty and matchless name of God. My name is Paul and I'm a student. I have a doubt. I mean, uh, most people would also have, I mean, you've already spoken about free will and uh, things like that. I have doubts about free will as to what free will is and uh, do we have free will to do what we want to do. And uh, as you quoted uh, uh, chapter 2 verse 256 from Quran, there is no compulsion in religion and the truth will stand out from falsehood, right? So I am looking for truth and the truth will set me free, yeah? That is John chapter 8 verse 32. Correct, you're right. I mean, I'm not as great as you in uh, quoting things from uh, no, great. Bible and Quran, whatever, but I just want to know as to whether we have free will and what free will is and uh, when they say, and the quotation that I've said that there is no compulsion in religion, what is compulsion here? I mean, I don't know sure whether it is, I've taken it out of context and quoted it, what is before it and what is after it, because my friends couldn't explain to me what was there before it and after it. Those Probably I'll have true. to read it. And when you say there is no compulsion, uh, made to do like say, suppose you have to say prayers five times a day, right? Do we, is it compulsory? The brother asked two questions. The first question, what is a free will? And as Gospel of John chapter 8 verse 32 says that seek the truth and truth shall free you. Jesus Christ, peace be upon said that. And he quote from the Quran, like Rafid Deen, chapter 2, Surah Baqarah, verse number 256. MashaAllah is comparing, you know, great. He says he seeks the truth and I pray to God that may that truth set you free. Correct. As far as free will is concerned, free will means what you want you can do. For example, today I want to destroy the full world. Can I do it? I can try, but I will not succeed. You understand? Free will means what is in your capacity. Whatever is in your capacity you can do. Whether you are able to do or not, that is secondary. For example, in my capacity to give a lecture. You can try, like how you tried and you give a quotation. Whether you can give the full lecture, I don't know. But you have the free will to try. So similarly, you have the free will to rob. You have the free will to become honest. You have the free will to kill. You have the free will to save a human life. It's your free will. So free will means you can do what you want. No one can force you. Fine? No one can force you. Now coming to the question of La Ikhra Fiddin, chapter 2, verse 256. There's no compulsion in religion, but truth stands out clear from error. Here means you cannot force anyone to accept Islam at the point of the sword. I cannot take a gun and put it on his forehead and say, accept Islam. It's not allowed. I cannot force anyone. But when I give the logical reasons, for example, doctor says, you have diabetes. Don't have sugar. Oh, doctor is forcing me not to have sugar. Yes. He's compelling me. If I don't want to listen to doctor, I can go and yet have chocolate. So the doctor is advising you. But an intelligent man will not have sugar. Will have less sugar. But the doctor cannot force him. Brother. No, I think you're looking down and wondering. No, I'm, I'm trying to concentrate Constant. more on you rather than anything else. Fine. So the thing is there that if the doctor tells you something, you can use the word, the doctor compelled me not to have sugar. But the right word is the doctor advised me and I'm following. Similarly, like, is it compulsory to pray five times? For a Muslim, yes. It's compulsory. Is it a compulsion? It's not a compulsion with force. If he doesn't want, he doesn't pray. He can say, I don't believe in Allah. No one can force him. Because he agrees with the system. Ah, if I pray five times, I am getting guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am on the straight path, therefore I am praying five times. Like how a doctor advises you, don't have sugar. He wants to follow, he follows. You have to fast. It's an advice by Almighty God. Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse 183. Fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you so that you may learn self-restraint. Your taqwa will increase. So I am fasting. No one can force me with a gun to fast. Is it compulsory to fast? Yes, for a Muslim. Is there compulsion in religion? No one can force me. I should fast with physical force. So that's talking about physical force. No one can physically force anyone to do anything. It's your free will. No, but then uh, why is it called, why is it that we, it is compulsory to fast, compulsory to... There are two types of compulsory. One compulsory is with reason and logic. The other compulsory is with force. What Quran is talking about, compulsion is force. 
like when doctor says don't have sugar is it compulsory yes doctor say compulsory don't have sugar is the doctor forcing you literally yes with logic not with a gun right or wrong so the doctor is saying compulsory no sugar for you if you have faith in doctor you follow if you don't have faith you don't follow so same way this is advice given by almighty god in the quran if you believe almighty god is the creator you follow if you don't believe you don't follow so anyone who is a muslim is a person who submits his will to almighty god the free will god has given i can either go against the commandment of god or i can follow his commandment after god has given me free will if i follow his commandment i am called as a muslim a muslim is a person who submits his will to almighty god there is no physical force on me the compulsion that spoken in surah bakara chapter 2 verse 256 is the physical compulsion it is not the logical compulsion 2 plus 2 is how much 4 i said is it compulsory 4 I mean that's that that is free will yeah it is your choice correct. to choose correct you can say three also correct you can say five also if i can say it is three then i can i have to prove it right no no you will don't prove you can say three anyone can do anything to you i didn't get it sir you can say three also without proving can anyone do anything to you if you say 2 plus 2 equal to 3 illogically what can you do but then they'll say he doesn't know math so what they but you can say or not can you yeah, say on yes yeah, that is a free but will but people no? will call ha ah, that is a free will correct that's what i want but if you say 2 plus 2 equal to 3 people will say you don't know maths so if you say 2 plus 2 is 4 it's not compulsory same way if you pray five times you are a muslim if you say don't pray five times you're not a muslim simple so it is a compulsion with reason and logic so as you told 2 plus 2 equal to 4 is compulsory why for a person who knows maths For a person who doesn't know maths, he may not say two plus two is four. He may say two plus two is five. Two plus two is six. So this is compulsion of reason, logic, and iman and belief. So hope that answers the question. No, as in uh, why? I, uh, why? I... Do you have a new question? No, it's not a new question. It's like. Uh, so did I answer your question or not? Yes, sir. Okay. You answer the question. Yeah, okay. Do you have a new question? No yeah, problem. You can I, ask. Okay. What I'm saying is. it says i mean now you're saying it has we have to do it five times now if i say i do it 10 times hmm but i'm not doing it at uh, the prayer time say asar i'm not doing it at maghrib i'm not doing it at these certain times hmm. but i do it hmm and uh, i do it when i'm when i'm going to eat my food before the meal i I'll, i'll say my prayer when i'm sitting when i'm standing when i'm walking when i'm running fine correct so the but now why 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 is that word compulsory five times fine. that i'm not now for doctor say don't have sugar okay doctor i won't have sugar i won't have salt i won't have rice i will die don't have sugar okay i won't have sugar i won't have rice i won't have bread i won't have food i won't have non veg i won't have veg because then will die so you can't go overboard doctor say don't have sugar okay at this time have medicine you can have sugar at so and so time have limited so this is because doctor knows Now you try and become more intelligent than the Creator, than Almighty God. He knows better than you and me. If you say no, no, I'll do like that, then you will suffer. So doctor knows the human body. Almighty Creator knows us better. So He is our Creator. He has given the advice. If you follow, you will be called as a Muslim submitting a will to God. If you don't follow, there is no compulsion of force. I cannot force you to accept Islam. Can I force you? No. No, you cannot because I have the free will. Correct. With your free will, some people like man, so they accept it. It's not necessary. You also have to accept. Tomorrow, if you agree, you are a seeker of truth. Correct? You are a seeker of truth. Shall free you? Because I'll ask, I'll seek, and then I'll know. Sure. Once you are convinced, you're most welcome. So I'm waiting for the day that you're convinced. Hopefully, inshallah. The next question from the brother. Yes, my dear brother, Doctor Zaghi, how are you? I'm sure you are tired, Anna. Uh? I have a very simple question. You know Sikhism, the foundation stone or Amritsar Guru Mandir was given a chance to a Muslim by the name Mia Mir. Why, on the contrary, you say a non-Muslim cannot go to the house of God? What's your comments about it? But they said, "How am I? I said, 'Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. Am I tired? I never get tired of answering questions to non-Muslims. I never get tired. You're have, very kind. I have my flight tomorrow, 11 o'clock morning. You're fine. very kind. So for me, no problem. I love it. The more you ask questions, the more energy I get. 
you asked the question that a Muslim laid the foundation of Amritsar. Then golden why? Temple, yeah. Sorry? The Golden Temple. Golden the temple. Holy, the holy Temple. Laid the foundation. So why can't non Muslims go to Makkah? Whether I give the answer in my talk. If, if someone has permitted, maybe Amritsar is not a place of sanctuary. It's not a cantonment area. Makkah and Madina is a cantonment area. You can go to any other mosque. If you want to go to the mosque of Dubai, I will take you. Brother. It's the most you want to come to the Sikh religion, Amritsar, Golden Temple. I know that. I know that very well, brother. But it may not be as sacred as our Makkah and Medina. If you want to go to any other mosque, you're most welcome. I will take you. But these two mosques, as I mentioned in my answer, they are the cantonment area and you require a visa. The visa to go to Makkah and Medina, these two mosques, you to say with your tongue, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. If you don't get visa, you cannot go there. If I recite those verses, can I go there? Yes, if you recite and you believe, you can, no one can stop you. That's no problem. So you want to recite those verses? To go there or because you believe in it? I did hear. You re repeated these verses with the other people. I huh. did hear. And so I, do you believe I, in it? Oh, it's easy to repeat. No, no. Do you repeat? Do it's you it, believe in it? It's, it's a fact. It's, there is a fact and the fact should be believed. So do you believe that there's one God? There is. Do I you believe in it. And do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God? By Without any doubts, yes. So he person is the who, last prophet, yes. So a person who believes there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger is a Muslim. So if you say That's this true. and you believe that, no one can stop you to go to Makkah and Medina. I am, principally I am a true Muslim because I have surrendered to the Mashallah, will of the God. Mashallah. So would you like to say it in Arabic? Congratulations, brother. Would you like to repeat it in Arabic, brother? Would you like to repeat it in Arabic? I don't mind. Okay. Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Anna. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abdu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa rasuluhu. I bear witness. I bear witness. I'm saying in English the translation. I bear witness. I bear witness. Bear witness. That there is no God. That there is no God. But Allah. But Allah. And Prophet Muhammad. And Prophet Muhammad. Is. Is. The messenger. Is the messenger. And servant of Allah. And. The servant of Allah. Servant of Allah. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. <laughs> Brother, may Allah reward you. We welcome you to the fold of the religion of peace. And inshallah, when you want to go to Makkah and Medina, please let me know. I will sponsor your trip. Thank you inshallah. very much. Thank you very much. God bless you. Inshallah. <laughs> I like your spirit. I like yourself. God bless you. Keep spreading this message. People need it. World needs it. World needs a peace. World needs the peace leaders like you. My blessings with you. My good wishes with you. The next question from the brother here. Good evening. My name is Rahul. I work in an ad agency in Media City. I have to say, up confrontation handle karne mein kafi seasoned hoge. And uh, I would like to ask you questions on two topics with respect. Uh, the first is, uh, I do agree with you that uh, when you marry your direct brother, the likelihood of uh, handicapped children is very, very high. But uh, I also agree to the fact that God, man was created with one pair and then they propagated from there. But when you put the two together, it creates a little confusion. Because if you marry your sister, which obviously the first few did, we should all be some level of handicap, you know. MashaAllah. Brother asked a very good question. He tried to link the question that was asked yesterday and the question asked today. I wasn't there yesterday. <laughs> uh, anyway, the question asked yesterday was that if all humankind has been created from one pair of male and female, how did humanity come into existence. So then I said there that the rule that time was, today the rule is that marrying among close brothers and sisters, it's incest. But that time the rule was that you cannot marry brothers and sisters of the same delivery. Adam and Eve is the first pair of human beings, later on their children, but marrying brothers and sisters of the same delivery was prohibited. 
but different delivery was permitted. Different, I'm sorry? Different deliveries. Deliveries. If brothers and sisters born in the same delivery, they were not permitted to marry. But different deliveries, they were permitted. And later on, the rule came that marrying brother and sister whether the same delivery or different delivery is prohibited. The rules keep on changing, but the final concept, the basic is same. Now coming to your question. That if humanity was evolved, then Adam and Eve, they would have been handicapped. So that's what I'm telling you. It is not 100% that if a brother and sister marry, they should be handicapped. It's not at all 100%. Chances are more, maybe 1%, maybe 2%. It's not 100% at all. For example, if you have extramarital sex, not that you will get AIDS. It's not a must you will get STD. Chances are there. Whatever, it's not a must. For example, if you jump from the first floor. If you jump from first floor, there's chances you'll die? Chances. Yes. What? Maybe 1%, maybe 2%. If you jump from 100th floor, chances may be 99. Correct? I agree. So just because if I tell you if you jump from first floor, you may die, that doesn't mean you have to die. The chances may be half percent. 0.1%, first floor is not very high. So similarly, there are chances, it doesn't mean that the person will have genetic problems. So this is what, when you pose the question, you should know the percentage. The percentage is very small. And furthermore, that proves that previously it wasn't the case. So what we realize, that this is not a must. It's not a must. But previously in the olden days, yes, brothers and sisters also got married. But that time nothing happened. It's not a very high chances. And doctors, is it possible? Any doctor will say it's possible. If brother, sister got married and did not have genetic problem, very much possible. No one can debate. Chances are there, but it didn't happen. So that's how humanity was evolved. And the ruling about the consecrated marriage I already told you earlier. Sahih. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, another one actually. Sure, most welcome. Now, now this is with regards to the practice of sunnat. I am told that it is uh, actually emulating the practices done by Prophet Muhammad. And uh, if we're only supposed to bow down to the formless God, why do we follow practices which are done by a human incarnation, particularly things like growing your hair to a certain length, which may not have a particular significance in terms of benefit, or kissing the Hazra Aswad when someone also declined that you're just a stone after Prophet Muhammad didn't kiss you, I wouldn't do this either. Brother, that's a very good question. That's a very good question that when we agree Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not Almighty God, why do you have to emulate him? Why do you have to copy him if he's the incarnation of God? He's not incarnation of God. So in your sentence... No, a human incarnation, a human form. He's a human being. He is the best human being, but he's not God. Why do we follow? Because Almighty God has said that. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, 59, Ati Allah, Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. God has said, God said, follow the Prophet, we follow. For example, I'm the boss of a company. I tell, follow my general manager. Now, you will say, why follow general manager, boss? Boss is saying so. If boss says, you have to follow. Unless the general manager goes against me. And if the trusted general manager never go against me. So similarly, the prophet will never go against the teachings of Almighty God. It is because he is the messenger who has got the message of God for us. So when you emulate him, it gives us more blessings. But we can't worship him. We love the Prophet. We revere him. We love him. We obey him. But we don't worship him. So people who go to Dargah, uh, Khwaja Mohinuddin Chisti and all this, this is wrong? It's nowhere mentioned in the Quran to go to Dargah. There's no Hadith saying go to Dargah. And the second part, the significance of Hazrat Aswad? As yes, but again, because the Prophet kissed it, I'm emulating. It doesn't become the fard. It's not compulsory, I have to do it. Sunnat means you will get blessing. But in Sunnat, if you don't do, there's no negative point. In fard, you have to do it. If you don't do it, negative points. Like praying five times, you have to do. Don't do negative points. Sunnat means if you do, plus points. If you don't do, no negative points. So these are additional bonus points. So if you want bonus, you can do it. Not compulsory. If you don't do also, no one can say that you're not a good Muslim. So when you do it, you get additional bonus point. And a good Muslim tries to get more bonus point, but no one can say it's a sin. Therefore, it becomes the sunnah. So Prophet kissed it, we are kissing it. Even if you don't kiss it, yet there's no problem. Hope that's the question. Sahih, thanks very much. You're welcome. The next question from the brother side. 
Uh, hi, Dr. Zakir Naik. My name is Sinto John. I work for RAK Ceramics as a sales executive. I'm a Christian and a strong believer in Jesus Christ as my God. I am well aware that all Muslims do consider Jesus Christ to a high regard as a prophet. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, issue on prohibition of pork in Islam. My first question is, do you consider all the words of Jesus and the miracles performed by Jesus as mentioned in the Bible? And uh, if so, uh, let me explain to you one thing. The premise in which Christians believe that pork or no food is prohibited is uh, from the gospel when Jesus says that uh, whatever comes into you goes out of you, but what comes from your heart is what, is what makes a man pure or impure. So if you consider that, then why do you think, and if you consider Jesus as a prophet, then why do you say that uh, pork is prohibited in Islam? And if not, what do you think Jesus meant by what, when he said that? Before I answer the question, I'd like to welcome the chairman of the Dubai International Holy Quran Award, Mr. Ibrahim Bumala, and also the deputy chairman, Dr. Saeed, for giving us a wonderful opportunity and making us available this hall till so late also, mashallah. I'd like to thank him. And I pray to Almighty God that he gives more opportunity for people of Dubai to hear such lectures and so that more and more people get hidayah. And inshallah, inshallah, the thawab of the people accepting Islam will also go to the Dubai International Quran Award, inshallah. To Dr. Ibrahim Bumala and also to Sheikh Muhammad, inshallah. The brother asked the question that do I believe in the miracles of Jesus Christ mentioned in the Bible? Brother, I believe whatever is mentioned in the Bible. If it matches with the Quran, I believe in it. If it goes against the Quran, I disbelieve in it. If it does not go against, does not match, it is ambiguous. Whatever is matching with the Quran, I believe in it. As far as the second part of the question is concerned, that you say regarding the prohibition of pork, it has been nullified because Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, whatever comes in to you goes out and main things from your heart. How does this nullify? You fail to realize that means you are not reading the Bible. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20, it says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. Whosoever shall break one jot or tittle from the law, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That means you cannot break one jot or tittle from the law. That's what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says. Now you pick up another verse and says, what comes into you goes out, what is from your heart, you can have pork. Where does it mean you can have pork? You're contradicting your God, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. It says, think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. Unless the heavens and the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle can pass away from the law until they're fulfilled. And whosoever shall break one law or tittle, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall keep it and teach men the same, they shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. So if you want to go to Jannah, you have to be better than the Jews. You have to follow each and every commandment of Moses, peace be upon him. This is the teachings of Jesus Christ. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20. Okay, if that is so, then what do you think he meant when he said that whatever you eat comes in, I mean, whatever comes in out and goes out of you, what is from your heart is what decides what is pure or impure. It is simple. What comes in goes out. What's the problem in that? No, the whatever question, you eat goes out. Is there any problem in that? No, it was asked in relevance when Jesus' disciples were questioned by the Jews that why are they not following the traditional ceremony of washing their hands before eating food. That's when Jesus replied that don't you understand that what you eat doesn't matter if it is pure or impure. What, it, what you eat, it, come, it goes into you and comes he, out of he you. He didn't say it doesn't matter what you're eating is pure and impure. That's your thing. It's not mentioned in the Bible that way. No, it is mentioned in the Bible that what you Does eat... Does it say that whether what you're eating is pure or impure doesn't matter? Does it say that? No, it doesn't say. I'm sorry. Ah, okay. so please, please don't put your words in the Bible. Please. Fine, fine, fine. But what I'm quoting is verbatim. Fine. You can check up. I'm quoting from my memory. I don't have the Bible in front of me. But, what but, you're saying, you're putting your words into the Bible. No, but he definitely said that what you eat comes out of you. Of course, what, what you eat has to come out. But what, what do we have to come out? We are human beings. He wouldn't, he wouldn't simply state that for, I don't know, for it no It is simple. Sake. What you eat comes out simple. Your heart means it is from your heart. That means your heart should follow the commandment. 
No, because Jesus he, Christ, peace be upon him, said earlier, don't break one jot or tittle. So if your heart is in it, you will not break a single jot or tittle. Simple explanation. Fine, you don't have to be a doctor of divinity. He was trying to prove the Jews wrong by saying that it is not important. No, not at all. He wasn't trying to do that. That's what you think. That's what the church tells you. It's plain black and white. No, Jesus no. said you cannot break one jot or tittle from the law. So I'm where is he telling the Jews to break the law of Judaism? He's not telling that. He is not giving any indication for the Jews to break the laws of Judaism. He is telling them to obey. It is your understanding of the Bible. But Nowhere does the Bible say that. He did think that the Jews were not completely obeying the laws. They Correct. Had. I agree with you. They were not completely obeying because they did not believe in the fulfillment of the Messiah. Because the Jewish scripture says there is a Messiah to come. We Muslims, we believe in it. The Jews don't believe. So he was trying to explain to them, I am the Messiah. But that doesn't mean he was trying to break the laws of the Jews. He was trying to fulfill. Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. Simple. I am asking you, do you have pork, brother? I'm sorry? Do you have pork? Yeah, I um, occasionally. That means you're not a good Christian. You aren't a good Christian. Even occasionally you break one law or a title, you shall not go to Jannah. Not Quran says that. Bible says that. Even if you have poke and you break one law or a title, you shall not go to paradise. You shall not enter eternal life. And you said that you are a practicing Christian. You said you believe Jesus Christ is God. I don't believe Jesus is God, but I follow his teachings. I love him more than you. This is what Jesus said. It's from the heart. This is the explanation of your verse. It's from my heart. I love him. I love Jesus Christ. Peace be upon him. Do you? I don't think so. It is I theoretical, do. not I from do. your heart. Verbally, yes. No, I do, very strongly. So if you strongly believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, why are you disobeying him? Why? Why are you disobeying him? I don't, I didn't think, oh, I don't think I am disobeying him until now. But I'm quoting you from the Bible, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17. Think not, I have come to destroy okay. the law of the prophets. Okay. And I've given you a quotation from Leviticus chapter 11, verse 7 to 8. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse number 8. Book of Isaiah chapter 65, verse number 2 to 5. References. Okay, if that's the case, in the Old Testament it is said that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But what did Jesus Christ say? If somebody slaps you, show him the other side. Now, what is, is, isn't that like a defying of the law? No, it's not defying. I will give you what you're quoting is references from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 38. Okay. I will give the quotation. I don't, I don't want the quotation, I want the answer for my question. But first I'll give the quotation reference, then I'll give the answer, no? Fine, fine. I always give with proof. You believe without proof, you can do that. I'm a man of proof with references from okay. your scripture. Okay. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 38. It has been said of the old times that an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, whosoever takes a shirt, give him the cloak. Whoever walks with you one mile, walk with him twain. Whosoever offers you one cheek, offer him the other. That's it. It doesn't mean that he's going against it. But he's showing it has been said of the old times. But those two laws don't correspond. They are totally different. They're totally against each other. But those things, what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's time to get remedy. People misunderstood. They misunderstood the law. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, means they should be justice. That doesn't mean someone by mistake, a child is playing cricket, and if the ball hits the eye, that doesn't mean you break his eye. People misunderstood the message. He was correcting it. Same way how you misunderstood the message that Jesus said had folk. Where did he say have folk? It means that people misunderstood. They are following the law by the letter, not by the spirit. What you have to realize that it means that if by mistake someone is playing cricket and suppose the ball hits the eye, that doesn't mean that you have to take the eye of the boy. So you have to follow the law in the spirit. And you have to see the meaning of it. That's important. That's what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, tried to explain. I'm asking the question, will you follow Jesus Christ, peace be upon Lord today? If someone slaps you on one cheek, will you offer the other? There are many people waiting in the queue. Will you do that? I'm sorry? There are many people waiting in the queue. Okay. Will you follow Jesus' law? If someone slaps you, will you offer the other? No, will but that is wrong then. According to me, it is wrong. According to you, it is correct, now. You believe Jesus Christ is your God, peace be upon him. Yes. If someone slaps you, will you offer the other sheep and come on the stage here? We'll have many people slapping you. I didn't understand actually, it's Jesus, not clear. That verse of the Bible also says someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other. Yeah. 
Do you believe in that law? I do, yes. So if someone slaps you, will you offer the other cheek? Exactly. If I don't, that means I'm disobeying his laws. That's okay. it. Okay. Suppose if I tell that from today, everyone will come and hit you on your cheek. Maybe once or twice you'll offer. Will you offer always? Well, uh, that depends on my depth of the faith. I mean, if I'm a really strong believer, then I would definitely offer. Is any Christian worth the name born today who will keep on offering his cheek? I have not met anyone. Do you agree that 30,000 people here, 30,000 slaps, will you take? But believe me, there are really true believers who would. I am asking you, will you leave us as a will you? I don't know. That means you're not a believer. That's no, what we realize it is. I don't know Therefore, the what we realize that every prophet came and for remedy. Today, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has come. And he said, depending upon the situation, if it's by mistake, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth is wrong. If it's required, sometimes you can offer your cheek, but not always. If always, if you offer the cheek, where is justice? If that way someone kills you, you allow them to kill again? Is this justice? It's not justice at all. Depending upon the situation, you have to keep on changing. Therefore, I say that I believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, which match with the Quran. If it doesn't match with the Quran, what I say, it's an interpolation, it's a concoction, it's a fabrication. Because everything written in the Bible is not the word of God. According to scholars of Christianity, they say there are many interpolations in the Bible. There are many concoctions, there are many fabrications. According to Christian journals, they say there are 50,000 errors in the Bible. How many? 50,000. So therefore, I don't consider the Bible to be the word of God. There are many unscientific things mentioned in the Bible. If you read the book of Genesis, you know, I can give a lecture only on That's the okay. contradictions, on unscientific things. I don't consider what Do you consider the Bible to be the word of God? Yes. Okay. Now, do you know the book of Genesis, chapter number one? Yes. Verse number 16. It says, Almighty God created two lights. The greater light, the sun, to rule the day, the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. Bible says the light of the moon is its own light. Do you believe in that? The light of the moon is? Is its own light. Do you believe in that? No. That we don't believe in the Bible. <laughs> Bible says in the book of Genesis, chapter number 1, verse number 14, Almighty God, He created the earth on the third day, created the sun on the fourth day. That means the earth and vegetables came before and sun came later on. Do you know science, brother? I'm sorry? Do you, do you know science? Yes. The Bible says earth came first and then came sun. Is it correct? I don't know. No. Scientifically, is it correct? Uh, the earth came first and? Then the sun came. Earth came on the third day, sun came on the fourth day. Is it possible? We okay. know the sun is the parent body in the solar system. All the planets that revolve around the sun, they are the bodies from the sun. You know the Big Bang? Yes. So it is created simultaneously. But the Bible says earth on the third day, along with vegetables, sun on the fourth day. How can the vegetable survive without sunlight? Is if, it possible? If, if God can make it that way, why not? But do you believe in that? See, what God can do, but will God do something which is wrong? Illogical thing God will do. See, reasoning with God, I don't, I don't think it is in our scope. It is beyond our scope. It is not so. in your scope, but in the scope of human beings like me. God has to be logical. You can't be illogical. Then if you say illogical, then you believe every monkey, any stone, any tree is God. But, but what, brother, means... what our brothers in India do? Everything is God for them. And then you say, don't argue with God. Don't reason with God. So then you start worshipping the stone also. Brother, you can't be illogical. Seek the truth, the truth shall free you. Thank you. So hope you seek the truth, brother. Sure. I appreciate the patience of the uh, questioners. Should we have the next question from the sister? Good evening. My name is Mylene. I'm working in printing industry. Um, I really praise God for your life, Dr. Nike. And I truly believe that you are an army of God. And I feel so blessed to be here. Thank you. Yes, I'm a Mujahid. Yes. <laughs> Mujahid means soldier of God. I consider myself a soldier of God. And thank you, because I say I'm a mujahid. I'm a da'i and a servant of God, jazakallah. Sister, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, according to Jeremiah 29, 11, uh, for God knows the plan he has prepared for each and every one of us, plans to prosper us and not to harm us, 
plans to give us hope and a future. Uh, that's why uh, some of women, we believe that they have a gift of celibacy. Wherein, uh, you know, that nuns and some women, they're very happy unmarried. That's because they have a gift of celibacy. Now, Islam believes on that. And if not, what is the best motivational verse that you can give, which is based in Quran, for those women who is second, third, or fourth wife? Sister asked the question, quoting Jeremiah, she said that the future is with God and some women are blessed to be celibacy. That means they should not marry. And what do I have to say? And what does the Quran say about that? Sister, in Islam, there is no monasticism in Islam. You cannot renounce the world. Our beloved Prophet said that anyone who does not marry is not of me. According to me, it is compulsory to marry in Islam. The Prophet said anyone who does not marry is not of me. To marry is compulsory. Regarding those women who are blessed, you know, you are referring to the nuns, correct sister? Yes. Nuns, yes. Now if you see the statistics, if you see the statistics, of the priest, those who have given up the world, the fathers and the nuns. In England, the statistics say that more than 60%, more than 60% of the priest and the nuns, they involve in adultery. More than 60% even involved in homosexuality. So what is the celibacy you're talking about? Medically, it's not possible. Medically, it's not possible for a woman or a man to remain virgin throughout the life without indulging in illicit sex. It's not possible. Because sex hormones are being liberated, sister. It may look to the world that she is following celibacy. It's not possible. It's not possible. Because sex hormones are being liberated, sister. So therefore, if you see the statistics, that is the reason the Protestants, what they say, a priest can marry. It is the Catholics who say, that the nuns and the fathers cannot marry. But the pastors in Protestantism, they can marry. If you are a Catholic, they say that you should not marry. But in the Bible, nowhere does it say that you should not marry. Jesus Christ never said that you should lead a life of celibacy. That is the reason in Islam, marrying is compulsory. And the Prophet said, a person who does not marry is not of me. Hope that answers the question, sister. Yeah, thank you. And uh, one more. Uh, do you believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ? Sister, that was the question that, do I believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ? Yes, I believe. It's mentioned in the Bible, he'll come again. It's mentioned in the Quran also, he'll come again. But what is the reason that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, will come again? The reason is because, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 158, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised up Isa alayhi salam alive. Jesus Christ alive. The reason is, he was the only messenger whose followers as a whole mistook that he claimed divinity. All the other messengers, none of their followers as a whole misunderstood that the messenger was God. Because there was a misunderstanding in the followers, Almighty God raised him up alive. It's further mentioned in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 116. Jesus Christ, peace be upon rest to Almighty God. On that day I will come in the second coming. And I will bear witness. I never told them to worship me. But I said, Oh, Budullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. He will come in the second coming to testify to the Christian. He never told them that worship me. He never said that he was Almighty God. So he'll come in the second coming to testify to the Christian that this is a big mistake. Same thing is mentioned in the Bible, in the Gospel of John. On that day when people will come, Oh Lord, Oh Master, did we not do wonders and miracles in your name? So Jesus Christ will say, Amen, you depart from here. I don't even know you. So Jesus Christ will say, I don't know these people. You did miracles in my name, I don't even know you. So he never claimed he was God. Any second coming, he will clarify this misconception. That's the reason God kept him alive in the second coming, so that no one can say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, claimed divinity. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you. And one last question. Um, Makkah is the same as the Holy of Holies in the Bible? Makkah? Yes. Yes. There is mention of Makkah in the Bible. If you read in the book of Psalms, Chapter number 84, verse number 4 to 7, it says that blessed are those people who travel to the valley of Bakka. Now, Bakka is another name for Mecca, which is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 96. The first place for worship was Bakka. 
So Bakka is another name for Makkah, which is also mentioned in the Bible, that blessed are those people who travel to the valley of Bakka. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you very much. The sister. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Haya, and I just have one question for you tonight. Islam is a religion of peace and freedom of thought and freedom of speech. So why in the Quran does it say that if a Muslim who is born a Muslim should be punished by death if he chooses not to follow the religion anymore? Sister, you said the Quran says that a person who is born as a Muslim and he changes his religion, he is put to death. Sister, I don't know of any verse in the Quran. You point out in the Quran, there's no such verse in the Quran talking about that a person who is a Muslim and then who changes his faith, he should be put to death. But there are certain rulings. But if you go back to the history, the theory of the Prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know that when the Prophet went to Medina, there was one Sahaba who came and said that when the Prophet said, go and kill these kafirs, they're causing problems, they're the enemies. So one of the Sahaba said that, please forgive my brother. And the Prophet didn't kill him. And later on, that person accepted Islam. So it's not a general rule that any person who's a Muslim who becomes a murtad, he has to be put to death. The ruling is, if a person who is a Muslim, who becomes a murtad, who changes his faith and propagates against the religion of Islam, then the penalty is death. And this is in most of the countries. For example, if in the country of India, there's a citizen of India who shares the secret prints of the Indian army with the enemy. The Indian law will say he should be put to death or life imprisonment. This is the same law in America, same in UK for apostasy. The same law that is there that if you sell your some secret of the country, either death penalty or life imprisonment. So in Islam, it is not a normal ruling that a person who is a Muslim, when he becomes a non-Muslim, he should be put to death. Only if he propagates against Islam and conspires against Islam, then is the ruling of death, sister. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you so much. Yes, you did. The most welcome, Thank sister. You. The next question from the brother on my left. Ramadan Karim to everyone. My name is Peter. I work with al -Futim. My question, first question, I have a few questions to ask. Who is God? Brother has a question. Who is God? And this is the same question that was asked by the Christians to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was, what should I answer? You can keep on speaking about God. Then the revelation came. Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. Kul ho Allah ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid, walam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufana. There's nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Almighty God given in the Quran. Any candidate you say is Almighty God, if that candidate fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. The first is, Kul hu Allah ahad. Say it's Allah one and only. Number two, Allah hu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yulid, walam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufana. There's nothing like him. This is the four-line definition of Almighty God. Whoever you worship and say is God, if he fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that person as God. Hope that answers the question. Okay. If I do say God is a strength, for instance, I give an example just to explain to my point. If it's raining, just leave aside the scientific way of rain, how it comes. The rain, how it forms, and how it rains, and how it ends, can I just say that's God? Just leave aside the scientific way. Brother, I said that if I just say how it rains, leave off it scientific, if I say that is God, is it correct? No, it's not correct. It goes against the definition of God I gave you. What you can say, it is from God, min Allah, no problem. Okay. But you can't say that is God. Rain is not God. Is he one? No. Begets not. It contradicts most of the definition of Surah class. What you can say, it is from God. Min Allah, no problem. Hope that answers the question. Okay. We'll just allow some other non Muslims and we'll come back to you, brother. Shall we have the next question from the middle aisle? 
Morning, Mr. Nayak, and uh, my name is Soumya, and uh, working in the field of media for last two years over here. My question is related to media itself. That, uh, as been told by you, that uh, media has created a perception or a wrong uh, perception of Islam, and uh, as in uh, the people, they are believing that uh, Islam is blind uh, uh, due to this media. But uh, my question is that. Uh, right now, as in, uh, you can take an example of India, the uh, percentage of the literate people is more than the percentage, is very minimum as in the illiterate peoples. So no one is really forcing the literate peoples to follow that particular news of blah, blah, blah shit, but uh, they are believing that uh, what they are seeing on that particular media could you please uh, tell me that how media is making the people wrong perception of uh, Islam? Well, that's the question that how is media creating a wrong perception of Islam? Rather, I give a full talk. Full talk explaining the media is saying things which doesn't exist in Islam. And I've given the talk on media and Islam, war or peace. It's a full talk. And giving various strategies used by media. What does media do? Media picks up the black sheep of the Muslim community and they portray as though they're exemplary Muslims. What does media do? Media quotes verses of the Quran out of context. Media says things about Islam that don't exist in Islam. Media says women are subjugated. Where are they subjugated? I've given a full talk and speech on this topic. Media and Islam, war or peace. Please see that cassette and that was the talk I had given last time when I was called by the Dubai International Holy Quran Award. That was four years back. You can surely take the DVD and see it, inshallah. The next question from the sister side. Uh, my name is Florenda. I'm a Christian. And I have followed all your talks, and uh, I really admire um, listening to you regarding, you know, I mean, comparison between Christianity and Islam. It's my pleasure to ask you a question. Actually, um, a while ago, it was uh, asked regarding the judgment day or the second coming. Um, I believe that Christian and Muslim believe on that and uh, both religion are preparing on the judgment day. Um, I have a friend who is a Muslim and he always uh, told me that I'll be safe in Islam. Now I wanted to ask you, what's the difference between you know, um, preparation of Christian and the uh, Muslims to be safe in the second life and how you will encourage me to embrace Islam. Sister, the difference between a Muslim and a Christian preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and the day of judgment is, the Christian is waiting for Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as almighty God to come. We Muslims are waiting that he will come and clarify that he is not God. He will come and follow the commandments of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because Jesus Christ said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. So Jesus Christ said about the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if I have to help you, I will tell that follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Only if you believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, will you be safe on the day of judgment. So to help you, I would say, that besides believing in Almighty God, you have to believe that Jesus is a messenger of God, and you also have to believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of God, sister. Sister, do you believe that there is one God? Yes. Do you believe Jesus is God or is he a messenger? Messenger. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad is a messenger? Yes. So that means you are a Muslim, sister. <laughs> Would you like to say it in Arabic? Uh, yes. I'll just repeat the kalma in Arabic and you can repeat it. Ashadu. 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 Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abduhu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa rasuluhu. I bear witness. I bear witness. I bear witness, bear witness that, that there is no God, there is no God but, Allah, but Allah and I bear witness, and I bear witness that, that Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad is, is his messenger, his messenger and servant of God. 
and servant of God. And servant of God. MashaAllah. Jazakallah, sister. May Allah reward you. May Allah accept your efforts. And inshallah, inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he save you from the hellfire and may he grant you Jannah on the day of judgment, inshallah. Thank you. Sister. Should we have the next question from the brother again? In prayers, is it right to pray to God to ask him that I want to see you? The brother asked the question that is it right in prayers to ask God that I want to see you? If you say, I want to see you in the next life, it's acceptable. If you say, I want to see you in this life, it's not possible. Because there's a verse in the Quran, which is mentioned in Surah Taha, that Musa alayhi salam, the messenger of God, he said, I want to see God. So God said, look at the mountain. I will show my glimpse to the mountain. You look at the mountain, what happens? So the moment God showed a glimpse to the mountain, the mountain fell out of ruin, and Moses, peace be upon him, fainted. You cannot see God in this world. In this life, you cannot. But on the Day of Judgment, there are many things of the Prophet that in Jannah, we would love to see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, face of Almighty God. And that would be a pleasure for us. So if you pray that may you see Allah in the next life, in Jannah, inshallah, very good prayer. But you can't see Almighty God in this world. Hope that answers the question. The next question quickly from Inshallah, the we'll answer. just permit one more round from the non-Muslims. Yes, brother. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Zakir Naik. You're a big help. Um, I have one more question. I'm a bit confused between the two verses in Quran. Um, the first one is in Surah Baqarah 62, yeah, which says that if you believe in one God and believe in the last day and do good deeds, yeah, you shall have nothing to fear on the day of judgment yeah, and you will get your reward with your Lord. Yeah? Mind it, in this Surah, it doesn't say it, uh, that you have to believe in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the last messenger. And there is also another surah which supports this, which is the 22, in chapter number 22 and verse number 17, I think, in which it says a similar thing, that those who, do, who believe in one God, who believe in the last day and who do good deeds will be fine on the day of judgment. But then there is also one more verse in the Quran which says that whosoever amongst you comes to me without the religion of Islam, it shall not be accepted of him and he shall be among the losers. So... In that last verse, does Islam mean believing in one God and believing in Prophet Muhammad and believing in all the other rituals? Or because Islam means submission, so whoever has submitted, yeah, is submitted. So, you know, what's the meaning of Islam in the last verse? The brother asked a very good question. He's quoted a verse of the Quran of Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 62, that all those who believe in Allah and believe in the last day, irrespective of whether they are Jews or Christians or Sabians, they shall have no fear, and inshallah, they will have the reward. Similar thing is repeated in Surah Maida, chapter number five. So, brother is asking that here the world doesn't mention believing in Prophet. If you read the context of this revelation, brother, what happened? People came to the Prophet and said that we have been Jews, we have been Christians, we have been Sabians. Can God forgive us? In that context, the reply was given. As long as you believe in Allah and the last day, irrespectively previously, whether you're a Christian or a Jew or a Sabian, you will get the reward. It does not mean today a person who says he's a Christian and who believes Jesus is God, he will go to Jannah. No, it does not mean that. Not Jesus is God, believes in one God. Ah, believes in one God. But if they believe Jesus is God, then they won't go then to Jannah. That's fine. But my, fine. Concept, my point is, yes. believes in one true God. Correct. So he has to believe in one true God. And if he believes in true God, he also follows the commandment of God. Simple. Yeah, but maybe he's confused with that, yeah? So that means he's believed in a confused God. No, he, believe, he's, he believes in his creator, yeah? But he, he's not yet reached that level. So then if you ask me the question, a person who truly believes in God and a little bit confused from his heart and yet doesn't believe in Prophet Muhammad, will he go to heaven or hell? That's your question. My question is, he's clear that there is one God. Clear there's one God. He's confused in the Prophet. He does not do idol worship. He does, does not do that. He believes in one God and does good deeds and believes in the last day. Can he go to Jannah is your question? Yes. Fine. This answer, and I'll come to your last question also about that Islam is the only way of life. Other verses talk about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yeah. So if you truly believe, you have to believe in Prophet Muhammad. Yes. But if you ask me, no. Suppose I believe in God and if I die today. Yes. If you did good deeds, you believed in God. But I, ha no, I have two verses of the Quran supporting yeah. me. That you believe in one God, you do good deeds, and you believe in the last day, you shall have nothing to fear on that day. That's what I, I tell you. Yeah. Two verses, but the context of the verse is what? 
yeah, the context of the verse is when people came to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they wanted to accept Islam, that previously we were Jews, we were Christians, then the verse is said. The yeah. context is important. And coming back to your first question, mm -hmm. that Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in Nadina in the Law al Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is submitting our will to God. Submitting, yeah. Submitting will to God. So, uh, and Quran also says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 85, if anyone desires any other religion besides Islam, it will never be accepted of him. And mm -hmm. he shall be amongst the losers. Yes. So now submitting our will to God means, first you have to find out which is the true God. Yes. And when you find out, you have to come to Allah. Yes. You can't say, I believe in true God, but it's Jesus. I believe in no, true God. I believe, I believe in Allah. Huh. That's, so if you believe, believe in, in Allah, in God, yes. you have to follow what is the commandment of Allah. Now, when, when you believe in Allah, and if you don't come to commandment of Allah, that means it is not a true Allah. I believe Allah is not created by anyone. He is not born of anyone. He doesn't have kids. Uh, he, you know, correct. Kulhu Allahu ahad Allahu samalam yalud walam yulad walam. Mashallah. I believe in that. Mashallah. Yeah, but that's okay. that's where my state is. That's right. Yeah. But now, now that's not complete Islam. That's part of Islam. Yeah. Part of Islam. Yeah. Right. Even believing in Prophet alone will not take you to Jannah. You may believe in one God, believe in Prophet, but do bad deeds, you will not go to heaven. Fine? Yeah. So what you have to realize, if you believe that true God, when you know where you got those Kulwal Lawas, from where? From where you got this from Kulwal Lawas? I got it from the Quran. From the Quran. Yes. So from the Quran, you also get yeah, Surah Muhammad. That, that part Jabhaad. agrees with my brain. That part agrees with my brain. Yeah, the rest, I have questions. So, uh, what question you have asked me, I will try and... Right. <laughs> so on the Day of Judgment, I can tell you, I gave this brother, I tried to remove the misconception. Right, okay, I'll take... Uh, well, that's a little bit of a private question. I'll ask you through email. Okay, fine. One no problem. Question, the last question... So when you ask from email, yeah. when you get convinced, that time I'll ask you to believe in Prophet Muhammad also. Sure, sure. Okay. Fine? Yeah, my last question is, uh, we see uh, this uh, the, the style of uh, the Kalima, yeah, that La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah means there is no God but Allah. And Muhammad is a messenger of God, yeah? Now, Islam uh, has this distinct style. I have not seen this style in Christianity or Judaism, that kind of kalima. Do I don't know? I mean, is there, was there the same no. kind of kalima in no. those two religions as well? No. You know why? Yeah. Because it says there is no God but Allah. Yeah, and similar, Pro similar, uh, similar in those lines. I'll tell you. And Prophet Muhammad is a messenger and servant. So no one should worship Prophet Muhammad. Therefore, it's mentioned there. Fine? Yeah, Tomorrow so people should not start worshipping Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yes, yes. We love him, we respect him, we revere him, we are ready to die for him, but we don't worship him. I understand. So maybe in Christianity they could have something like, there is only one God, and, Jesus, and Father, Jesus, peace be upon Father, him. Father, Son and Holy Ghost. What? No, but I'm talking about what Jesus told, not what Christians are telling today. At every time of the Prophet, it was La ilaha illallah, that time Isa or Rasulullah, no problem. It was, it was that time? No, that is what people had to believe in. Not yes. in Arabic, in the language they spoke. No, what I'm saying is from your yes. study, from your yes. study, have you yes. found a kalima like that in, in what mm. Jesus would have not, said? Not in Arabic. Okay. At every time, that you had to believe in the Prophet to be a Muslim. Yeah. So at that time, you have to believe in one God, and you had to believe Jesus was the Prophet of God. At the time of Moses, you had to believe that there is no God but Allah, and Moses was the messenger of Allah. You had to believe in that. I understand, but did you see that reference? It in, is understood. In... There is no reference in the Quran. The because... Quran says they were messengers. It is understood. And if I don't believe in Jesus, now also I'm not a Muslim. Quran right. says you have to believe in each and every messenger today. Yeah. So believing that time was a must. Yeah. And today you have to believe in Musa salam, and Isa salam. You're asking the question, did you have to believe that time? Simple no, logic, I, yes. I know you have to believe at that time as well. Yes. What I'm saying is, why don't I see any, any, any kalima like that in today's Christianity or Judaism? Because today's Christianity has changed Christianity. How about Judaism? I it has changed. It has changed, brother. The so, so, they removed, so they removed the basic of, of the kalima? Of course, of course. Yeah. They have changed the messenger to God. Yeah. It is mentioned in the Bible today also that Jesus is not God. He never claimed divinity. He is yeah. a messenger of God. Yeah. That's what the teaching of the church is. Yes. Today's form is the changed form. How, how about Judaism? They still believe there is only one God. They don't regard Moses as God. So, did you see a kalima like uh, there is only one God and Mo Musa al Rasulullah or something? No, like but that? they believe that Musa al Salam was the messenger of God. They yeah. believed in that. Yeah, but At the same time, they even believe that you are the imposter. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So that's wrong. Yeah, yeah. If you believe Jesus the imposter, now billah, that is wrong. So, so you find some of the other mistakes here or there. Right. Therefore, Quran is the Furqan. Quran, Furqan yeah. means the criteria to judge right from wrong. So yeah. whatever matches with the Quran, we agree to the word of God. What is against the Quran contradicts, we say not the word of God. What doesn't contradict, 
and doesn't match ambiguous may be right may be wrong i understand your point sir what i'm saying is did you see any reference in probably in your study of judaism probably no. that the kalima of the, so no. even the kalima is gone i mean they no. don't even have that maybe I, in aramaic maybe it will be in aramaic or i don't know yeah. i don't know of any such right right was. right so i mean so 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 they were still believing in this thing that you have to believe in moses as messenger but yes. but there is nothing concrete like la ilaha illallah or you know like i don't know of any in the scripture right right okay right okay one well, my last question is um uh, third last fourth last this last yeah last of the last just last Recent, last of the last last of the last yes recently in india it was in the news that uh, same sex marriages got allowed yeah and and uh, on reading upon it yeah i found out that they said that it is at the genetic level of people genetic it's in the hormones yeah what they desire what they don't desire now i understand that islam is completely against this it doesn't allow this but what i'm saying is if someone's got that it at a genetic level yeah and it's his choice very good and, and he was he was he was born with that uh, with that kind of tendency and yet islam chooses to uh, to punish him on something on something that he was born with i agree with you so god it should it sounds illogical yeah so god right. god made him like that and uh, god is punishing him for that as well brother asked a question that recently in india homosexuality has been permitted not permitted but the law says it's not a big crime that was there in the indian constitution yes. they have softened it not permitted yet yes, yes. it is a court case that took place in delhi it's not a law yet yes. there's a who and cry yet there are many organizations fighting against it so no law it's a law in canada in yes. usa in uk not in india yet right okay yeah. and today there are some scientific research that say that homosexuality is genetic yes yes so brother asked the question if homosexuality is genetic then who's to blame how can you consider it to be a sin very good question yes this research was done earlier a few years back and later on what was found out that this is totally false right. and the person who propounded this himself was homosexual right okay so there's no scientific proof yet it's an assumption right science doesn't testify yet that homosexuality is genetic right in fact quran says in surah araf chapter number 7 verse number 81 which says that do you have lust for men more in preference to women to homosexuality yes. talking about come lut yes it is prohibited in the bible also talking about lut alayhi salam yes also in the quran it is prohibited yes homosexuality is prohibited completely right it is a assumption that it's genetic it's not genetic at all how does it happen i'll tell you yeah the psychology they tell us that once you overdo a thing you start losing the pleasure right so what god has permitted the normal sexual way of life you start overdoing it you start doing unnatural things right what god has permitted natural things you do unnatural you start doing from the river side so once you get fed up of doing it so often that the reason scientific research says a person who has no extra marital affairs enjoys the sexual life with his wife and husband the maximum yeah but this tendency is found in small children i mean you know I'm telling you. yeah so i mean they have not got married yet or let tasted me, it let me complete yeah yeah we'll come to children later on for them talking about the adults yes <laughs> how it comes in children i'll tell you it okay so what happens is once you start overdoing it you want to enjoy more so that thing what is normal doesn't excite you any longer then you start doing unnatural things it's not genetic right. talking about children yeah. how it comes in children it doesn't just come out from birth it's not from birth yeah. because they watch pornographic movies right they watch blue films it's haram the parents the way they behave in front of the children all this has a psychologic impact on the child right don't tell a person who's born then he starts becoming homosexual it's not like that at all it's right. a misconception right scientific research doesn't say that right 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 okay. it is because of the over exposure now children watch the blue films yeah the channels free to air you know there are yeah. more pornography channels than other channels yeah very good money so because of the media that's how when they see on the channel they start emulating and that's how they divert right. who's to blame the channel right why right. did the parent allow them right okay so they will be responsible for that right okay okay and that that answers me that's fine uh one thing you said was that Brother, god god has to be last of the last question yeah, yeah god has to be logical you said yeah so why did no, he god choose god has to be logical god is logical god is logical okay so why did he choose uh, 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 taking into account islam is a correct religion why did he choose to bring you into this world in islam and so many others in a different religion so so very that good. means he's being partial from the birth very good very good question let us ask the question that 
Some people are born in Muslim family. And a person born in Muslim family, chances, Muslim. Born in non-Muslim family, non-Muslim. So why is God impartial? Maybe if you were born in a Muslim family, you would have been a Muslim. Yes. Correct? Yes, yes. Very That's good how question. it usually goes. Very good question. The criteria to go to Jannah is not to be born in a Muslim family. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, every child is born in Deen al-Fitr. He's born as a Muslim. Yes. He submits civil to God. Later on, he's been influenced by his parents, by his elders, by his teachers. Then he starts doing idol worship, fire worship. He converts. Therefore, when a non-Muslim becomes the Muslim, the more appropriate word is revert rather than convert. He yes. comes back to the original faith. Yeah. Now, the criteria to go to Jannah is not to be born in a Muslim family. Sure. The criteria to go to Jannah is Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, which says, Wal as innal insan al illa amanu wa amilu salihati wa bil haqq wa bil sab. That by the token of time, man is very in a state of loss, except those who have faith. Those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. The criteria go to Jannah is all four things. Iman, righteous deeds, exhorting people to truth, exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If a person is born in a Muslim family, the first criteria are the chances are more. Yes. Not the remaining three. Yes. Fine? Now you, you may be born in a righteous family, but not having Iman. I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, why was he born in a Christian family or a Hindu family? You know, he should be born. Brother, I mean, it's more likely that he gets the other things easily. There are four things to go to Jannah. If a person is born in a Muslim family, but does not have righteous deeds, does not do dawa, he'll go to hell. Yeah, okay. He will not go to heaven. Yeah, Only by having a name, Zakir, Muhammad, Abdullah, Sultan, will not take you to heaven. Even practice is important. You may be born in a family which has righteous deeds but may not be having Iman. So everyone has different combination. But Almighty God says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 53, Sanuri imayati na fil afakhi wa fi anfusim hatta yatabayyana anna ulhaq. Soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizons and into their soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth. So Allah takes it upon himself that to every human being he'll put in his heart directly that this is the truth. Like how God sent me to put it directly into your heart here. Yeah. Correct? So, no, now, but, so you now, mean to wait, say there wait, is no wait, advantages? Wait, wait. Yeah. No, no, there are advantages and advantages. So it's a big advantage. You got everything very easy. But for a person who's in a different religion, it's, it's a comp he doesn't even come Brother, to know about you it got sometimes. so easy. Yeah. In three hours, you got it directly. Very easy. Right yeah. or wrong? I you don't think it to be easy. Yes. See how you take it. I'm saying how lucky you are compared to the other non-Muslims. You attended my talk. Yes. Yet you're not accepting it. Who's to blame? You are God. Yes. You. Yeah, but there are not things. Me. There are things. <laughs> there are a lot no, of things. Religion no, no, is a no, big no. thing. One not big to. thing. You want to make it big, you make it big. You want to make it important, it's important. Yeah. The problem is that Almighty God puts in every human being directly. Not always to Dr. Zakir Nai. Yeah. I am only 0.00001%. Yeah. It's not me. Some through me, some through others, some directly. So on the day of judgment, you cannot complain to God. Leave other, at least you cannot complain. Yeah. You cannot go and tell God, I didn't know about Islam. Yeah, I cannot. Yeah, you I cannot. cannot. Yeah, I cannot. Because you know, you may be having more knowledge of Islam than many Muslims born in Muslim families. Yeah, because the way you're quoting Quran, the yeah. way you're asking me question, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. So now, after reading so much about Islam, mm -hmm. and yet if you don't accept, Allah will question you. Yeah. You have no excuse whatsoever. The other non-Muslim will deal with them afterwards. Yeah. Let's talk about you first. Yes. Yeah, so you I have no question at all yes. on the day of judgment. I have. I, I can say there, there were a few things which I was, I did not get the right answers no, to. No, there are many Muslims who are born in Muslim family, not few, have many questions which are not answered. Yes. You have few, they have many. So you are in a better position. You cannot complain to God. I you have say, few uh, questions not answered. I would, the give God, I would give God that these are the basis because they did not get answered. That's why I did not accept it. If I don't accept it, maybe which, I will later. I don't know. Which question think. you don't have, tell me now. <laughs> tell me now, come on. <laughs> You can tell God, Dr. Zakir Naik asked you in front of 20, 30,000 people, what question you don't know about the well, Quran? Come on. First of all, I, the answer that you gave, that it, was, it is because of media and blue films, I know I know small, small kids who don't even have access to that and still they have do, that, those Which tendencies. kids? Name them. What nonsense are you talking? They, I'm a medical doctor. What do you know? I have seen, are you a medical doctor? I have seen it. Are you a medical doctor? Well, let me tell you. I, I have I'm seen asking, my, are you a medical doctor? Yes I'm or no? I'm not. I'm Fine. an engineer. I'm a medical doctor. Fine. Okay. Now you are telling a doctor you have seen. If I tell you that I have seen a building made of paper, you know, come in Bombay. I have seen a building, the pillars were made of paper. Will you believe in it? 
I won't, I have not seen it. Not finished. Yeah. See, this is the first Allu Ahli Zikri in Gundula Talamud. As the person who knows. No, mm. I have seen, you have seen, does it carry weight? Yeah, yeah. I have seen a building made of paper. Will you believe? Yeah, no, but I, your point is that it's only because of media. But I know... I no, know point so is it is not genetic. There is no scientific proof at all it is genetic. I'm telling you. Right, right. What I'm telling you, it can be one of the reasons. Yeah. What is, there can be 20 other reasons. Right, one of right. the reasons can be media. Yeah. You tell me it can't be media, I'll disprove you. Right, right, right. One of the reasons can be media. Right. Fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good. Actually, I have to Actually. go through all the other questions. Very I well, have go through. And I will need some time. And then Take maybe your time, I will do it. But, but, yeah. hope it's not too late. I don't know how long I'm going to live. But see, if I die I in the state of getting more knowledge, yeah, then I can always tell God that I was, no, just, no, I was just getting more and more knowledge. You cannot. You cannot. I'm That's telling you, you cannot. Can. You cannot. I will give Shahid on the day of judgment. I give you a chance. You cannot. See, I don't know I'm going to live tomorrow or not. See, 90% of my questions are answered. But I have to go through more things. People accept Islam with 10% acceptance. So that girl. According to me, you have more knowledge than all the people who accepted Islam. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Maybe that's true. But my principle is, unless I'm 100% right. clear, I will, I will no. not take such a big step. I will only take that big step if Brother, I'm 100% clear. many things you did in life without knowing 100%. Did you know how much you're going to earn in Dubai that you came here 100%? Yeah, See, that way I'm ready to say the, the, the thing. But, but the thing is, I've but seen some thing. Muslims who say that if, if you have an iota of doubt, then you're not a Muslim. So who said that? Who said that? They say if you have... If are you, you going to follow the Quran or are you going to say some Muslim? Forget about Muslims. No, you, you want to, to judge? You have, you have to believe it in 100%. If you if you, even if you have 99% faith. Who said that? Who said that? Does the Quran say that? It doesn't say that. You follow Quran, don't follow the other Muslims. Don't follow me, also follow Quran. So if I tell you, if I tell you that I believe that Prophet Muhammad was a prophet of God 90% and 10% I have doubts, am I, am I a Muslim? See, you, you tell no, me that. do you believe in messenger or not a God? I other doubts are separate. I believe in one God and I believe in his messengers. 90%. I, I believe in his, yes, 90%. I have, Which 10% you don't believe? Tell me now, I'll clarify I, I that. I can't recall those questions now. Why? No, yeah, so you I can't recall? This is escapism. No, not really. I am not, I am true to I am, my heart I am not, not escaping. I am not asking you to accept Islam. I am not asking you. I know. I am only telling you, if God forbid something happens to you before you accept Islam, you will not be forgiven. I am only telling you See, an advice. I am not being prejudiced here. I am being too... Take I'm your not. time. Take your time. When you need me, you can call me on the email. Sure. Zakir at irf.net. My pleasure to reply to you, brother. How do you spell irf? I-R-F.net. Uh, uh. IRF.net. Okay. It's a short form for Islamic Research Foundation. Right, okay. Yes, or you can watch me on Peace TV. Sure. Inshallah. All right, okay. Thank you so much. See you yes, next sir. time. Inshallah. The next question from the sister. Uh, hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Priya. I work in Dubai and I have a question. It's about a myth that I heard from a few friends about uh, Islam. Uh, it's about marriage, basically. Uh, is it true? that a Muslim can only marry a girl younger? Sister asked the question that, is it true that a Muslim can only marry a girl who's younger? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when first time he married, he was at the age of 25, and his first wife, Khatija, may Allah be peace with her, she was 40 years old. 15 years elder to him. So there's no such statement that you can marry a girl who's younger. You have to marry a girl who's virtuous. The Prophet said, when you look for a life partner, you look for four things. Beauty, wealth, nobility, and virtue. The best is virtue. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw virtue in Khatija, may Allah be pleased with her, and he married her. So best is virtue, sister. Okay, thanks, that's all. You're most welcome. Yes, brother. Good morning. First of all, let me congratulate you on having such a eventful and good uh, event here. It was very enlightening. Uh, now let me put forward my question. Now we have seen some interesting debates, some very uh, curious arguments in favor of a religion against another religion. What we're doing is a comparative study in religions. A very logical question. Our goal is not to continue compare religions or say one is better than the other. Our goal is a better uh, society, a better life, a better world, a peaceful world with more compassion and harmony. What is the logical conclusion of this all? Are we saying that till everybody in the world is not Muslim, we are not going to have a continuum and equilibrium? Or till everybody is not going to be Christian, we are not going to Because until unless everybody is one, this argument is going to continue. What is our goal? What are we heading to? 
brother asked the question that we had good arguments, good debates. What is the ultimatum? Do you want to make everyone Muslims? Do you want to make everyone Christians? What is ultimate? Ultimate is to search for peace. Through? Through? Through the Creator Almighty God. The path? The path because, is... Because there is only one path. One path is submitting a will to God. And that is only one path which we know what it is. Yes, yeah, submitting so, a will to God. Yeah, so there has to be only one conclusion. One conclusion, correct. In so, the so, in the so, Lail Islam. So, so the logical end to this is the entire world becomes a Muslim. Not logical end to it. The thing is there that if those who get the truth, those who Allah gives hidayah, they'll become Muslim. Our job is to deliver the message. The Quran mentions in Surah Ghashiyah, chapter number 88, verse number 21, 22, Allah says to the messenger, Fazakir in Your job is to deliver the message. Changing hearts, you are not the manager of affairs. Lasta bi musaitir, you are not the manager of affairs. It is Almighty God. So what are we doing? We are delivering the message. I agree. Changing hearts in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in our hand. I agree. What we are doing, are we getting peace or not? The thing to be noted is, when people say this is the best religion, and if someone else says this is the best, there is comparative study. And logically we can find which is the best. But we cannot continue to compare till the end of the world. There has not to be Not till the end, end of the world, till the end of my life. Oh. Till the end of your life. We are here to deliver the message. It is nothing about conversion. We deliver the message, you like it, you accept it, we can't force anyone. No, I'm not saying you about, tell me one I'm thing, irrespective, irrespective of the non-Muslims. You know, majority non-Muslim didn't accept Islam, correct? Yeah. But did they benefit or not? They certainly will. They benefit, that's sufficient. Some people get 10 points, some people 20, some people 100. I maybe agree, maybe agree. seven, eight people got 100 points benefit. Mr. Jack, Other people got 10 points. I am satisfied even if you get one point benefit. Mr. Whether Jack, did you benefit or not from this lecture? I did, I certainly Finish. did. You benefited, I'm happy. Oh, I'm happy I'm too. not asking you to accept Islam. No, no, no. That's if you benefited, so. I'm happy. I benefited, you benefit, I benefit. I benefited. Finish. I thank you a lot. I mean, that was, and especially this open forum question answer session was very enlightening. It basically. And very proved... few people allow such open question answer. Exactly. Have you seen any I mean, Christian? Brother, no. you're a Christian, correct? I'm not a Christian. So what are you? Uh, I'm a Brahmin. Brahmin. Have you seen any Hindu in India having such live open sessions? No, no, no. I mean, I, I, I watched your uh, debate with, with Ravi Shankar and I saw how it happened. I and know. I, and what happened to him? And I, what happened to him? And I also know Pope Benedict refused to uh, uh, talk with you on that Quran issue. Now, uh, thank you. Now, what I mean to say is that we are not saying that people should convert to our religion or your religion. We are not saying that. We are open people. We are people on a, a much higher intellectual level. What I am saying is that how is the world going to be for generations to come? Um, what, should, what should we pray? It's not what should we do. See, what we do is in our... What we should pray? We should pray to Almighty God. What we should do? We should follow His commandments. We should try to find out the truth. And whichever level, you may find 10%, somebody 20%, we have to give the message. So our duty and is to continue giving the message without thinking what the result is going to be. Not without thinking. Without we are giving the message. And we want the people to follow the true message. Whether they accept or not, I'm not bothered. I cannot force anyone. I cannot compel anyone. Fine? Yep. But while giving the message, some people are convinced 10%, some 20%, some 100%. Whatever it is, if I make a difference, I'm happy. Some people may not like it also. That see, Zakir is quoting, they may not like it. So I'm trying my level best to speak the truth and deliver the message. Am I talking about killing anyone here? No. Am I talking about touching anyone? No. So if I'm talking about Mr. humanity, based on our Creator Almighty God, then what's the problem? Mr. Jakir, I understand. Have I told that you should kill the Hindus? No. I Have understand. I told you should kill the Christians? I understand your point. If, allow someone, me, allow if me. someone in comparative religion tries to bring animosity, that is wrong. talking about violence that is wrong. in other religion, that is wrong. But we are not doing it. And Very good. Us, good. Yes. And let us not talk about people who are doing it. Let us talk about people like you and me, who are not doing all that, Very good. who are only benefiting people by telling them the truth, not forcing them to believe into anything, right? Me and you together. Very good. But if that continues, the division remains. There's no division. The what division, is the division? The division. Brother, I love you, brother. I love you too. But uh, finish. So where's the division? No, I, I, I love all of you. The Christians will still keep preaching. The Judaism let, will still keep preaching. Let them preach. Keep preaching. But there is division still, isn't it? Brother, someone, what do you have I to want, realize? I want to see a, a world with 
with with complete uh, compassion and humanity without no divisions so with, do you think there's no compassion in me uh, there's a lot of compassion in you do you think there's no humanity in me a lot of it so why are you looking at me from the other side no i'm not looking at you i'm asking you a question i'm not looking at you i'm basically i'm looking at pope benedict who refused to talk to you so I'm tell pope benedict tell that to pope benedict i am dr zakir naik just a student of islam and comparative religion i have come here to spread the truth and i'll continue to spread the truth because that's my message because allah says in the quran in surah fusila chapter 41 verse number 33 waman ahsanu qala mimman da'a ila allah wa amila salihan qala inna lil muslimin who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of the lord works righteous and says a muslim that the reason i changed from a doctor of body to a doctor of a soul wa akhir da'wan alhamdulillah rabbil alamin we request all of you to please i would please request that those brothers who have accepted islam if they can come on the stage i request uh, mr ibrahim bumala to come on the stage and mr khairuddin sarjo like to say some we request all the audience please remain seated بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين نحن سعيدون في هذه الليلة المباركة من ليالي شهر رمضان المبارك بأن نستمع إلى الدكتور ذاكر نايق في هذه المحاضرة وهذه المناقشة الهادفة سواء للمسلمين أو لغير المسلمين من الحاضرين ونحن سعيدون أكثر بأن يسلم في هذه الليلة هذا العدد المتميز من الإخوة والأخوات غير المسلمات وندعو الله سبحانه وتعالى لهم بالتوفيق وأن تكون لهم حياة سعيدة في ظل الإيمان وفي ظل الدين الإسلامي الحنيف بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم دادي الدنيم of الله سبحانه وتعالى most merciful We are very happy here in Dubai International Holy Quran Award to listen from Dr. Zakir Naik his lecture and speeches and we are more happy with those people who got converted to Islam from men and women may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lead all of us to his best way ونبارك للأخوة والأخوات هذه الخطوة الجميلة والطيبة في إسلامهم في هذه الليلة. And again we congratulate all of those brothers and sisters who became Muslim from this night and الحمد لله رب العالمين. ونعتبر هذه ثمرة طيبة من ثمار جائزة دبي الدولية للقرآن الكريم. وندعو الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يجعل الإسلام أجر إسلام هؤلاء في ميزان حسنات صاحب السمو الشيخ محمد بن راشد آل مكتوم راعي ومؤسس هذه الجائزة. And we count those as fruits of the Dubai International Holy Quran Award activities and may Allah سبحانه وتعالى accept this in page of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. Vice President of UAE and ruler of Dubai who assisted this organization, Dubai International Holy Quran Award, 13 years back. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. On behalf of Dubai International Holy Quran Awards and the organizing committee of these lectures. First, we would like to thank Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for helping us in conducting this program successfully. We are very grateful to His Highness Sheikh Muhammad bin Rashid Al Maktoum and the Dubai Holy Quran Award for inviting Dr. Zakir Naik again to Dubai. Thank you for all of your presence. We conclude this session with the greetings of peace and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Peace TV, the solution for humanity. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa ba'd. Before we begin with the final speech of tonight's event, I would like to invite Dr. Zakir Naik from India. A brief background about Dr. Zakir Naik. Dr. Zakir is a medical doctor by professional training. Dr. Zakir Naik is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir Naik is the president of the Islamic Research Foundation based in Mumbai. Dr. Zakir clarifies viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. Throughout the last 13 years, Dr. Zakir Naik has delivered more than 1,300 public talks in the USA, Canada, the UK, Italy, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, Egypt, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Botswana, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Guyana, Trinidad, and many other countries, in addition to numerous public talks in India. He has successfully participated in several symposia and dialogues with prominent personalities of other faiths. His public dialogue with Dr. William Campbell of the USA on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science, held in Chicago, USA in April 2000, was a resounding success. His interfaith dialogue with prominent Hindu guru Sri Sri Ravi Shankar on the topic, the concept of God in Hinduism and Islam in the light of the sacred scriptures, held at palace grounds in Bangalore on the 21st of January 2006, was highly appreciated by people of both faiths. In the issue, Dated 22nd of February 2009 on the Indian Express list of the 100 most powerful Indians in 2009, amongst the billion plus population of India, Dr. Zakir Naik was ranked number 82. In the special list of the top 10 spiritual gurus of India, Dr. Zakir Naik was ranked number 3 after Baba Ramdev and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar being the only Muslim in the list. The Sunday Express, dated the 31st of January 2010, published the Indian Express list of the 100 most powerful Indians in 2010, and amongst the billion plus population of India, with 36 names from the 2009 list deleted, wherein Dr. Zakir Naik was ranked number 89. From amongst the eight Muslims in this list of 100, Dr. Zakir Naik was the only Muslim Islamic preacher and orator. The others being a political secretary, a politician, a government official, a business magnate, and three film personalities. Amongst the spiritual and religious gurus, though he was the only Muslim and number three in 2009 list, this year, 2010, Dr. Zakir Naik topped the list of spiritual and religious gurus for his preaching of Islam. Followed by Jagi Vasudev at number 94, Baba Ramdev at 99, and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar at number 100, respectively. Dr. Zakir Naik was recently also selected and listed in the 500 most influential Muslims in the world without any specific ranking, published by the George Washington University in the USA. Our dear Sheikh Ahmed Didat, Rahimahullah, the world famous orator on Islam and comparative religion, called Dr. Zakir Naik Didat Plus in the year 1994. He presented a plaque 
in May 2000 with the engraving awarded to Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik for his achievement in the field of da'wah and the study of comparative religion. Son, what you have done in four years has taken me 40 years to accomplish. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Dr. Zakir Naik appears regularly on many international TV channels in more than 200 countries throughout the world. He is regularly invited for TV and radio interviews. More than a hundred of his talks, dialogues, debates and symposia are available on DVDs and VCDs. He has also been the author of many books on Islam and comparative religion. So we are indeed blessed to have the opportunity to have with us Dr. Zakir Naik, who will be uh, not addressing any specific subject, but rather we have a special program entitled Ask Dr. Zakir Naik, where you, the audience, have the whole time to be able to question this great speaker on Islamic topics. So I would like to invite to share the stage our dear brother, Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik from India. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma abad. Auzu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Udu ila sabili rabbika bilikma. Wal maazit al-hasna. Vajadun millati ahasan. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa yassilli amri. Wa halul ugdatam al lisani yafqa wakawli. My respected elders and my brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Alhamdulillah, it's a pleasure and honor for me to address the people of Dubai once again in a short span of only seven months. And as many of you may be aware, that in the month of Ramadan, about seven months back, in August 2009, I was invited for the program of the Dubai International Holy Quran Award under the patronage of Sheikh Muhammad bin Ashid al-Maktoum. And I had given two talks. The first talk I gave was on dawah or destruction. And the second talk was on the topic of misconceptions about Islam. And I gave a speech of approximately one and a half hour, which was followed by question and session for about four hours. The program started at 10 o'clock, and we were forced to end at 3.30, because the Sahar time, the Sahri during month of Ramadan was just approaching. So I spoke for five and a half hours. It was one of my longest program in any part of the world. But due to the length of the program, I had to cut short my speech of misconception about Islam, where I said that there are 20 most common questions. And I was only able to give the reply to 13 most common misconceptions. Alhamdulillah, it's a pleasure and honor for me to be invited for the Dubai International Peace Convention and to speak in the final concluding session. So I've decided that before having the open question or session, I'll just complete the replies to the seven pending questions amongst the most common questions. And as I'd mentioned earlier in my speech, that dawah is a duty of every Muslim. It's compulsory for every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. There are various different styles as well as strategies in conveying the message of Islam. Some of them are less effective, while the others are more effective. The most common methodology used by the Muslims when they speak with non-Muslims is that they say a hundred good things about Islam. Even if that non-Muslim agrees with these 
hundred good points you have mentioned about Islam, yet at the back of his mind, he will start thinking, oh, you are the same Muslim who is a fundamentalist. Ah, you are the same Muslims who are terrorists. Ah, you are the people who have more than one wife. Ah, you are the people who have spread your religion with the sword. These few negative points at the back of their mind will prevent them from accepting the beauty of Islam. So whenever I meet a non-Muslim, the first thing I ask him up front is, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? With your limited knowledge, whether right or wrong, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And I make him comfortable that he can ask any question on Islam, he can feel free, he can criticize Islam, he can attack the Quran if he wants. I make him comfortable and ask him, what does he feel is wrong with Islam? And after he's made comfortable, that non-Muslim, he poses about three or four questions. And in the experience that I have for the past couple of decades, I have come to know that the non-Muslims, they have about 20 most common questions about Islam. So when he poses three or four questions, invariably it falls amongst these 20 most common questions. These common questions, how do they come in the mind of the non-Muslim? Depending how the media portrays Islam, these questions, they arise in the mind of the non-Muslim. And today we know in the international media, whether it be the newspapers, the international magazines, the radio broadcast stations, the satellite television channels, we find there is virulent propaganda about Islam. We find that the media is spreading misconceptions about Islam. And depending on how they portray Islam, these 20 common questions arise in the minds of the non-Muslims. The 20 questions we have today, a couple of decades earlier, they were different. Maybe a couple of decades later, they will change. If every Muslim knows the replies with reason, logic, and science, quoting the scriptures of Islam and the other religions, and are able to know the replies to all these common questions, even if he cannot convert or change the non-Muslim's faith, at least he can neutralize the animosity which is there in the minds of the non-Muslims. And as I mentioned earlier, I've written a book that replies to the common question asked by non-Muslims. And it's available on the internet too, on www.irf.net. And seven months back, when I was in Dubai, I was only able to cover the replies of the first 13 most common questions or misconceptions that are posed by the non-Muslims regarding Islam. For those who are not there, I'll just mention the question without giving the reply, and I'll give the reply only to the last seven, inshallah. Today, the most common misconception regarding Islam in the minds of the non-Muslim is regarding the word jihad. The number two misconception is that the non-Muslims think that the Muslims, they are fundamentalist. The third misconception is that Muslims are terrorists. The fourth misconception is that Islam is a religion which was spread by the sword. The fifth most common question is that why does Islam allow a man to marry more than one woman? Why is polygamy or polygyny allowed in Islam? The sixth most common question is that if Islam allows a man to have more than one wife, then why does not Islam allow a woman to have more than one husband? The seventh most common question is that why are women in Islam degraded or subjugated by keeping them in hijab? The eighth most common question asked by the non-Muslim is that why does Islam permit a Muslim to have non-veg food? The ninth misconception about Islam is that why do Muslims, even if they have non-veg, why do they slaughter the animals so mercilessly? They do zabiha and they kill the animal with pain and torture. If they want to kill, why don't they kill by jhatka or just by stunning 
it's more merciful. The tenth misconception about Islam is that today's scientific research says that whatever you eat, it has an effect on your behavior. So the Muslims, they eat animals and they behave like animals. The eleventh misconception, most common misconception about Islam in the minds of the non-Muslim is that if Islam is against idol worship, then why do the Muslims, they bow down to the Kaaba in their Salah? The Muslims, they are the biggest idol worshippers in the world. The twelfth most common question is that if Islam is a universal religion, then why doesn't Islam permit a non-Muslim to enter into the two holy cities, that is Mecca and Medina? And the thirteenth most common question which I replied to last time was, why Islam does not permit a Muslim to have pork? And in a span of one and a half hours, I was only able to complete the replies to 13 most common questions or misconceptions about Islam. Inshallah, in the next 45 minutes, I will try and give the replies to the balance seven most common questions or misconceptions about Islam. The 14th amongst the most common questions asked by the non-Muslim is that why does Islam prohibit a Muslim to drink alcohol? Why are intoxicants prohibited for the Muslims? Why is alcohol prohibited? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyu al amanu, O you believe, inna mal khamru al most certainly intoxicants and gambling. Wal anzabu al azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishthum minamili shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. Fashtanibu lalukum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. This verse of the Quran from Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90 says that intoxicants, and gambling, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, all these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. So based on this verse of the Quran, the Muslims as a whole, they abstain from drinking alcohol. The same message is also repeated in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number one, which says that wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever has it is deceived. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 18, that do not be drunk with wine. So if you read the Bible, and if you believe in the Bible, even the Christians, according to the commandments of the Bible, they are supposed to abstain from drinking alcohol. The same message is even repeated in the Hindu scriptures. Alcohol has been prohibited in the Hindu scriptures in several places. In Manu Smriti, chapter number 9, verse number 225, and is prohibited in several places, even in the Vedas. Let's try and understand the logical reasons why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, prohibited the Muslims from having alcohol. Today, science tells us that every human being, he has an inhibitory center. This inhibitory center, it inhibits a human being from doing things which are wrong. For example, the human beings know that using abusive language is incorrect. Especially when we speak to elders or to our parents. If we have to go for the call of nature, we will not do it in the public. We will go to the restroom. Our inhibitory center prevents us from doing it in public because we know it is wrong. But when a person is intoxicated, his inhibitory center is inhibited. That is the reason we see that a person who is intoxicated, he uses abusive language. He even abuses the elders and many a time even his parents. Because his inhibitory center is inhibited, we find many a time that those who are intoxicated, they urinate in their own clothes. They do it in public. We find many a time that these people who are intoxicated, they can't even walk properly. They can't even talk properly. They can't behave properly because the inhibitory center is inhibited. Furthermore, today's scientific research tells us 
that when a person is intoxicated, he does many things which are prohibited. According to the statistics of the FBI report of the year 1990, in the Department of Justice, Criminal Victimization Survey Bureau of US, it says that in the year 1990, on average, 1,756 rapes took place on average every day. And the report said that the majority, more than 50% of the rapes that were committed were committed when the person was intoxicated. Today, research tells us that in America, approximately 8% of the Americans, they do incest. Incest means having sexual relationship, mother with son, daughter with father, brother with sister, having sexual relationship with the close relatives. 8%, every 12th or 13th American you meet, according to statistics it says, he has committed incest. And the survey says, majority of them, either one or both of them, they were in a state of intoxication. Today's scientific research says, one of the major associated cause of the most dreaded disease today, AIDS, is alcohol. But normally when we meet many people who have alcohol, they say, I'm only a social drinker. My father is only a social drinker. Social drinker means person has only one or two pegs. So I can control myself. I don't get intoxicated. When you meet any alcoholic and you ask the background, no alcoholic ever has started drinking alcohol to become alcoholic. He starts as a social drinker. And later on, he becomes alcoholic. I challenge to show me a single social drinker who has been drinking for several years and has never got intoxicated at least once in his lifetime. Even if you find, if you ask a social drinker, if you do a survey, even if he's for a couple of years a social drinker, sometime or the other, he may have got intoxicated. And even if a person gets intoxicated once in his lifetime, and if he commits a crime of rape or incest, imagine, after he regains his consciousness, the damage cannot be undone. Neither to the victim, neither to the person who has done it. It's an irreparable loss. Imagine if in the state of intoxication, the person has committed rape or committed incest, the person cannot forgive himself. That's the reason our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in the Sahih Hadith of Sunnah ibn Majah, volume number four, in the book of intoxications, book number 30, Hadith number 3371. The beloved Prophet said that alcohol is the key of all evils. It is the most shameless evil. Our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sunnah ibn Majah, volume number four, in the book of intoxication, book number 30, Hadith number 3,392, our beloved Prophet said that anything which intoxicates you in large quantity is even prohibited in small quantity. No excuse for a nip or a tot. Our beloved Prophet also said, it's mentioned in Sunnah ibn Majah, volume number four, in the book of intoxication, book number 30, hadith number 3,380, our beloved Prophet said, that all 10 categories of people who deal with alcohol are cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person who distills alcohol, the person who has it distilled by someone, the person who distills for someone, the person who drinks it, the person who transports it, the person for whom it is transported, the person who serves it, the person who sells it, the person who utilizes the money of the sale of alcohol, the person who buys it, the person who buys it for someone else. All these 10 categories of people who deal with alcohol, our beloved Prophet said, the curse of Allah is on them. But today, my colleagues, that are the medical doctors, 
they have a different approach. What they say? That alcohol, it is not addiction. They say that alcoholism is a disease. And they say that we have to be sympathetic towards the alcoholic. The new technology, new ways. As the sick person, like how someone is sick, you have to visit him and you have to solace, show kindness to him. So today's medical doctors, they say that alcoholism is a disease. You have to pray for them. Poor man is sick. You have to be sympathetic towards him. And I reply to them. And in one of my messages that comes on the Peace TV, and I always repeat it, that if alcoholism is a disease, it is only disease that has got no viral or germ as its cause. It is the only disease that is sold in bottles. It is the only disease that is advertised in the newspapers, in the magazines, on the radio broadcast stations, on the television channels. It is the only disease that has a licensed outlet for sale. It is the only disease that gets a revenue for many governments of the world. It is the only disease that brings violent deaths on the highways. It is the only disease that destroys families. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our creator says and gives the reply in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Rich to memory shaitan, it is a Satan's handiwork. First animalukum to flihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. It is not a disease, it is a Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. That's the reason. In most of the religious scriptures, besides the Quran and the Hadith, alcohol has been prohibited. The 15th most common question asked by the non Muslims is In Islam, why are two women witnesses equal to one man's witness? Indicating that Islam degrades the woman. Let me tell you that the Quran, in no less than five places, talks about witnesses without mentioning the gender, whether male or female. Except in one place, the Quran specifies and says that two women witnesses is equal to one witness of man, and that is in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 282, which is the longest ayah, longest verse of the Quran. It is the part of the longest surah of the Quran, Surah Baqarah, and the verse number 282 is the longest verse of the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that, Ya listen, Amanu, O you believe, when you involve in any financial transaction involving future obligation for a fixed period of time, put it down in writing and get two men as witnesses amongst yourself. It further goes and says, if you can't find two men, then one man and two women. And it continues, if one of them errs or makes a mistake, the second will correct her. Now this verse of the Quran is exclusively talking about financial transactions and nothing else. Let me give you an example for better understanding. For example, if someone wants to undergo a surgery, maybe a major operation, the best for him would be that he takes the advice of two qualified surgeons. It is the best for safety. If he can't find two qualified surgeons, at least one qualified surgeon, MS or MCH, and two MBBS doctors. Because an MBBS doctor cannot do a major surgery. You can't have four MBBS doctors and do the surgery. Best would be two qualified surgeons who are master of surgery. If you can't find two qualified surgeons, master of surgery, at least one master of surgery and two bachelor of surgery. Similarly, in financial transaction, because in Islam, the financial burden is put on the shoulders of the man in Islam. The woman need not look after any financial burden. In Islam, before a woman is married, it is the duty of the father and the brother. And after she's married, it is the duty of the husband and the son to look after a lodging, boarding, clothing, and all financial aspects. So because of this, if it's an Islamic society, a man is more financially aware as compared to a woman 
Because of this, in financial transaction, when you take witnesses, take two men. If you can't find two men, then one man and two women. Because if one of them errs, the Arabic word is tazil, makes a mistake. Some people translate as if one of them forgets. It's not forget. It is if one of the women makes a mistake, the second will correct her. There are several verses in the Quran which talk about witnesses without mentioning the gender. For example, Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 106 to 108, that if death approaches you, put the will, the inheritance in writing and take two witnesses. The gender is not mentioned. Quran says in Surah Talaq, chapter number 65, verse number 2, that when someone gives talaq, take two witnesses. The gender is not specified. Should be honest, should be just. Gender is not specified. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 4, that if someone lays an allegation against the modesty of a woman, produce four witnesses, otherwise, 80 lashes. Four witnesses doesn't specify the gender, whether it's male or female. If you cannot get four witnesses, and if you make an allegation against the modesty of a woman, 80 lashes. And one verse of the Quran is explicitly clear, which equates one male and one female. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 6 says that if someone lays an allegation against the spouse, or the husband lays an allegation against the wife, and he does not have any evidences, no witnesses, his solitary evidence is sufficient, and he has to take oath four times in the name of Allah, and fifth time pronounce a curse on him if he's lying. Immediately the next verse, after verse number 6 and 7 of Surah Nur, Surah Nur chapter 24 verse number 8 says, but if the wife, if she also does not have any witnesses, she too can be a solitary evidence by taking oath four times. And the fifth one, being a curse on herself if she's lying. So here, it is clearly mentioned in the Quran that one female is equal to one male. So based on this, most of the fuqahas and the jurists, they agree that only in cases of financial transaction, witnesses of two women is equal to one man. And some jurists say that in cases of murder, where the nature of the female may be difficult for her to give evidence, maybe two women is equal to one man. But all the other cases, one woman is equal to one man witness. For example, in the starting of the month of Ramadan, in the sighting of moon, you require one witness. In the ending of Ramadan, you require two witnesses. It does not make a difference whether it's a male or a female. Only in some country, it has to be a man, should have a beard of the standard fist, then only can you take the witness. And I have one more strong argument, that the beloved wife of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. Another one, huh? She has narrated no less than 2,210 ahadith. 2,210 ahadith. And she was the only witness. So 2,210 say hadith, which are basis of the Sharia, is a witness only of one woman. She was the wife of the Prophet. Her Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. So this clearly indicates that one witness of woman is equal to one witness of man. There are cases in which how in financial transaction men is preferred to women. There are certain cases in which women witness is taken, men's witness is not taken. For example, while giving the burial bath of a female Muslimah, witness should be a woman. A man cannot be a witness. Unless in certain conditions where it's a forest and there are no human beings, then the husband can be. But otherwise, generally, for the burial bath, for the janaza, Gusul of a woman. The witness is accepted of a woman, not of a man. The 16th most common question asked about Islam is that why does Islam do injustice to women by only allowing 50% of the share given to the male counterpart? That why do women in Islam inherit only half what is inherited by the male counterpart. It's injustice to them. 
This is the 16th most common misconception. As far as inheritance is concerned, the Quran speaks about inheritance in several places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 180. Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 240. Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 7 to 9. Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 19. Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 33. Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 106 to 108. Several places it speaks about inheritance. But the exact share is mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 11 and 12. And Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 176. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 11 that as for the inheritance of your children, the male will get double the share of the female. If only daughters, two or more, they share in a two-third. If only one daughter, she gets half. In what you leave for your parents. If there are children, the parents each get one-sixth share. If no children, the mother gets one-third. If there are brothers and sisters, the mother gets one-sixth. Verse number 12 says, in what your wives leave for you after death? The husbands, they get half if there are no children. They get one-fourth if there are children. In what you leave for your wives? The wives get one-fourth if there are no children, one-eighth if there are children. Don't get confused, difficult to remember, Go home, open the Quran, don't know Arabic, read the translation, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 11 and 12. Generally, I agree, in majority of the cases, the female inherits half of that of the male counterpart. But there are cases in which female and male inherit exactly the same. As I mentioned, if the person who has died has children, mother and father both get one sixth. Or if the person who has died has got no children, but leaves a brother and sister, both get one-sixth. There are cases in which sometimes the female inherits double. If a female dies and leaves behind no children, but has a husband and mother and father, the husband gets half, mother gets one-third, the father gets one-sixth. So mother gets double than the father, but there are rare cases. I do agree as a normal general policy, the female inherits half of that of the male counterpart. If it's daughter and son, son inherits double than that of the daughter. Husband and wife, husband inherits double than that of the wife. I agree with it. What is the logical reason? The reason, as I mentioned earlier, the financial burden in Islam is put on the shoulders of the men. As far as the women are concerned, before she's married, it's the duty of the father and the brother. And after she's married, it's the duty of the husband and the son to look after a lodging, boarding, clothing, and all financial aspects. She need not work for a living. She's financially secured. Based on this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the shares. And let me give you an example. Suppose there's a person who dies and leaves behind 150,000 dirhams. And he has one son and one daughter. After giving the shares of the wives and the other relatives, if 150,000 dirham are remaining from his inheritance, and he has one son and one daughter, the son will inherit 100,000 dirhams, and the daughter will inherit 50,000 dirhams. Now, I'm asking you a question. Would you prefer being a son who inherits 100,000 dirhams, and maybe... 80 to 90 percent of that wealth you may have to spend on your family because you are the bread earner. Or would you prefer inheriting 50,000 dirhams and keeping everything for yourself, not even spending a single dirham on anyone else? So logically, but naturally, you prefer inheriting 50,000 dirhams and not spending a single dirham on anyone else rather than inheriting 100,000 dirhams and spending 80 percent, 90 percent, 100 percent of it on looking after the other members of the family. That's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. If he would have given both of them equal share, then I would have to give a talk on men's rights in Islam. Then the men would object. What kind of religion is this? We have to look after the family, and when we inherit, we inherit equal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees to it 
that is just with everyone. Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. The 17th most common question asked by the non-Muslim regarding Islam is that why do Muslims believe in life after death? How can you prove logically about the year after, about life after death? And many a time there are non-Muslims who pose this question to me. Brother Zakir, you're a medical doctor. You have given a lecture on Quran modern science. You are so scientific. But how do you believe in this blind belief, life after death? Science hasn't proved it. So they pose the question that if Islam is a logical religion, how do you justify life after death? I tell them that life after death is not just a blind belief. It's a logical belief. And I've given the talk on Quran modern science. And I've said that there are more than 6,000 verses of the Quran, out of which more than 1,000 verses of the Quran, they speak about science. But today, science hasn't advanced so much to prove everything of the Quran. So if we analyze, say, approximately 80% what the Quran speaks, which is related with science, has been proved to be 100% correct. 20% it is ambiguous. Neither right, neither wrong. We don't know. So when 80% of the Quran is proved to be 100% perfect according to scientific facts, and 20% is neither wrong, neither right, not even 0.1% of the 20% has been proved wrong, my logic says when 80% is 100% correct and 20% is ambiguous. My logic says that inshallah, even that 20% would be correct. So it is a logical belief. It is not a blind belief. This is one way of proving life after death. The other strategy I use to prove about life after death is by asking a common question. That is robbing, good or bad? And I'd like to ask you that question here from the audience, is robbing good or bad? Good or bad? Bad. Who says robbing is good? Raise your hand. No one, mashallah, mashallah. Large audience, maybe more than 15,000. Not a single person says robbing is good. No, I, I am trying to impersonate. For example, I am a logical person. I am a scientific person. I'm behaving like a non-Muslim, like an atheist, but I claim myself to be a logical person and a scientific person, and I say that robbing is good. Believe me, I am a logical person, I'm a scientific person. I say robbing is good, and I like robbing. And I'm giving you a chance, this large audience of more than 15,000 people, I am giving you a chance to prove to me robbing is bad and I will stop robbing. I've told you, I'm a logical person, I'm a scientific person. Give me one logical reason why robbing is bad for me and I will stop robbing. I will tell you why it is good for me. When I rob a person, I can go and eat biryani, I can go to a five-star hotel, easy, easy money. Now you tell me why robbing is bad. Don't give me 10, 20 reasons. Give me only one logical scientific reason why robbing is bad and I will stop robbing. Can anyone give me? Yes, brother. If you rob someone, can you speak a bit louder, mashallah? Very good. Brother Sikh, if I take something from someone, I'm taking away something from him. I agree. It is a loss for that person, but benefit for me. I agree with you. What I told you, prove to me why it is bad for me. It is bad for the person who has been probed. What I told you, prove to me why it is bad for me. I'm logical. I'm scientific. I agree it is bad for the person who has been probed. Tell me why it is bad for me. I will stop robbing. Yes, brother, loudly. Someone will rob me, will I like it? Very good. Brother, I'm a big mafia. 
I've got 100 bodyguards, and all of them are behind the stage. I'm a big robber. I'm not a small robber. For a small robber, it is bad. Someone may rob you. I'm a big mafia. I've got 100 bodyguards all behind, you know, all with AK-47. I'm logical. I'm scientific. I'm a big robber. For small robbers, it's not good. Somebody may rob you. So why it is bad for me? Yes, brother. Hello, my name is Nadeem. Why is robbing bad for me? Because uh, you will be bad for other people. I'll be bad for other people. I agree with you, my son. Why it is bad for me? I agree. Because your name is going to be bad. My name? My name is very good. <laughs> Why it is going to be bad? I'm telling you, my name gets bad, I have no problem, as long as I'm benefiting. When I rob someone, maybe 100,000 dirham if I rob, I can go to a five-star hotel, I can see a movie, I can enjoy, I can eat biryani. Easy money, other people are just logging out. Me, I get easy money, you know, robbing is very easy. Anyone? Someone will say that the police will catch me. The police cannot catch me because the police is on my payroll. I have the ministers in my pocket. I have the police in my pocket. I'm a big robber. I'm a mafia. Most of the countries, the police and the ministers can be in your pocket. They're on my payroll. So therefore, whatever answer you give, in no way, and I've done this exercise in audiences larger than this, 50,000 people, 100,000 people, no one so far has been able to tell me one logical reason. I am a non-Muslim. I'm a non-Muslim. Very logical, very scientific. No one can prove to me why robbing is bad. You want to kill me? I have got guards. Before you kill me, my guards will kill you. Yes, brother. What I think why it would be bad for you is because when you start robbing, you will, you will be collecting a lot of wealth. Very good. That, that wealth, you'll be worried about to keeping it safe. And um, that, that is, will take your sleep away, it'll take the safety away from your family, and it won't give you peace of mind. And when you lose your peace of mind, you lose everything. Brother said, if you have too much of wealth, difficult to keep. You know, there are many wealthy people sitting here. Difficult to keep, very easy to keep. There are many banks here. Why? I won't keep in my pocket. You know, now you have got credit cards. You have got checkbook. For you, who's a small man, when you get 1,000 dirham, you're afraid my 1,000 dirham will go away. I'm a multi-billionaire. All these banks and all. For me, it's very safe. If I keep in the bank and everything, lot of profit, lot of interest. Brother, for small people to keep a 1,000 dirham, they're worried. For me, I'm a billionaire. But then again, you'll be worried about banks losing all the money with the recession. And these are, these are, these are, these are, these are natural calamities. Brother is saying that if I keep it in the bank recession, I'll own the bank. The banks have no problem. What do you know that even in recession, it's not only in bank, you can keep in wealth, you can keep in real estate. It is one option I've given you. You can keep in shares, everything. If the recession goes down again, it will come up. Dubai has gone down again, Dubai will come up. Yeah. It's going to come up. It will take four, five years. I'm so big, I've got no problem. Then there's no answer to that. Yes. No answer, I will give you the answer. <laughs> I agree with you. There is no logical reply why robbing is bad, why raping is bad, why cheating is bad. Now, we turn the sides. You are the non-Muslim, robber, logical, scientific. I am a Muslim now. I, the Muslim, I agree with you that logically to prove robbing is bad is very difficult, except what I'll do first, I'll prove to that person the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've given the talk, is the Quran God's word? It's for two hours, I don't intend giving the talk here. In that talk, I've proved logically, scientifically, to the non-Muslims, with the help of the Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. After I've proved to him the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. 
the non-Muslim will tell me, you are talking about Allah, I believe in him. But you are saying that Allah is not unjust. I want to know and ask you this question. I do agree with you that for a person who's robbing, he would enjoy it. But if the same evil is done to someone who's close to him, will he like it? If suppose someone robs his father, will you like it? And the answer is no. Someone robs his uncle, will you like it? The answer is no. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just, there is so much of injustice done in this world. There are many robbers, we know they are robbing, yet they live a luxurious life. They have mansions, they have palaces, and they die, and everything is over. The reply is given in the glorious Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 185, Every soul shall have a taste of death. And the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. Whosoever is saved from the hellfire and enters the garden, the paradise, he has achieved the objective of this world. For this world is goods and chattels of deception. So Allah says, the final recompense is only on the day of judgment. That means only believing in Allah is not sufficient. One of the pillars of Iman is, besides believing in Allah and the prophets and the books and the angels and the Qadr is to believe in life after death. Without life after death, only believing in Allah is not sufficient at all. Therefore, one of the pillars of Iman is Akhirah, life after death. And we know that there are many robbers who are powerful. There are many thieves who are powerful. Mafias are powerful. Some of them get arrested. Some of them get punished in the world. Many of them go unpunished. So what kind of a test is this? So I will tell this rich person who's a robber, who's powerful. I agree with you. You'll enjoy in this world. You'll sleep peacefully. Easy earning, but what about the Akhira? What about life after death? There has to be a life after death. Only logically, without life after death, the life in this world cannot be justified. When we talk about justice, for example, you might have heard of Hitler. He insinuated six million Jews. Today, if you arrest him, what punishment can you give? If Hitler was arrested by the police, what punishment could the law give him of this world? Maximum, one death. What about the balance? Five million, 999,000, 999 people he killed. You can only justify one death. But in the Akhirah, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse 56, that as to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them in the hellfire. And as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to incinerate, burn Hitler six million times, he can do it. If Allah wants to burn him 12 million times, he can do it in the Akhirah. In this world, whatever your police catches, you can maximum compensate for one death. That's the reason, logically, and to justify that robbing is bad, raping is bad, bribing is bad. There has to be something like Akhira. There has to be life after death. Without life after death, only believing in God is not sufficient. Only believing in Allah will not justify why robbing is bad, why raping is bad, why bribing is bad, except with the concept of Akhira, as Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 85, Kullu nafsin zaykatul maut. Every soul shall have a taste of death. The final recompense is in the day of judgment. The 18th most common question asked by the non-Muslim is that if all the Muslims, they believe in the same Allah, they follow the same Quran, they believe in the same Prophet, then why are Muslims divided into sects? The reply to this question is given in the glorious Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, 
verse number 103, where Allah says, Wa tasimu jamia wa la Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. The double emphasis. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly, the second emphasis, and be not divided. The rope of Allah, it's the glorious Quran. Allah says, hold to the rope of Allah, that's the glorious Quran, and be not divided. Allah says, Atiullah, Atiur Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. In Surah Nisa, chapter 459. We have to strongly hold to Allah and the things of the Prophet and be not divided. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse 159, that if anyone breaks their religions and divides the religion of Islam into sects, O Prophet, you have nothing to do with him. Allah will look after his affairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling, that if anyone breaks his religion into sects and divides his religion, O oh Prophet, you have nothing to do with him. Allah will look after his affairs on the Day of Judgment. But when we ask the Muslim, normally, what are you? So some say, I'm a Sunni. Some say, I'm a Shia. Some say, Hanafi. Some say, Shafi. Some say, Hamali. Some say, Malki. Some say, Deobandi. Some say, Barevli. Some say, Ali Hadith. Some say Salafi, some say Jamaat Islami, some say Tabligi. What was the beloved Prophet? What was he? Was he Hanafi? Was he Shafi? Was he Hanbali? What was he? What was he? He was a Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 52, Isa alayhi salam was a Muslim. Allah says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse 67, that Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ibrahim peace be upon him, was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 33, Woman has to call a mimman doil a lohi. Wamil soli home. Walk call a inani minil Muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, walks righteousness, and sees that I am a Muslim? Call a inani minil Muslimin. And sees that I am a Muslim. And the master key for dawah, which I've mentioned in several of my lectures, the master key of dawah. And the most important verse according to me in the Quran of Sulaiman Imran, chapter 3, verse number 64 is, Pul Yahil al Kitab. Say, O people of the book, Ta'ala wila kalimatin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as in us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na with the illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi shayyam. That we associate the partners with him. Wala yatta khizabad dunabad dan arbaban min dunillah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallah. If then they turn back. Fakul shadu. Say we bear witness, we are Muslimun, that we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah. I am a Muslim, we are Muslim. No less than 22 places in the Quran, Allah says, call yourself a Muslim, call yourself a Muslim. Ibrahim alayhi salam, in Surah Baqara, chapter 2, when he did dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told that, make my children Muslims. All these aimas, all these great scholars of Islam, the four imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu bin Hanbal, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi. May Allah have mercy on them all. I love them, I respect them all. All these are great scholars of Islam. All of them. When you ask them, if you ask Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with him. Who are you? What reply will he give? What will he say? I'm a Muslim. We love these scholars. We respect these scholars. All the scholars said that if you find any of my fatwa which goes against Allah and His Rasul, you throw my fatwa on the wall. We love these scholars, we respect them, but all of them came to get us closer to Islam to make us a practicing Muslim, not divide our religion. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 59, Ya Elizina Amanu, O you believe. Atiullah, what you Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And those who have been charged with authority, wa ulil amri minkum, who have been charged with authority amongst you. So people say, believe in Allah, believe in the Messenger, and believe in the scholars. But they're putting a full stop where there's no full stop. The verse does not end there. The verse continues. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And those who have been charged with authority, the ulama, the scholars, but if they differ, go back to Allah and His Rasul. If they differ, 
if any scholar, if you find all the scholars say the same thing, you don't have to do research. All say pray five times, no problem. All say fast, no problem. But if two scholars differ, you go back to Allah and his Rasul. Where is the question of dividing the religion? That's why beloved Prophet Muhammad said. It's a Sahih Hadith of Sunan Abu Dawood, Hadith number 4579. Our beloved Prophet said, there will be 73 sects in Islam. So people say, the Prophet has prophesied. The Prophet said there will be. The Prophet didn't say make. The Prophet said there will be 73 sects. Prophet did not say you should make sex in Islam. Allah clearly mentioned in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 159, do not make sex in the religion of Islam. The Prophet predicted there will be 73 sex. He didn't say you should make. There's another hadith, a say hadith in Tirmidhi. A beloved Prophet Muhammad said that there will be 73 sex in Islam, out of which all will go to hell except one. The Sahaba asked which one? He said, those that follow me and my companions, those that follow Quran and the authentic hadith. So if you stick to the Quran and the Sahih hadith, you are on the straight path. So in Islam, there is no divisions and no sects in Islam. Islam is only one. The Quran is one. Our beloved Prophet is one. You have to follow the Quran and the authentic sayings of Prophet Muhammad The 19th most common question asked by the non-Muslim is that if we study most of the religions, they teach us to do good things, not to rob, not to cheat, not to rape. So if all the religions teach good things, why should a person only follow Islam? It's a very good question that if we analyze, most of the religions speak good things, basically. So why follow Islam? The reply to this question is, I do agree, most of the religions speak good things, basically. But the difference in Islam is, Islam shows you a way how to achieve the state of goodness. For example, all the religions say you should not rob. Hinduism says you should not rob. Christianity says that. Islam says the same. So what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference is Islam shows you a way to achieve a state in which people will not rob. Islam has a system of zakat that every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of his excess wealth in charity every lunar year. If every rich human being gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. After this, the glorious Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, as to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or her hands as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Chopping off the hands in this age of science and technology, in this 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. I'm asking a question that today, America happens to be one of the most advanced countries in the world. But do you know, it is the country which has one of the highest rates of theft and robbery. I'm asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in America, in USA, every person who's rich, who has a saving of more than 85 grams of gold, should give 2.5% of his saving every lunar in charity. After that, if any person, man or woman, robs, chop off his or her hand as a punishment, I'm asking the question, will the rate of robbery and theft in America, in USA, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? Increase, remain the same or decrease? Decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia, you get results. You implement the Sharia anywhere. It doesn't have to be a Muslim country. You implement in USA also, you'll get results. That's the reason I say Islam besides speaking good things, shows you a way how to achieve that goodness. And many people think that if you go to Saudi Arabia, where this law is practiced, every second person you come across will have his hand chopped off. I have been to Saudi Arabia more than 50 times. I have not come across a single person whose hands have been chopped off. There may be some people whose hands have been chopped off, 
but it is not as common as you think. The law is so strict that a person will think 10,000 times before robbing. And if you relax this law, if Saudi Arabia stops this law, Islamic law, immediately you'll find that robbery and theft will increase. Not that the police is very intelligent, but the law is so strict, the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you relax this law, even in that country, again, theft and robbery will increase. It is a practical law. You implement the Sharia, you get results. Let me give you one more example. Most of the religions say that molesting a girl is wrong, raping a girl is wrong. Hinduism says that, Judaism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says the same. So what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference is Islam shows you a way how to achieve a state in which people will not molest or rape any woman. Islam speaks about the system of hijab. Normally, you read books, you find orators, scholars talking about hijab for the woman, hijab for the woman. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman, if any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes, he should lower his gaze. Once there was a Muslim who was staring at a girl for a long time. I said, brother, what are you doing? It's haram in Islam. He told me, our beloved prophet said, the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited. I have not completed half my glance. That does not mean you look at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying, I have not completed my glance. What the Prophet meant was, if you unintentionally look at a woman, don't look at her again to feast on her beauty. The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what appears ordinary of and draw a head covering over her bosom. And discipline out a beauty except to her husband, her father, her son, and a list of mehram, the close relatives who she can't marry is given. The basic criteria for hijab as far as the extent is concerned is that for the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. And it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 59. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the jilbab, they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized and they will be prevented from being molested. Quran says, when the believing women, when they go abroad, they should put on the jilbab, the cloak, so that they shall be recognized and will prevent them from being molested. For example, if there are two twin sisters who are very beautiful, who are equally beautiful. And if they are walking down the streets of Dubai, you know, maybe Jumeirah, and one twin sister, she is wearing the Islamic hijab, complete body covered, except for the face and the hands up to the wrist. And the second twin sister, she is wearing the Western clothes, mini skirt or shorts or with a low neck. And if both of them are walking down the streets, of Jumeirah. And if round the corner there is a hooligan wearing to tease a girl, I am asking you a question. Which girl will he tease? Will he tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab or will he tease the girl wearing the western clothes, the mini skirts or short? Which girl will he tease? Which girl? The one wearing mini skirts or short? Quran rightly says that hijab has been prescribed to protect the woman, to prevent them from being molested. And after this, the Islamic Sharia says, if any man rapes a woman, capital punishment, death penalty. Non-Muslims say, capital punishment, death penalty? In this age of science and technology, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a merciless way of life. I ask these non-Muslims, and I say, that suppose, God forbid, God forbid, someone rapes your mother, someone rapes your sister, and if the rapist is born in front of you, what punishment will you give him? And believe me, 100%, all of them said, we will put him to death.
If someone rapes your mother, you want to put him to death. Somebody rapes somebody else's mother, you say death penalty is a barbaric law. Why these double standards? Today, we look up to America as the most advanced country in the world. Do you know, according to statistics of USA, it is one of the countries which has the maximum rapes in the world. As I mentioned earlier, in 1990, according to FBI report, every day, 1,756 cases of rape took place. If you see the other statistics, 1996, six years later, US Department of Justice, every day, 2,713 cases of rape took place. Maybe the American got more bold. Every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place in USA. Every 32 seconds. I have given this lecture for the past one hour. Already more than 50 rapes may have taken place in America since the time I'm giving the lecture. <laughs> and do you know, what do the statistics say? 1990 statistics say that in the full year, in 1990, 102,555 rapes took place. Only 16% were reported. Therefore, the exact number of cases you multiply by 6.25. You get the reply of 640,000. 968 rapes took place, per day divided by 365, 1,756. But the report continues. Out of the 16% that were reported, only 10% were arrested. That means 1.6% of the rapists were arrested. Out of those arrested, 50% were let free. That means only 0.8% underwent the trial. 50% were let free before the trial. That means 125 rapes you commit, the chances you'll undergo a trial is one. Very good gamble. 125 girls you rape, and chances you get a punishment is one. Who wouldn't like to try? And the statistics tell us that the judge says, first time he's committed rape, okay, give him only one year punishment. More than 50% get one year imprisonment, though the law says seven years rigorous imprisonment. But the judge is lenient, first time he's done. 125 rapes. You get caught once, judge says first time, 50% of the cases, he says less than one year. I'm asking you the question, if you implement the Islamic Sharia in USA, any man looks at a woman, any brazen, any unashamed thought comes, he should lower his gaze. After that, the woman, they should properly be covered, complete body covered, except the face and the hands of the wrist can be seen. After that, if any man rapes a woman, capital punishment, death penalty, I'm asking you the question, will the rate of rape in USA, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. That's the reason one of the least states of crime in any country in the world, it's in Saudi Arabia. Why? You implement the Sharia, you get results. That's the reason I say that Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a way how to achieve the good things. So the other religions are more theoretical. Islam is a practical religion. So practically, if you care for humanity, practically, if you really want the evil to be destroyed in this world, you have to accept Islam. The 20th, and the last in my list, of the most common questions asked by non-Muslims is that if Islam is the best religion, then why you find most of the terrorists are Muslims, most of the robbers are Muslims, most of the people who cheat are Muslims? Why? If Islam is the best religion, then why do you see that the Muslims are the worst? The reply to this question is that one of the major factors for this impression that all the terrorists are Muslims, the impression that most of the people who cheat are Muslims, the most of the people who bribe are Muslims, is the media. And about five years back, when I was called Dubai Holy Quran International Award for the second time, under the patronage of Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Maktoum, I had given the talk on my second day, media and Islam, war or peace. And I described in detail what is the strategy of the media to malign Islam. And I also gave a talk, Islam, the solution to the problems of humanity. The media says Islam is a problem for humanity. Actually, Islam is the solution for the problems of humanity. 
That's why the tagline of the Peace TV is the solution for humanity. That means Islam is the solution for humanity. What does the media do? Time will not permit me to give in detail. I'll just wind up my answer in a couple of minutes. What does the media do? Media picks up the black sheep of the community and they portray as though they're exemplary Muslims. See, we have black sheep in the community. We do have many Muslims who are namesake Muslims. They aren't practicing Islam. They pick them up and they portray as though they're exemplary Muslims. Many a time, the media, they quote something of the Quran, they quote out of context. Whenever they get information, they malign the Muslims. For example, we know in 1996, the Oklahoma bombing, at that time, it was the biggest attack on American soil. More than 100 people were killed. 166 people were killed. It came as headlines. Middle East conspiracy, Middle East conspiracy. Muslims to blame, Muslims to blame. Headline for days and weeks together. Later on when they came to know it were two American soldiers, it comes once and vanishes. When they don't know the culprit, it comes for days as headlines. When they come to know the real culprit, one or two days, the news goes out. Why? In India, we have 50-year-old Muslim Arab marrying 18-year-old girl. Headlines. When 50-year-old non-Muslim rapes a 6-year-old girl, it comes in news briefs. <laughs> that 50-year-old Arab Muslim, he's taking permission and marrying a girl with her will, with the will of the parents. It doesn't go down the throat of the media. But when a 50-year-old non-Muslim rapes a 6-year-old girl, it comes in news briefs. Why? Same example. Couple of weeks back, there was a bomb blast in Pune, German bakery. Nine people were killed. Suspect, Muslim, Muslim, Muslim. Suspect, huh? suspect. No 100% proof. Same day, the Maoists, they killed 16 policemen. Not civilians, policemen, huh? Here comes the news brief. Muslim suspect, nine civilians killed, 16 policemen killed by Maoist. Comes the news brief. Ajib. They know the people who killed, not civilians. They have got cannons, rocket launchers. They bombard the full police station. Comes the news brief. They don't know who did the Pune bomb blast. Muslim, Muslim suspect. And it's continuously there for many days. They don't know who did it. Who they know did it because it's a Maoist, communist, non-Muslim news brief. Or maybe front page, some papers, but below. And it vanishes out of the media. So the major cause is the media. Media and Islam, war or peace. Unfortunately, Muslims are very weak in media. Very weak. We may have good media about song channel, dance channel, many. But Islamic channels, unfortunately. Yes, I do know there are black sheep in the community. But yet, with all the black sheep, yet as a whole, the Muslims are the biggest teetotalers in the world. I know some Muslims who can drink the non-Muslim under the table. But as a whole, the biggest community of teetotalers in the world are Muslims. The biggest community as a whole that gives charity, they are Muslims. There is no non-Muslim, no human being in the world who can show a candle to a practicing Muslim as far as modesty is concerned, as far as sobriety is concerned, as far as human values are concerned, as far as ethics are concerned. No human being can show a candle to a practicing Muslim as far as modesty is concerned, as far as sobriety is concerned, as far as human values are concerned, as far as ethics are concerned. And I always give the example. Suppose you want to judge how good a car is, and latest, a 600 model of Mercedes is launched in the market, 2010 model. You want to test the car. You put behind the steering wheel a driver who does not know how to drive, and he bangs up the car. He has an accident. Who will you blame? Will you blame the car or the driver? Driver. If you want to know how good the car is, you have to know the specifications. What is the pickup? What are the safety measures? What's the ratio? 
What is the average of the car? And the brake locking system. Look at the specification. And really, if you want to test drive the car, put behind the steering wheel an expert driver. If you really want to know about Islam, don't look at the Muslims. Look at the scriptures, the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Don't look at me. Don't look at the Muslims. If you really want to test drive a car, put behind the steering wheel an expert driver. The best exemplary Muslim you can find is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Read his seerah, you will find he's the best exemplary Muslim and the best exemplary human being that has lived. That's the reason I say that understand the religion by looking at the scriptures. And when you read the scriptures, the authentic sources, the Quran and Sahih Hadith, you will really appreciate Islam. And I mentioned last time that after 9-11, there was a new entry in the most 20 common questions, the word jihad. So when the new entry comes, the last one goes away. So previously in the book which I wrote before 2001, the 20th one is the non-Muslims object that why do you call non-Muslims as kafir? Now it is out of the list. You know, normally you have the important misses. So today I would call it the important misses, which is no longer in the list. But I'll give the answer because the answer is short. Many non-Muslims say that why do the Muslims abuse us by calling us kafir? The reply to this question is, what is the meaning of the word kafir? Kafir comes from the Arabic root word kufr, which means to reject which means to conceal. In Islamic context, kafir is a person who rejects the truth of Islam. So if I have to translate into English, in common English or layman's English, kafir means a non-Muslim. So if I call the non-Muslim a non-Muslim, in Arabic I say kafir, why should he feel bad? Why should he feel offended? And if they say that, why do you call us kafir? The only way I can stop calling you a kafir is if you accept Islam. Then I say you're not a kafir or a Muslim. <laughs> that was in brief regarding the replies to the common questions. And now, inshallah, as suggested, we'll have an open question answer session. And I request that to give more chance to the non-Muslims so that we give them the first chance. And any question on Islam and comparative religion, any questions that you have regarding Islam, any misconception, any queries, you are most welcome to us. Wakhra Dawan, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Jazakum Allahu Khaira. We now have the time for the question and answer session. To derive maximum benefit from the program, which is Ask Dr. Zakir, we will have some strict guidelines regarding the question and answer session. First of all, please kindly state your question briefly and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked. If you do wish to ask a second question, you'll have a chance to go to the back of the row and await your chance to ask the second question. If there are any non-Muslim brothers or sisters, they will be given first preference to ask the questions. So contact one of the volunteers and they will put you to the front of the line. We have three mics available in the auditorium. One to my left for the brothers, one in the center of the auditorium, and one in the back for the sisters. Lastly, we kindly request that you state your name and your profession before putting forth your question. So once we're ready, we will have the first question from the front mic from the brothers. Good evening to everyone. I am a security guard by profession from uh, Central Africa, Cameroon. I have been leading people to go to the washroom and to go to the prayer room also. And then this little boy, he came and I led him to the washroom and he now said he wants to discuss something with me. When I opened up to him, he tried to convince me to, to become a Muslim, that is good for me. And I asked him, And I asked him, why do you think it's good for me? He said uh, that I should try it, I will never regret. And I told him I have uh, listened to the speakers, 
I'm highly convinced that uh, Islam is the best religion. So I want to, I want to become a Muslim. Mashallah. The brother was asked by a young Muslim, and that gives an example, Mashallah, that age is never a barrier. And I know that more than 50% of you may not have spoken to a non-Muslim. And this young boy, I think his age may be six years, seven years? 12 years, mashallah. 12 years, not even in his teens, has convinced our brother here, mashallah, from Cameron. Brother, are you accepting Islam out of your free will? Do you want to accept Islam out of your free will? Yes, sir. Is anyone forcing you? No, 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 no one is forcing me, sir. Mashallah, it's out of your free will. Do you believe that there is one God? Yes, there's only one God, sir. Do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger? Yes. Inshallah. So I'll just say in Arabic and you can repeat that, Inshallah. Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abduhu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa rasul. I bear witness. I bear witness. That. That. There is no God. There is no God. But Allah. But Allah and, and Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad is, is his messenger and servant. His messenger and servant. And servant. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. You are a Muslim, MashaAllah. May Allah reward you. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he guide you. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may he grant you Jannah. And I pray also that may that youngster, MashaAllah. And I request the brothers that whenever you meet a new Muslim, be kind to him. Be patient with them and whatever help they require, inshallah. And there are many organizations here in Dubai. If you require any information regarding Islam, you're most welcome to contact them. We'll have the next question from the sister's mic. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Um, there's a sister here who was convinced and she also wants to make her shahada. Mashallah, I thought it was the question answer session and turned into a shahada session. Yes. Sister, what's your name? My name is Eddie from Philippines. Are you convinced about Islam, sister? Yes, I am. Is anyone forcing you to accept Islam or it's of a free will? No, it's my free will. Do you believe there is one God? Yes, I do believe. Do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God? Yes, I do believe. Inshallah, I'll say in Arabic and you can repeat, sister. Inshallah. Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Abduhu. Abduhu. Wa rasuluhu. Wa rasuluhu. I bear witness. I bear witness. That. That. There is no God. There is no God. But Allah. But Allah. And Prophet Muhammad. And Prophet Muhammad. Is is the messenger the messenger and servant of allah and the servant of allah the sohabid allah masha sister you have become a muslim alhamdulillah and i pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he grant you jannah and if you have any queries any question about islam you're most free to ask the local organization or you can go to our website www.irf.net and surely you can contact the local people here for having more knowledge of Islam. You can read the books. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you and to grant you Jannah. Congratulations, sister. We'll have the next question from the brothers Mark in the center. My name is Rajesh. I work for an IT company. First, I would like to say assalamu alaikum. Sir, you are a versatile personality and you have knowledge of all the religion. And always you have said there is one and only Allah. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last messenger with the references and help of Hindu books. So now my question is, what about millions and billions of Hindus, Sikhs, Jain, Buddhists, they are praying at? Does their structure exist or there is only Allah and the Allah? Thank you. The brother asked a very important question. He says that he has heard my talk and I speak for different religions and I try and prove that there is only one Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the final messenger. Not only from the Quran, from the Hindu scriptures, from the Christian scriptures. 
So the question is, what about the millions and billions of non-Muslims, the Hindus, the Christians, that their structure yet exists? As far as the structure existing, if you go to the scriptures, all the scriptures that came before the Quran, in the passage of time, they have been manipulated, there has been corruption, there has been concoction. Therefore, if you apply the rule of logic and science, no scripture will pass the test except the Quran. But the beauty of all this is that even though the scriptures of the other religions have been changed, whether it be the Vedas, whether it be Ramayana, whether it be Mahabharat, whether it be Bhagavad Gita, whether it be the Bible, whether it be Dhammapad, what we realize that even in the changed form, even in the corrupted form, there are remnants. There are many verses which speak about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about Tawheed. Even though the scriptures have got corrupted, there are parts which yet say that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger. So what I say, that if they do research, and if they really want to be a good Christian, as Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that here shall he say. He shall guide you to truth. He shall glorify me. So here Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is telling his followers that there is a messenger to come, Prophet Muhammad. If I give you the message now, you will not be able to grasp it. When he comes, he will guide you to all truth. So if a Christian has to be a true Christian, he has to follow the teachings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Same thing with the Hindus. There are many references of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam besides Tawheed. He talks about the Kalki Avatar, the final messenger to come, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if you have to be a good practicing Hindu, it's mentioned in Kalki Purana, chapter number two, verse number five, verse number seven, verse number nine, verse number 15, that the Kalki Avatar has been described, that his father's name is Vishnu Yas that the servant of Allah, Abdullah. Mother's name is Sumati, which means peace and serenity. That's Amina. He'll be born in the village by the name of Sambala, peaceful village, that's Makkah. He'll be born in a family of the chieftains of the village of Makkah. He will have four companions, talking about four Khulfa Rashidin. He will get the first revolution in a cave, that's Gare Hira. He will migrate northwards and come back. He went to Medina and came back. Several, several. So if you're a true Hindu, even though the scriptures have got corrupted, have been concocted, if you think the full scripture is the word of God, you have to follow the Kalki Avatar. You have to believe in the last and final messenger. So if you want to follow the structure, and if you do research, you will come to the same last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Same with Buddhism, same with Judaism, same with Christianity, same with Hinduism. So what I tell them, based on the verse of the Quran, of Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 64. kalimatin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as been us and you. What is different, we keep it aside. What is common, let us agree. Let us follow. The first thing is, Allah na illallah. That he worship none but Allah. So what we realize, that what is different, we'll discuss tomorrow. What is common, let us agree to follow. Let us agree to follow what is mentioned in the Bible, in the Jewish scriptures, Christian scriptures, Hindu scriptures. God is one. He has got no idols. He has got no image. Idol worship is wrong. All the scriptures mention about the last and final messenger. So my question to them is, then why don't you follow it? Why don't you follow and believe only in one God? Don't do idol worship, worship him alone. And why don't you follow the last and final messenger? And my question to you, brother, is, if you're a Hindu, I think you're a Hindu, okay? So why don't you follow your scripture, which says that there's only one God? It says, Nata Sepati Masti, Sita Sita Upanishad, chapter number four, verse number 19. In Yajurved, chapter 32, verse number 3, Natasya Pratima Asti. Of that God, there is no Pratima. Pratima means Almighty God has got no image, has got no photograph, has got no painting, has got no portrait, has got no statue, has got no sculpture, has got no idol. I'm asking you, do you believe in one God? Do you believe? I do. Do you believe idol worship is wrong? Uh, no. So why don't you follow your Veda? I, I tell you one thing. Uh, it's not necessary, you need an idol or you need a picture or you need a light, you know. Idol is just created so you can focus, you know. It's for few people, those who cannot focus, for them, I mean, there is an idol so that you can focus properly. Correct. This is what is said to me by the pundits. They tell me, Dr. Zakir Naik, we have read the scripture, we agree with you totally. Idol worship is wrong. 
But what happened? Those who are initial, you know, toddlers, in the early stage of life, you require idol to concentrate. When you reach higher consciousness, no idol is required. I tell them we Muslims have reached the higher consciousness. We don't require idol. <laughs> this is the explanation given to you by a pundit, not by a scripture. It is by a pundit. I tell them, isn't it mentioned idol worship is wrong? He says, we know. It is like my son when he goes to second standard. The basics of maths is 2 plus 2 is 4. He says, son, 2 plus 2 is 5. You continue reading that. When you reach standard 10th, I will tell you 2 plus 2 is 4. I'll be the biggest fool. Because 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 is the basic equation of maths. God has got no idol. is the basic thing of God. How can you teach the basics wrong in the lower classes and higher classes? This is told to you by your pundits and your scholars, not by your scripture. So I'm asking you, do you want to follow your scripture or do you want to follow your pundit? I want to follow my scripture. Correct. So your scripture says, Almighty God has got no image, has got no idol. So do you yet believe in idol worship? No. Fine. So you used to believe, now you have stopped. Excuse me. I said that idol is meant for the few people who cannot concentrate. I didn't say that I, I believe so in... So that means you want to diminish God? For example, brother, I am asking you a question. Yes, you sir. are helping someone. What's your name? Rajesh. Rajesh. You are helping someone, maybe in Sri Lanka. Every month, you send him maybe 20,000 rupees, maybe 2,000 dirham for his education. He doesn't know who this Rajesh is. He says, who this Rajesh? I don't know. So what does he do? He takes a cockroach. And every day in the morning, he says, Rajesh, thank you. Rajesh, thank you. <laughs> Will you like it? No. Will you like it? No. Aray, but he doesn't know how Rajesh looks. So he's making a cockroach out of Rajesh. You will tell him, if you don't know how I look, at least take my name, it is sufficient. Why are you making a cockroach out of me? The God is so powerful, you want to make God into that small idol. If the idol falls, the idol breaks. The idol can't help himself. What will the idol help you? So what we say, don't belittle God. Don't abuse God. If you don't know how he looks, only take his name. Why do you have to insult God? If you only say, Rajesh, thank you, without making a cockroach, you'll be more happy. And compared to you and us, we are human beings. God is... You cannot compare God. You cannot say he's a million times more powerful. He is unlimited. You cannot compare God and human being. So how can you make God into an image and restrict him to an idol? It's insulting God. That's what the scriptures say. That he has got no pratima. You can give him attributes, but don't give him an image. Hindu scripture says that. Christian scripture says that. Quran says that. So now do you agree that even for concentration, Making idol of God is wrong. Could be. Could be, not yet sure. Not yet sure, huh? Your scripture says don't make, your pandit says make. So do you want to follow your pandit or your scripture? No scriptures. And I'm giving you reference. I'm quoting in Sanskrit. If you don't know Sanskrit, open a dictionary, Pratima, you ask your pandit. There's a person, joker looking person, wearing a cap and a coat and a tie. He is quoting scripture. Is it right? If you can't find the book, you can go to our center in Bombay IRF. We have all these scriptures. So I'm trying to get you closer to your scripture. So now are you convinced that idol worship is wrong? See, my question was, what about millions and billions of people who are following Hinduism and Jainism, Brother, Buddhism? Millions of Does billions that of... exist or not? Okay, I agree with your, with your thing. We should not do idol worship. But my question is, I mean, what about millions and billions? They have sentiments. They follow so much. So does that structure exist or it doesn't exist? The structure exists, but it is wrong structure. The structure what so they So you mean to say everybody should follow Allah? Everyone should follow the Creator. See, but then do why you mention Allah? only Allah? Why because, can't we say God? Ah, why can't we preach very, more about peace, love, very, humanity? Very good. Why don't Rather I, than we talk about Hinduism. Why don't I say God, I'll come to it. We'll come one by one. One question at a time, no problem. My plane is early in the morning, so I can stay. Why not call God? You know why? Because God can be played around with. Allah cannot be played. If you add S to God, it becomes God's 
There is nothing like plural Allah. Kul ho Allah ad. Say is Allah one and only. If I add D E S S to God, it becomes goddess, female god. There is nothing like male Allah, female Allah. You cannot play mischief with the Arabic word Allah. You can play mischief with the English word God. If I add father to God, it becomes Godfather. He is my Godfather. He is my guardian. There is nothing like Allah, Abba, or Allah Father in Islam. If you add mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There is nothing like Allah, Ammi, or Allah Mother in Islam. Allah is a pure Arabic word. You cannot play mischief. Same way, Khuda. You can have Khuda Dar. You know, Ishwar becomes Parmeshwar. All these words can be played around with. You show any other word which cannot be played around, I will use it, no problem. You should not go against the definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm saying in Arabic, but when I speak to non-Muslims, I sometimes use God. Knowing very well that God is not the appropriate translation of Allah. But while translating, even in Shahada, I'm using the word God. Knowing very well, it is not the correct definition. You are talking about, what about the millions and billions of people? Do they have the structure right? Brother, millions will come later on. I am bothered about you first. I am bothered about Rajesh. The million people, God will tell me, when you met Rajesh, why didn't you speak to Rajesh? Million people will come to later on. Whether right or wrong. Fine, I'm asking you, brother. I'm bothered about you. I'm concerned about you because I love you. Thank you, thank you. So I love you, therefore I'm asking, are you convinced idol worship is wrong? Yeah, I, I did say yes. Yes, very good. Are you convinced that the last and final messenger is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? According to your scripture? I don't have much knowledge, you know, whatever. I mean, I listen more to you. I've read about your book. You listen more <laughs> to me than your scriptures? No, no. I've, I've read uh, many uh, scholars, I hear them their cassettes, their videos. So I'm a little confused, you know, like, I don't know whom to believe, whom not to believe. But the, I mean, there are millions and billions of people, you know. So I don't know whether, I mean, see, I'm born in Hindu family. So it's very difficult to, you know, to transform or to convert or to change. But I was just confused, you know, because you always, always, always have seen that with the examples of Gita and our books, you try to prove that there is Allah and there is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Masha. So I was just confused. What about what about us then? What we are praying at? Are we I mean are we praying wrong way or what? Or we just have to you know like follow you what you say? Don't follow what I am saying. Follow what God is saying. In your scripture, there's something like shashtang. You know shashtang. Shashtang in Sanskrit means eight parts of the body. So the right way to pray in Hinduism is touching the eight parts of your body. In Islam, our beloved Prophet said that when you do sujood, you touch your forehead, you touch your nose, you touch your two hands, your two knees, and the two feet, eight parts. In your Hindu scripture also, the real way to pray is shashtang, touching the eight parts of your body. Don't get confused. I am giving you from your scripture. I want to remove your confusion. I am asking when your pandits speak, Tell them, go and check up. Don't just follow me blindly. You say you listen to my speeches, you feel the speeches are logical. So when it is logical, when you go to school, teacher tells you two plus two is four, she convinces you agree. So sir, when both the books are saying same, the both the religions are saying the same. So why can't we speak about peace and love rather so than talking about one religion? That's what I'm talking about, peace. That follow one God who is your creator. If you want to get peace, you can only get peace by following the commandments of one creator. Though the religious books are different. What I'm trying to point out, the commonalities. I'm not criticizing Hinduism. I'm not criticizing Christianity. I can give a bigger speech of differences between Hindu scriptures and Islamic scriptures. I can give a bigger talk and a longer speech on differences between Bible and Quran. But my aim is not to spread enmity. My aim is to spread peace. So because my aim is to spread peace, I am taking the commonalities and telling you the common point of both these religions, both these scriptures is believing in one God. I am trying to spread peace. Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to God. The ultimate peace is not only no war. No war, no fighting is only temporary peace. The ultimate peace is peace of mind, peace at heart, and peace in the next life. What I'm trying to propagate is not only peace in this world, peace in the next life. That's the reason I'm trying to get all the different human beings and telling them, do little research, spend little time, try and understand who our creator is, 
try and submit your will to this creator. What I request you to do is submit your will to Almighty God. Follow the instructions of the last and final messenger, and then, inshallah, you'll get total peace. Thank you. Hope that answers the question. Next question from the sister's mic. Assalamu alaikum. Brother, this sister is uh, from Botswana. Her name is Kay. Uh, she is, insists that she will not ask on the mic, so she's asked me that I should ask for her. But I made her stand so that you know that this is the sister whose question it is. She wants to know why do Muslim men rarely smile? Is it prohibited in Quran to smile? Only men. Sister asked that why do Muslim men rarely smile? Sister, I'm a Muslim man. And you can see a white smile on my face. MashaAllah, I can see many men out here. I can't see the ladies. So I cannot tell ladies are smiling or not now. At least the men in front of me, most of them are smiling, MashaAllah. Maybe the picture they see on the television, on BBC and CNN, a Muslim with gun, wearing a turban, terrorist. So maybe she's seeing too many, maybe movies of Hollywood, or maybe Bollywood, or maybe watching these channels. But mashallah, see here I'm giving a religious talk. I'm smiling, and hope you can see on the screen. And even the Muslim men, mashallah, here are smiling. So it's a misconception that if you're religious, then you can't enjoy life. If you're religious, you can enjoy life, but enjoy it according to the commandments of our Creator. Don't enjoy in the wrong way. People think if you want to enjoy life, you have to have wine, women, and wealth. It's a misconception. Wine is not required. The woman floating around is haram. Yes, woman as a wife, legal wife, with permission of the Creator, no problem, enjoy. Therefore, the Quran says, in Surah Room, chapter 30, verse 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put love and mercy between the hearts of the husband and wife. Wealth also, you enjoy wealth in the right way. So sister, in Islam, nowhere does the Quran say that you should not smile, you should not laugh. Yes, the Quran says do not laugh at others. Quran says in Surah Hujura chapter 49, verse number 11, that let not one group of men laugh at the others. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. Don't let one group of women laugh at the other. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. So laughing and mocking at others is haram, it's prohibited. But laughing with others is permitted. So don't laugh at others, laugh with others. Hope that answers the question. And you should not joke at others. If it's for a reason which is legitimate, no problem. Hope that answers the question. The next question from the brothers Mike on my left. Hi, my name is Rahul. I'm a banker by profession. I just wanted to ask you one thing, like ever since I have the sense of religion, we have heard that God is one and we are hearing it again as the God is one. But just now we had two people going as per you call Shahada or what. What you call is there is no God except Allah. And continuing what did you just tell Mr. Rajesh that whatever religion which came into existence before Islam, this Islam corrected these some ways out of this and some way out of that, that there were some mistakes in the religions before Islam and Islam corrected the things and the messenger, the last messenger, what you're just talking about, he corrected them all and now you have to follow the things again. So are you denying the fact that there was no God except Allah before Islam, like there is no Lord Shiva, there was no Lord Ganesha as per Hinduism or as per something. So are you totally denying the fact according to Islam? So as you say, there is no God except Allah? The brother asked a very good question. He said that when I say and I give the shahada that there's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is a messenger, do you mean to say that Islam came and corrected? So before Islam, there was no God. And that's what I mean to say, brother, there's a slight misunderstanding. Islam is not a new religion. Islam did not come into existence 1400 years back. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of Islam. Islam is there since time immemorial. It is there since man set foot on the earth. And Prophet Muhammad is not the founder of the religion of Islam. He is the last and final messenger. So before Hinduism came into existence, Islam was there. And Allah clearly says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 19, 
in the deen in the lail islam the only religion acceptable in the sight of allah is islam and the message is repeated in surah al imran chapter 3 verse 85 that if anyone takes any other religion besides islam it will never be accepted of him he'll be among the loser meaning there is only one religion islam the first prophet was prophet adam peace be upon him many other prophets came our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there were 124000 messengers sent on the face of the earth by name we know only 25 in the quran adam abraham noah moses jesus muhammad peace be upon them all now by name i know 25 only in the quran you may tell me that don't you believe in ram don't you believe in krishna i say i don't know what the prophets of god i say i don't know maybe they were maybe they were not maybe they were maybe they were not because they are not mentioned in the quran i don't know maybe they were maybe they were not but all the messengers that came before the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him they were sent only for those people in that time their message was time bound but because prophet muhammad peace be upon him is the last and final messenger his message was not meant only for the muslims or the arabs it is meant for the whole of humanity that's why quran says in surah anbiya chapter number 21 verse number 107 wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmat lil alamin that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to all the creatures as a mercy to all the worlds as a mercy to all the human beings similarly all the scriptures that came before my name only four are mentioned in the quran Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. But Quran says in Surah Rod, chapter number thirteen, verse number thirty-eight, the Kulli Ajlin Kitab. In every age, I've been sent a revelation. There were many books sent. I don't know my name. You ask me, can you call Veda the word of God? Maybe, maybe not. But even if it's the word of God, all the scriptures that came before the Quran, they were meant only for those people in that time. Now, because there was time bound, Almighty God did not think it fit to preserve it. Now, because Quran is the last and final revelation, Quran, when it was revealed about 14 years back, it was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs; it was sent for the whole of humanity. Quran says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter 14, verse number one; in Surah Ibrahim, chapter 14, verse 52; in Surah Baqarah, chapter two, verse number 85; in Surah Zumur, chapter 39, verse 41, that the Quran was sent for the whole of humanity. It was not sent only for the Muslims and Arabs. So today, no, but I think we are not talking about the humanity; we are talking about the Islam. That Islam is totally denying the fact that there is no God except Allah. Correct. What, what I am trying to say outright here is like just you just told me that it is written in Quran that may not be written in Quran or it is not written in Quran that there were some ways there were some scriptures written or not. So it means there was a mistake by the writers or uh, by the scholars or scriptures of the Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism that they did not mention that there is some God existing. Very good question. What I am telling you, if you heard my answer correctly. you will understand i said all the scriptures that came before because they were not meant to be followed till eternity god did not think it fit to preserve it if you heard my answer there were many scriptures by name i know only four but because they are not supposed to be followed today why should i do research on it by this you are meaning that there was no ramayan there was no mahabharat brother you have not no, heard me no i am asking you something i am telling you there were many scriptures no but like now also it has been proved geographically that there was uh, like uh, proofs getting down that there was ramayan there was that uh, pulls setus and what you have heard also okay about. you want to know about so, ramayan i no, can no, tell you no no it has been ramayan. proved I, i mean to say i will tell you the proof I now i mean to say like why now you are asking me a question that god i am giving you information now You are talking about Ramayan and Mahabharat. I don't know what your knowledge is about Ramayan and Mahabharat. I am asked how many types of Ramayan are there? No, I really don't know about that. You don't that, know. I just know the basic version of the Ramayan. You know, I tell you. We have heard of it and we have seen. I will tell you, brother. According to Ramanuja, who is a great scholar of Ramayan, he says there are more than three hundred different types of Ramayan. Okay. Three hundred different types. Which one do you follow? No, I mean the basic, the base, basic characteristics. The basic, Quran, the Quran, Quran, only one. There may be sects. They may call themselves Shia, Sunni, and if so are you are you only Quran is one. So are you openly or behind the stage or behind the curtain trying to denying the fact that hmm. there is no God except Allah? Not denying the fact, telling the fact that there was no God besides Allah. There is no God besides Allah. There will not be a God besides Allah. <laughs> I think there is a final answer to me. I have taken from you. Thank you very much. But but coming to your question. Coming to your question, 
you fail to realize that islam is not a new religion islam no, is no, i have my due uh, respect to the quran to the religion islam Correct. religion there is no doubt about the quran there is no doubt about the uh, holy messenger and everything else what i'm my only concern before the start at the end of the session the only concern was are we denying the fact that there is no god except allah so you are totally saying that there is uh, hindus have no lords no, no. no even hinduism says the same thing brother That's what I'm saying. even hinduism says na tasya patima asti of that god there is no image we but, cannot challenge but the sentiments you, of the millions of hindus not challenge by challenging the sentiment if you are going against the instruction of your creator you are not obeying him you cannot say i am sentimental therefore i am to kill anyone i am sentimental i am to insult anyone no, you are insulting god but instructor never told us also this thing that you cannot uh, uh play me by creating my idol or something it like that this is, this is the internal sentiment of the uh, not uh, internal follower. it is mentioned in yajur ved chapter number 32 verse number 3 what don't make a image of almighty god and you're making so you're going against the commandment of your scripture not my scripture your but, scripture but what i'm trying to tell you that if you call yourself a hindu which hindu a hindu who believes in vedas a hindu believes in mahabharat you are talking about scientific thing if i talk about scientific thing do you know mahabharat mahabharat was a story told by the grandfather of arjun initially mahabharat contained only 8000 shlokas later on it contained 24000 shlokas today it contains more than 100000 where did it come from moment the story was told generation down generation everyone kept on adding their family members as heroes so today scholars say the original mahabharat which was a story told of the feud between two families pandavas and kauravas was 8000 verses today it's 100000 where did the 92000 come from no i think we swayed away from what we were discussing not swayed away so therefore this mahabharat has got interpolation not me the hindu scholar say that the hindu scholars if you read they say it's a interpolation not dr zakir i read their books but i'm enlightening you your pandit may not be telling you and what i'm telling you you're talking mahabharat you know kurukshetra do you know where kurukshetra is today yeah do you know how big it is yeah how big your mahabharat tells that there are akshohoni when he started from morning till night he was keeping on riding the chariot there was 18 akshohoni each akshohoni contains about 100000 elephants and few hundred thousand horses you know the kurukshetra is so small where can it fit suppose i tell you in this hall 1 million people came for my lecture you will tell dr zakir nag is a fool i think that brother, kurukshetra has brother, been geographically uh, taken the name of kurukshetra now brother, that time the whole area was called as kurukshetra so brother, i think, have you read mahabharat i have not read but i have heard of it so this is the problem you have heard i have read i am giving you reference i am a person who is a medical doctor i am telling you brother you have diabetes don't touch sugar but i've heard some way having sugar is good for diabetes i said brother no i was I'm giving you answer for what just you you said that 1 million horses cannot be bounded in this small arena or whatever i said not horses not horses audience audience horses don't come to listen to my lecture i'm sorry everybody else otherwise you are calling the audience horses no 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 my answer was to you like that time the kurukshetra was not defined as an area it was defined It is, it is defined in the Mahabharat. The area is defined. The boundaries are given. Today, if you if no. you find out, not bound even in the scriptures, the scripture says what it is. Krishna I mean, script. Yes, yeah, geographical location. Scripture says what was Lanka. Fifty miles away from my home. Home. home from home. your home, but do you know your scripture? Your scripture is miles away from your mind. Yes, I think we are swaying off from what you are just saying. not swaying i'm telling you scientifically if you do research you come to know there is so much of concoction there is so much of interpolation i am not here to criticize the scripture now because you're talking about scientific proof and logic i'm coming to that no, that's it, what I'm the more you speak about science just to say my only concern was like if you also believe that before islam there were scriptures there before were islam, god, there were god mentioned in it there was everything mentioned in it then the, why are we denying it today that there is no god except brother, allah my question to you is islam is there since time memorial so where is the question of before islam no before islam there were no human being when human being came islam was there so where is the question of thing before islam I, I, I think this is the so your I, so your knowledge of islam is less you may think islam came into existence 1400 years back you know hinduism hindu scriptures the scholars say majority say hindu scriptures came into existence 4000 years back islam did not come 4000 years back 
Islam is there since time immemorial. We don't know how many years. Millions and millions of years. So for you to say before Islam, before also there was no God but Allah, today also there is no God but Allah, even after millions and billions of years afterwards, there will be no God but Allah. This it is just a matter of belief among all the religions. Bil so as I all the religions, including, including Hinduism, this is the belief. Including Christianity, this is the belief. Including Islam, this is the belief. Including Hinduism, this is the belief that the God is one. I never say that there is no God except Lord Shiva or Lord Ram. That was my concern. Thank you very much. Lord Shiva is avatar. If you say messenger, I've got no problem. But the moment you say God, Lord Shiva is a different God, Krishna is a different God, Ram is a different God, that means you're going against your scriptures saying that ikkam evidityam, God is only one without a second. So what I realize, your knowledge, because being limited, you are telling me as a medical doctor, if I'm telling you, you have diabetes, there's problem in your pancreas, etc. have less sugar. No, 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 I have read, you know, sugar is good for energy, calories. Are bhai, it is poison for you. No, no, no. I say, what can I do? Now, I think the debate on this can go on for the night long, so I won't take much of your time. Thank you very much for your so kind answer. And I pray to Allah to guide you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the next question from the uh, mic for the sisters. The sister is also very shy. She just doesn't want to come in front or ask it herself. She says her question is about will of Allah. She says, I keep hearing everything is the will of Allah. Whatever happens is the will of Allah. And they say that everything is written already. So then where is the freedom of choice? When Allah gave me freedom of choice, whatever I do, if anything happens, they say, oh, this was written and it's the will of Allah. And if you could explain if there is so much, everything is written down, then what is my freedom of choice? Sisters asked a very good question, very important question. That if everything is the will of Allah, then where is this freedom of choice? And this is a question not only asked by non-Muslims, even asked by Muslims. It's talking about Qadr. That if it is mentioned in destiny, that I'm going to rob. And if I rob, who's to blame? Allah is to blame. If it is mentioned in my destiny, I'm going to commit murder. And I commit murder. Who's to blame? Allah is to blame. So where is the free will? So if it is the will of Allah, or if it is mentioned in the destiny, I'm joining both together, then where is the free will? The reply to this question is, it's compulsory that every Muslim should believe in Qadr. But you should understand what is the meaning of destiny. For example, if suppose in a classroom, there are 100 students, and when the teacher teaches the students in the classroom, at the end of the year, before the examination, the teacher predicts that this student, he will come out first class first. This student, he'll get second class. This student, he will fail. The teacher predicts why? He knows that this student is very studious, always does homework, does extra studies. This average student, second class. That student goes for movies, doesn't do homework, misses the class, predicts that that student will fail. Now, once the examination takes place, after the results come out, this student gets first class first, this student gets second class, that student fails. I am asking you a question. Can the student who has failed, can he blame the teacher that because we have predicted I will fail, I have failed? Who's to blame, the student or the teacher? Who's to blame, the student or the teacher? The student. The teacher predicted. Who's to blame the student? He did not study, he did not do his homework, he used to go for extra movies. So similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the human being the free will. Allah has told you what is right, what is wrong, but the choice is yours. For example, if you come at a crossroad, there are four roads, A, B, C, D. You can choose any. You choose road C. So Allah knows in advance that when you come at crossroad, you will choose road C. So Allah writes, when the person comes at the crossroad, he will choose road C. So it is not because Allah is writing that you are choosing, because you will be choosing Allah is writing. It is not because Allah is writing that you are choosing road C. It is because you will be choosing road C. Allah has ilme gab. He has knowledge of the future. He writes in advance. Now after you choose road C, you come at another crossroad, five roads, one, two, three, four, five. Like after you pass the 12th standard, you can become engineer, you can become doctor, you can become businessman. You choose to become a businessman. Choice is yours. 
but Allah knows in advance that after you pass standard 12th, you will choose to become a businessman. It is not because Allah is writing that you're becoming a businessman. Because you wanted to become a businessman, Allah is writing in advance. And what you understand here, that if Allah wants, He can easily change it. For example, if in a classroom, in the mathematics examination, the teacher gives the paper 2 plus 2 is equal to how much? Now why is she supervising the student writes 2 plus 2 is equal to 5? The teacher will not correct, the teacher can correct. But if the teacher corrects, you will say the teacher is unjust. If teacher says don't write 5, write 4. All the other students will say this is an examination. Why are you interfering? So if Allah wants, He can change. But because He has given you free will, He is letting you take your decision. So this life is a test for the year after. As Allah says in Surah Mul chapter 6 and verse number 2, Allahi khalakal mauta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. So this life is a test for the year after. Allah has given you and shown you the rules, what is good, what is bad. Then He's given you a free will. It is your choice. Allah does not interfere in your free will. He can if He wants. The Quran says, not even a leaf can fall without the permission of Allah. So whatever happens, happens with Allah's free will, but the decision is yours. And based on that, you will be rewarded or punished. Hope that answers the question. We'll have the next question from the brothers Mike in the center. Hello, doctor. Uh, my question pertains to the point you're talking about. My name is Naresh. And my question pertains to the point that you were making about intoxicants, small intoxicants, like you have in small quantities or big quantities, it's the same thing. It is an intoxicant. So how does it boil down to like smoking? Like it's a small intoxicant, like whatever high you have, it's for like five seconds, 10 seconds. How do I convince a Muslim friend of mine who says that's a gray area? There's nothing like, uh, it's not permitted, but it's not uh, banned or it's not uh, totally not allowed as such. MashaAllah, our non-Muslim friend Naresh wants to convince his Muslim friend uh, that smoke as, well. as far as smoking is concerned, he said what intoxicates in large quantity is prohibited in small quantity that's the hadith of Bilal Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sunnah Ibn Majah, volume number four in the book of intoxication. Book number 30, hadith number 3392. But this, as far as smoking is concerned, all type of smoking is not intoxicants. But I know ganja, charas is intoxicant. So that falls in the intoxicants. But if it is not intoxicating, previously there was a fatwa amongst the shuks. There's a hadith which says that don't have onions because it smells. So when you go for salah, don't have onions, it has got bad breath. So based on that hadith, people used to say that smoking is makhru because it smells. Because of lack of knowledge of science. Today, we have come to know that tobacco in any form, smoking, chewing, etc., is the second largest cause of death. The first largest cause of death is alcoholism. Several millions of people die every year. It is the single largest cause of death more than terrorism, more than war. Every year, millions of people die. The second largest cause of death is tobacco. According to World Health Organization, every year, more than 4 million people die only because of tobacco. Now, based on this, there's a verse of the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 195, which says, do not make your own hands the cause of your own destruction. That means committing suicide or causing self-loss is prohibited. So based on this verse, today we come to know smoking is nothing but slow poisoning. So based on this verse today, there are more than 400 different fatwas from different parts of the world that smoking is haram, tobacco is haram. Only in India where I come from, there the scholars say makru, because many have tobacco, so they say makru. But today, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, many parts of the world, there are more than 400 fatwas saying that smoking and tobacco in any form, nicotine is haram. So Islamically today, smoking is haram based on the verse of the Quran, Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 195, do not make your own hands the cause of your destruction. So tell this to your friend, give the reference of the Quran, inshallah he'll be convinced if he's a good Muslim. We'll have the next question from the brother's mic. Uh, just one question I have. You told me, we heard about uh, that the Vedas say that don't make any images of the God, yeah? Whoever worships anything uh, which has been created throws himself in darkness, right? The difference between Bhagwan 
and Allah is that Allah says that if you worship anyone apart from me, I will punish you forever and ever and I will not spare you of this sin. But nowhere in Hinduism's books would you see that Bhagwan is saying that if you worship anything apart from me, you will be put in Narak, which is uh, the Hindi word for uh, hell, forever and ever. Now, what, why I'm saying that to you is the concept of God in Islam, Christianity and Judaism is the same in which he feels bad if anyone worships anything else apart from him. But the concept of the other side of the religions, which is Hinduism, Buddhism or those sides, the concept of God there, I think, is more, the God of those religions is more large-hearted because he doesn't say to you that I'm going to put you in hell if you don't worship me. Although, although I understand that it is wrong to worship idols, it is wrong to worship created things. But I do feel that because that, uh, I, I somehow feel that, you know, basically God, there is nothing like him, right? So why in the Quran or the Bible or the Jews scripture, we are attributing a human uh, feeling to God that, let us say, my father gives me everything. He gives me all the money and I give that money to the poor people, right? Now, one day, if I forget my father, yeah, so my father will feel bad. But this is a human nature. God is more large-hearted than that. Even if I don't worship him, he should have no problems. You know, he should not put me to hell because that's egoistic. Egoism is a part of human nature, not of God, is I what know. I feel, according to my... Uh, Understanding. Rules. Brother Rahul is an old friend of mine, mashallah. Whenever I come to Dubai, no question answer session goes without him asking a question. He's following me since many years. When I came in 2005, when I came last year, and yesterday night, we had a good session for a couple of hours. And though he didn't mention his name, he's Rahul, mashallah. And we pray that may Allah guide him. Inshallah, may Allah give hidayah. And he asks very good questions. Always difficult questions. Very good questions. I like it. It's a challenge for me. He asked me new question. I like challenges. And always I say he asked a good question. This and is I one of my last questions, sir. Uh, one of my last questions. Last question before you accept Islam. One of my last questions. <laughs> before you accept Islam. Clarify this. Uh, it just struck me. Actually, I was... He told me he will not accept Islam in public. So I don't know problem. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Will so you I'll, clarify me on this? I'll clarify with you. And I won't ask you to accept Islam in public. We have done that yesterday. Sir, Islam is a glorious religion and I am, it's given me a lot of peace and I can say many good things about it, but please clarify. And you told, else. I'll clarify. You told me you have spent more time studying Islam than what you spend time in getting your degree of engineering. It is right. Yes. That's right. And I enjoy it more. Therefore, I enjoy your questions also. The brother asked a very good question, very attacking, very tricky, difficult question that he understands that all the religions, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, say there's no God except one God, don't make images, don't make ideas, but Islam goes a step further. He will forgive any other sin except the sin of shirk. Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48, Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116. But in Hinduism, nowhere does it say that if you do shirk, Allah will not forgive you. Before I ask you a question about large-heartedness, Nowhere does the Quran say that if you commit a murder, Allah will not forgive you. Brother, nowhere does the Quran say that if you commit murder, Allah will not forgive you. Does it mean that I will go and commit murder? Brother. Repeat again, sorry. Nowhere does the Quran say that if you commit murder, though it is the second largest sin in Islam, in the major sins, number two is committing murder of an innocent human being. Yes. After shirk is murder. Though the Quran says in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse 32 that if anyone kills any innocent human being, unless it be for murder or for creating corruption in the land, it is as though you have killed all of humanity. But nowhere does the Quran say that if you commit murder, Allah will not forgive you. Allah will never forgive you. Does it mean that I will go and commit murder? No. Yeah, enough. Same way when the Vedas don't mention that if you don't do shirk, Allah will not forgive you, you should not do shirk. I understand, I understand. Very good. You are an understanding person. I'll come to the large-hearted one afterwards. 
I haven't answered your full question. I'm only answered the first part of your first question. I'll come to your last heartedness afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll come to it. That's fine. Yeah. But I like, you know, cutting down the questions so that you understand better. Yes. Or if you understand, the other people also should understand. You know, you're an intelligent person, I you know that. Sure. MashaAllah, engineer done from UK. That's what he told me yesterday. Now, coming to your part of large heartedness. Yeah. That in Islam, if you don't do this, I'll punish you. That is a human nature. That if the father gives money to the son, son gives in charity, tomorrow the son doesn't ask about the father, so father feels bad. It's human nature. I agree with you. God is far superior. I agree with you. Yes. So why does God feel bad? Yes. Very good question. Very intelligent question. Inshallah, you'll get convinced. I won't ask you to accept Islam in public. Oh, sure. <laughs> that we have done that yesterday. Yes. The Quran says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require you, you require him. Now coming to the question. Now I'm making your question more easy. Mm -hmm. Why we have to say Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest? Allah asks you to say Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest. Tomorrow if you don't say Allah is the greatest, do you think Allah will become less? No. No. Yeah. Whether you say or not, Allah is already the greatest. Irrespective whether you say or not, it will make no difference, not even an iota or difference. He is already the greatest. He will remain irrespective whether you say or not. Why does he ask you to say that is the question. The question is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the human psychology. For example, your mother has a heart attack. And now, you have heard of a very famous heart specialist in the world. If you know he's famous, he will give you some advice for your mother. Another person who's unknown, he comes and gives you advice. Whose advice will you follow? Uh, repeat again, sorry. Uh, if? if your mother has a heart attack. Yeah. There's a person who you know is the most famous heart specialist yeah, in the world. I would follow the advice of the specialist. Why? Because you know he's number one, he's most famous. Yeah. So the reason Allah asks you to praise him is not for his benefit, it's for your benefit. Because the moment you praise Allah, you will follow his advice. Agreed. By following his advice, Allah will not benefit, you will benefit. Yes. By the doctor giving advice to you, he will not benefit. Yes, you may give him fees, so that way he'll benefit. You aren't giving any fees to Allah. Yes. So Allah doesn't benefit anything. But at the moment you praise him, it is human. When you say, Allah is the most wise, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the most merciful. Most wise, ah, he gives advice, I'll follow. Most greatest, I'll follow him. Most merciful, I'll follow him. So you say all these praises not to benefit him, to benefit yourself. Agreed. Yes. So when you worship him, mm -hmm. it does not benefit him, it benefits you. Yes. When you follow the advice of the doctor, mm -hmm. it will benefit if you give him fees. Yes. yes. You don't give any fees to Allah. Yes. It benefits you. Yes. So same way, Allah is large hearted. Yes. By punishing you, hmm. do you think he will benefit? No. By punishing, he becomes a... Uh, I'm is the... com coming to it, Brother Rahul. Yeah, yeah. Let yeah. me complete my answer. Sure, sure. Yeah. By punishing you, he will not benefit. But he is giving you a fear. Why? If you have alcohol, he will punish you. If you have drugs, he'll punish you. Whether you have drugs or what difference does it make to him? No, if he says, okay, don't have drugs. But if you have drugs, I will not punish you. Then will you have drugs or not? You will have. If I give an examination, write two. No, I won't have. If I if I'm convinced it's wrong for me, I won't have. Ah. I don't need that fear of the hell. Okay. The fear of the hell I had to be put in my mind. Yes. To yes. avert me. God convinces people in different ways. Some people with reason and logic. You are a logical person. You're convinced with logic. Some people want fear. Some yeah. people want punishment. Some people want reward. There are three, four types of ways which Allah speaks. You get convinced with reason, logic. You're like me. Yeah. You're like me. Yes, yes. Some people, they are not convinced reason logic. Ah, leave logic. Ha, ah, I'll get reward. I'll do it. I'll get punishment. I'll stay away. So it's... But what is it? Reality? Does it... Is the fear... Is, is it reality? Yes. Yes. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Reality is that the hellfire is there. And the punishment is there. Brother, right? let, let me complete the answer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, will you allow me to complete the answer or you'll... Yes, please. Let me complete. I'll give you a chance. Ji, ji. I'll give you a chance to say that you're convinced. Yes. But before I complete my answer, you're interjecting. Sure, sure. Yes, please. After I complete, I'll give you a chance and ask you. Sure, yeah. Now, there's a teacher taking an examination. Two plus two is how much? Four. Convinced. Now, 
there are some people, the teacher says, okay, now in the examination, those who write correctly will get plus point, will pass. Those who don't write correctly will fail. Now, when the teacher is telling hundreds of things, it's difficult for everyone to remember. But if you have what you remember, you write. If you write correct, I'll pass you. If you write wrong, I'll fail you. So now the student starts memorizing. He starts like you passed your engineering. You are afraid of failing. Yes. If you wouldn't have studied, you would have failed. So the teacher says, no problem. Even if you write wrong, I will give you part degree. Will you study? No. Ah, mm -hmm. though you're logical, yeah. you understand Boyle's law, you understand trigonometry, you understand chemistry, but to remember, you have to stay awake, you have to slog. Teacher says, no problem, you understood? You write in the examination, right or wrong, two plus two is three, I will pass you. Will you study? Well, it depends. I won't, but probably someone who is more sensible I'm would study you. to learn some knowledge. Correct. If the teacher says, now your aim is to get the degree. Yeah. Once you understand, if you fail, if you fail, you won't get the degree. Yeah. So here, Almighty God speaks logically. Some people, logically, it doesn't make a difference whether hellfire is or heaven is there. Other people, you do it, you get a reward. Like when you speak to your child, sometimes you speak logically, sometimes you say, you know, I'll give you a chocolate. Yes. Sometimes, ek lafa marunga. Yeah, yeah. I will yeah. give you one slap. Yeah. So yeah. this is what God knows the psychology of the human being. He's our creator. Sometimes logic, sometimes reasoning, sometimes reward, sometimes punishment. But once he says he has to follow, he can't lie. Once he says, he has to follow. So he's trying to convince you, suppose your son. Yeah, yeah. I know you're not married. Yeah. I know you're not married. Inshallah, one day when you get married, and if your son. Yes. And your son, inshallah, I'll marry a Muslim, inshallah. Yes, inshallah. <laughs> so your son, when you have a son, yeah. five years old, he wants to jump from 10th floor. You say, my son, don't jump, you'll die. I want to jump. You know, you will die. No problem, I want to jump. One slap you'll give him, right or wrong? Yes. You'll tell him, I'll slap you. Yes. Yet if he wants to jump, you'll slap him. A yes. father is cruel to be kind. Is your intention to hurt him? No. Your intention is to hurt him literally so that he prevents from the bigger hurt. Yes. So here if he says, no, no, I'm only acting. Maybe for a little time you'll think I'll punish you and you don't punish him. But if he wants to jump, you'll not wait till he jumps. You will give him one tight slap. The same way God here, he tells you this is good, this is bad, this is reward, this is punishment. And once he says something, he's honest. In Islam, God is the most kind. He wants the human being to improve. The other God, okay, no problem. Even if you write wrong, I'll pass you. What kind of a teacher is this? Suppose tomorrow, there's a student studying with you. He writes wrong answers. You slog. You stay awake in the night. This person plays hooky, enjoys, writes everything wrong. And the teacher says, both get first class first. Will you be happy with the teacher? No. Why? You are a very unkind person. Mm. Very cruel. Mm. Unkind. Not a good human being. Mm. I am wrong. Because you believe in justice. So besides God being kind and merciful, he's also just. Imagine someone rapes your sister, rapes your mother. God says, no problem, I'll forgive. On the day of judgment, won't you tell God? Why no, no, did that's okay. no, that's okay. I'm, I'm talking about wait, God wait. being egoistic on his own He's self. He's not egoistic at all. No, but he's saying if you, makes... if you do shirk, then I will put you in hellfire forever and ever. I'm not saying no, no. that he should not punish wrong deeds. But he is putting on his own self that if you associate partners with me, Along with worshipping me, if you worship someone else, even then I will not forgive you. That's the right thing. That's, because that's if, egoism. If the doctor says, yes. if suppose the heart specialist tells your mother, see this is a good thing, have only this medicine, nothing else. Someone else says, okay, have this medicine also. So that heart specialist tells you, if you mix it with something else, your mother will die. So will you listen to somebody else or not? Will you listen or not? Art specialist saying, don't have anything else except this sorbit rate. Keep it below your tongue. Yes. Now another doctor comes, you know, I'm a very good doctor. You don't know him also. Mm. Will I you listen, listen to heart specialist? Correct. Yes. Heart specialist specialized, but God is a big heart specialist. So heart specialist you want to follow. You don't want to follow your creator who's created your heart. What no, no, kind no, of no, a... No, 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 sir, wait, sir. Wait, 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 wait. Let me complete. Yes. 
let me complete yes 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 so you being logical yeah when you want to follow the heart specialist when the heart specialist tell you don't listen to anyone else because they have told you the total truth that heart specialist can be wrong because he's a human being almighty god when he says do not worship anyone else besides me he knows that if you think somebody else is also the greatest hmm. and if you follow and follow something wrong it will harm you god does not want to see to it that his creation is a harm he is going out of the way to give you an ultimate warning other sins maybe i will forgive hmm. that is one type of murder is one type of sin very wrong second largest but one if you worship somebody else you can do anything you can start murdering you can start having drug you can start raping too dangerous hmm. this is the guidance it is complete because he is the creator he knows no one else is the creator now someone else tries to behave like a creator when god knows no one else can create you it is very dangerous that's the reason he says that following advice worshiping anyone obeying anyone as the creator not obeying normally normally on obey a father no problem obey a mother no problem going against the commandments of almighty god worshiping that is what, we, that is what i'm trying to find out is that the right god who is saying that if you associated partners with me i will never forgive this sin you are taking it's a catch 22 i am questioning whether a god who thinks like that is that the correct god correct god you are saying you Suppose, are saying he is the correct god hence why? he knows why 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 yeah. i have checked up with science this quran passes yeah. the test when i put science to your hindu scriptures it fails yeah. when i put science to bible it fails mm. so even if i agree with you with my earlier question mm. maybe this is ambiguous fine mm. 80% is proved to be 100% correct 20% mm. is ambiguous inshallah logically even this will be right if i have to put that way but the other way if a doctor who solid stronger argument would be that 100% is correct 100% of it is proved that it is correct if 20% ambiguous is there i tell you one thing brother your mind hasn't reached that level my mind hasn't reached that level right the science hasn't reached that level maybe 100 years after 1000 years after it will be proved 100% correct we are limited the problem is in you and me not in the quran similarly but a person who is very powerful a person who is a heart specialist he knows this stuff very well he'll be sure do this nothing else a person who's not sure okay have this medicine also have that medicine also so person who's cock sure of himself like the creator almighty god he will give this commandment now he's cock sure you are not cock sure about him that is the creator yes. once you're cock sure you'll follow i'm cock sure that this is the word of almighty god you aren't yes so once your research gets complete yes You know very well that the other scriptures don't pass the test. Yes. I challenge you to get any scripture that you know of which is even close to the Quran. No, this is the strongest scripture that I have. Uh, that's so, for sure. So when you know, yeah, I can't ask you to accept because you know we spoke yesterday. Right. Okay. But when you know it is the thing, then the ego is in you, not in Almighty God. The ego no, is in you. <laughs> I don't have ego. And I pray to I, Almighty I God. I told you all the ones I have I, read. This is the strongest. I yeah? pray to Almighty God. You know because I love you, Rahul. Yes, I love you too. I love you. That's the reason I pray to Almighty God to give Hida. You don't have to proclaim. You asked me yesterday. Do I have to proclaim? I said no. You don't have to proclaim. Yeah. So I think that you are a person who submits your will to God, and may God guide you, yeah. and may you get a good submitting Muslim life partner. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The next question was due to go to the brother so we'll have the next question from the front mic. Good evening Dr. Nayak uh, this is Sanjay Thakkar here. First of all with all due respect to all my Muslim brothers and sisters here before I ask my questions I'd like to ask your kind make a statement first. You see religion goes beyond in you know, a supremacy or declaring supremacy over other religion. Uh, you know it, it's more about looking because you know God is omnipresent. you know there is god in you there is god in him there is god in him there is god in everybody if we look for if we have that that vision tunnel vision having said that religion is more about tolerance peace love and humility and humanity having said that uh, i beg to differ about your last statements proclaiming that uh, you know the other scriptures have failed the test now again this could be a debate that could go on for hours and we have limitations on time So I will I'll just rest with two questions. My first question to you doctor is 
uh, you know, Islam and, and the Quran condemns idol worship. Yet, in the Kaaba, people... Now, you had mentioned that one of the 20 misconceptions, first 13 that you had covered, I wasn't here at that time, so no I missed it. So that's my first question. My second One question, question at a time, please. No problem. Actually, no it's, it's, Go ahead. it's correlated, okay. sort no of. No problem. Yes. Yeah. yes, brother. My second question for you is, you know... I'm large-hearted. <laughs> Tolerant. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Very kind of you. Uh, my second question to you is, you know, the concept of um, Azan. You know, from what I understand, the concept of Azan came many, many decades or centuries back when there was no clock. There were no, uh, you know, way to actually decide what time of the day it is. And, and the only way people would realize that it's this time of the day for this prayer was based on Azan. Now, obviously, that's not the case now. You know, <laughs> we have clocks and we have... So then why is there Azan five times a day, even in this day and age? These are my two questions. Brother, last two questions. Before he asked these two questions, he made some comments. I made a statement, not comments. It was, it was, it was a you know conclusive statement. Do that you think the statement and comments are contradicting? Uh, well, it was a it's conclusive a statement which could be challenging your yes, your yes. your Therefore statement. Therefore, I said you made a comment or you made a statement or you made a challenge. No problem. Yeah, take it whatever you <laughs> you would like. You <laughs> want to get challenge? No problem. You said that Zakir while talking about other thing, you should be more tolerant, etc. And he said that I mentioned earlier that all the scriptures besides the Quran have failed the test. Failed the test of science. Complete my sentence, not the halfway. When you put the test of science, not the test of emotion. So you, you quoted me half. I said, if you test, put all the other scriptures the test of scientific facts. All the scriptures have failed except the Quran. You told me we can have a debate fast together. I am not here. I can rattle off verses from the Vedas. And from the Hindu scripture with unscientific, I don't want to do it. If you want to see, you can see my debate with Dr. William Campbell talking about Bible and Quran. Why I did that? He wrote a book saying there are 30 scientific errors in the Quran. And for eight years, no Muslim replied. I went to Chicago. I had a dialogue. I answered all his questions. And I posted 38 scientific errors in the Bible. He could not reply to one. I have had debates with many of your scholars, not you, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar, many, said to be number one in the world. Now, when I spoke in with them and they could not reply, now you are telling I'm wrong. No, I'm not, I didn't say you're wrong. You said you can have a debate for five hours. I'm not interested. When I had the debate with the best and they could not last for half an hour, do you think I'm a fool to have a debate with you for five hours? Well, Limitation of time. You're, you're yes. prejudging my yes. intelligence. I'm not prejudging. Many people, they tell me, Dr. Zakir Naik, we want to debate with you. You're not the only one. Many people. You know what I tell them? If you want to debate with me, you should have a following. If you can get 10,000 people minimum. Yeah, there are about 20,000. Someone told me. Now, if you can get 10,000 people for your talk, you are worth debating. I'm not judging intelligence. If you're a person who has a following, I don't want to make you famous. If I have a debate with you, you'll be seen by 100 million people. You know that? Now, let me complete my answer. What I tell any non-Muslim, many hundreds of non-Muslims want to debate with me. I tell them, there are hundreds of Hindus who I know, hundreds of Christians who I know. When they speak, they have more than 10,000 people for the audience. Shri Shri Ravi Shankar, Ramdeva Baba, Christians, Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, Morris Firello, Many in all these people, they have 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 for the gathering. You convince them and give your material to them. Let them debate me. They will never take your material knowing very well. It will not stand the test. These are scholars of your religion. What I tell you, if you really feel you have strong material and you really think you have intelligence, give this material to your Hindu who you consider to be best. Okay. And who has a following. If you say, I want to debate with you, I used to do that earlier. Now, anyone, whether good, bad, ugly, whether he's intelligent or not, if he can gather 10,000 people, that means he has a following. He's not doing it for fame. And then we will have a public dialogue. For you, you can have a dialogue with my student. When you're coming to Bombay, tell me. I've got hundreds of students. Fair many. Enough. 
Fair enough. You know, we have students in our school. We have many people, and they love it. So the list goes. You want to debate? Come to Bombay. Give me the time. One, two, three, four. We have many. Fair enough. Hey, right? may I have, may wait, I have wait, the wait, answers wait, wait, to wait, my questions? I'm coming. I'm coming. Thank you. But because you made a challenge before, the challenge is more important than the answer. The answers I've already given many times. I'll come to it. So there, this is your assumption. This is what I say. I'm not here to criticize it unless someone forces me to. That I said because Rahul was arguing so much. That's why I said. Otherwise, in my talk, I'm not here to criticize any religion. Thank you. I'm That's what I wanted to hear. That's what I wanted to hear from you. Because and, see, but religion but it, is beyond criticism. It's beyond. But you have to call a spade a spade. If you say, why is the teacher saying two plus two is three is wrong? That teacher criticizes. Are you not criticizing? If someone is forcing, no, I'm right. Two plus two is three. Two plus two is three. You see, just because somebody else's perspective does not agree with yours, because he's following a different religion or sect, no religion. Two does, plus does two does not mean that that person is wrong. Two plus two is equal to four is a universal fact. Now, someone comes from the village and tells me two plus two is three. Me pyar se bolunga. I'll tell him with love. But if he insists, I say no, brother, it's enough. So because I'm in this field, Alhamdulillah. I'm not here to criticize, but someone forces me to criticize. Okay, give me one example of one scientific thing. I can give you. I don't want to hurt the other Hindus. I want to win them over. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fussilat, chapter 41, verse number 34, that you get them closer with love. Win your enemy, don't defeat them. So all these people, I'm winning them over. I'm not defeating them. Neither do I want to defeat you. I want to win you, brother. Well, I, I guess if one way Inshallah, win, I will win you with your two answers. One way to win somebody is through humility. And you have reached that stage where, you know, as a person grows larger than life, yes. he becomes more humble. Correct. For you and to say that I would not challenge you, I mean, you no, know. No, but once you reach a stage, if that is causing loss, Allah also says, I'll put you in hell. He is much higher than me, infinite time. But that does not mean you should go against the message. Humility doesn't mean that me being humble to you, I'm giving a wrong signal to millions of people. Then it will be injustice. I can't be humble. Okay, two plus two is three. Very good, son. Other thousand people will start calculating two plus two is three because Zakir has said. That's not humility. That is injustice, dishonesty. Right? Now coming to your questions. Thank you. The first question the brother asked is, which he said it comes in the first 13. It was the 11th most common question or misconception in the mind of the non-Muslim that if Islam is against idol worship, why do you bow down to the Kaaba when you offer Salah? No Muslim ever worships the Kaaba when you offer Salah. Kaaba is the Qibla. It is the direction. We Muslims, we believe in unity. Now when we offer Salah, suppose you want to offer Salah here. Some will say less faith, north. Some will say south. Some will say east. Some will say west. For unity, Allah says in the Quran Surah Baqarah that wherever you are, face towards the Kaaba. So Kaaba is the Qibla, it is the direction. So we are facing in that direction, but no one worships the Kaaba. Previously, the Muslims were the first people to do the world map. And Al Idrusi, 1154, he drew the world map. North Pole down, South Pole was on top. And Kaaba was in the center. The Western cartographers came and they turned the map upside down. North Pole top, South Pole down. Yet the Kaaba is in the center. So if you are in the north, you face towards the south. If you are in the south, you face towards the north. If you are in the east, you face towards the west. If in the west, you face towards the east. Kaaba is at the center. So we pray that as a Qibla, as a direction. No one worships it. Further, when we go for Umrah, or for pilgrimage, or for Hajj, we circumambulate on the Kaaba. You may ask that why do you circumambulate on the Kaaba? Why do you circle on the Kaaba? I do it because of the command from Almighty God and the Prophet. But the logical reason I can think is because every circle has only one center. So when we circumambulate around the Kaaba, logically I think we are testifying this one God. Furthermore, if yet you have doubts, if you read the Hadith that's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, in the book of Hajj, chapter 56, Hadith number 675, Hadith Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. He was the second caliph of Islam, second khalifa. He said that this black stone pointing at the Hajri Aswat, black stone, it can neither benefit me, it can neither harm me. 
just because my prophet kissed it, I'm kissing it. This statement that this black stone can neither harm anyone nor benefit anyone is sufficient to prove that the Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. Furthermore, at the time of the prophet, there were sahabas, there were companions of the prophet who stood on the Kaaba and gave the azan. No idol worshipper will ever stand on the idol and give the azan. Proving that no Muslim ever worshipped the Kaaba, it's only the Qibla, it's a direction. Coming to a second question. Hope you're convinced with the first question. Sure I am, thank you. Very good. 50% I won you over. Now next 50%. Your second question was, decades earlier, centuries earlier, there was no clock, no way to keep time. So we could justify that giving azan was right. Now everything is there, clock is there, time is there. So why do we have to give the azan? Very good question. The reason we give the azan is for many things. One thing is to tell everyone it is time. You tell me one thing. Everyone has the watch during examination. Yet the teacher rings the bell, time is up. So you tell the school teacher, why are you ringing the bell that the period is up? Everyone has the watch. To tell everyone, finish, time is up, next period. So today when we have the azan, you can have a big clock also, a big bell. But a prophet said, bell is not good. Therefore, in the Christian, you have bell. Some religion, you have the drum. The prophet said, no, this is not good. No drum, no bell. Someone suggested human voice. He liked it. So better than the drum, we have called human voice. And our azan has a message. The bell, sometimes the bell in the school has a message, period is up. Sometimes the bell has a message, period is starting. Sometimes the bell has a message, different message. That fire alarm, run away. You understand, no? Bell cannot speak. You read the bell, okay, fire is there, run away. In the azan, it has a message. It says, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Allah is the greatest. God is the greatest, four times. Ashhadu la ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulillah. That I bear witness, there's no God but Allah. He's calling out. I bear witness, there's no God but Allah. And Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Hail al salah, hail al salah. Come to salah, come to salah. Hail al falah, hail al falah. Come to success, come to success. He's giving you a message. God is the greatest, God is the greatest, God is the greatest, God is the greatest. Four times, there's no God but Allah. Prophet Muhammad is the messenger. Giving you a message that your messenger, Prophet Muhammad, you don't have to worship him. He is only a messenger. He is the servant of God. Five times we are reminded in the azan. Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He is not Allah. Come to salah. Come to prayers. Come to prayers. Come to success. Come to success. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. So it's a message telling you it is time for prayer. At the same time, testifying there's one God, it is a message. And the beauty of it is that whichever part of the world you go, it's only in Arabic. So if you, if you have in French, if you go to France, you don't understand French. You say, what is the person shouting? Is he abusing me? <laughs> so throughout the world, you have in Arabic. Even if I don't know Arabic, at least I know the translation of the Azan. So it is a reminder. In the morning salah, another reminder. It says, as salatu khairam in a norm. Prayer is better than sleep. As salatu khairam in a norm. Prayer, now when you hear, ah, prayer is better than sleep, so you get up. With the ghanta, I put the snooze on. You know snooze? Another 10 minutes. Another snooze, 10 minutes. Here, as salatu khairam in a norm. Only for the morning's azan. Prayer is better than sleep. So here it's a message. Even though you have watched, you don't keep on watching. So now, because we pray in congregation, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, there are no less than three hadith in Sahih Bukhari, which says that you get 25 times, 27 times more sawab when you pray in congregation. So the azan is reminding you that the congregation is going to start. So you know once the azan is given, within 20 minutes, the congregation will start. So you get ready, you do your wudu, you do your ablution, and you go to the mosque. If it is not there, and many a people don't know what is the time, it keeps on changing. I will not know what's the time for sunset today. Do you know, brother? Do you know the time for morning sunrise in Dubai? It changes every day. So what is it now you know? Not rough, rough. Most of the people here will have rough idea. So, though you are a scientific person, you have a watch. If the Adhan is there, ah, now it is time, I'll go for prayer. So even in the age of science and technology, it's a reminder. And besides the reminder, it's giving you a message. 
it's calling you towards the truth, it's calling you towards success. So that's the reason even 100 years, 1000 years back it was correct, even today it is correct, and even tomorrow it will be correct. Hope this convinces you. Thank you kindly. So at least in this question I won you over. Yes, you have. Thank Inshallah. you. Inshallah. And I pray to God to guide you and to guide me also. Thank you. The next question from the sister's mic. Yes, uh, my question is, as a Muslim wife, I know my duty is not to serve my husband's parents. But if his uh, mother is living with uh, us and she is heart patient and he's, when he's not around, what is my duty as a Muslim? Sister asked the question, I know it is not the duty of a Muslim woman to serve the parents of the husband. But if my mother-in-law is sick and if I take care of her, what is the ruling? Sister, you have a misunderstanding. Where does the Quran say that you cannot serve the parents of your husband? Where does the Quran say that? Is there any verse in the Quran? Is there any hadith that says the Prophet said that don't serve the parents of your husband? Where does it say that? This is a misconception. What you have to realize that there are many duties. It may not be awal fard for you to serve, but serving the parents of your husband is very good, alhamdulillah. And if your husband says you have to serve, you have to serve. What is the harm? You will get sawab. So there's no question saying that as a Muslimah, you should not serve the parents. In fact, if you serve, you will be a very good wife. And inshallah, your husband would be kinder to you and you will earn more sawab. So if your mother-in-law is sick, inshallah, my advice to you is serve her, take care of her. Inshallah, that will earn you many sawab. Maybe it will be one of the important parts of you to go to Jannah. As long as your husband and your mother-in-law do not tell you to do anything against Quran and Sunnah, obey your husband, take care of them. Inshallah, that will be one of your pathways to go to Jannah. Jazakallah, brother, because I was very confused. I thought that I was only serving her when I wanted to, and I would not serve her when I don't want to because it was not my duty. And my husband understand he would also never say because he knows that it is not my duty. Do we have any other non-Muslims before we go to the next question? We do with this mic? Okay, go ahead. Uh, hello to you, sir. My name is Mohit and I am employed in an IT company. My question to you is, if there is a judgment day set and after the death, everybody has to be taken care of by God and every of their good deeds and bad deeds are to be settled uh, at the judgment day. So why? Since the birth, a person is mad or throughout his life he, is, he or she is suffering from the disease and after that, I mean... The brother asked a very good question that if there is good and bad, based on that on the day of judgment, God will punish you or may reward you. So what justification it is that some people are born handicapped, some people have congenital defects, some people have heart problem. So is God unjust? Now, based on this information, the Hindu scholars, they came up with a new philosophy. If you realize, if you read the Vedas, Vedas speak about punar janam. Punar means next, janam means birth, next birth. Even Quran speaks about next birth, next life. Quran says that God has given you life, you come in this world, he'll cause you to die, he'll reject you again. So Vedas says the same thing. But the Hindu scholars, they could not understand that how could God be unjust? That he makes some people born handicapped, some people wealthy, some people poor. So they came with the philosophy of birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, which is not mentioned in the Vedas. He is born handicapped because in his last birth, he sinned. He is born poor because in last birth he sinned. It is their thinking, not of the scriptures. In Islam, we come in this world once and once is sufficient. Then we are resurrected and then the day of judgment. Now coming to your basic question, what reply does Islam has? Why some people are born healthy, some people with disease, with congenital defects, some people rich, some people poor. If we analyze, Quran says in several places including Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, and Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse 155. Allah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made your children and your wealth as a test for you. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests different people in different ways. 
Now, depending upon the test, if the examination paper is difficult, the correction is lenient. If the examination paper is easy, the correction is strict to justify. So Almighty God tests different people in different ways. Normally in an examination every year, the test paper keeps on changing. You don't have the same questions. If you have the same question, then where is the test? So now depending upon the examination you undergo, for example, one of the pillars of Islam is that you have to give zakat. Anyone who's rich, who has a saving of more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity. Now one person is rich, for him, he has to give zakat. A person who's poor, he has to give no zakat. So in the zakat category, he gets 100 out of 100. For the rich man, for the rich man, he may say, okay, fine, I may have 1 million dirhams. I'll give zakat only on 100,000 dirhams. Maybe he'll get 10 marks out of 100. May get 50 marks, may get zero marks. For the poor man, we say, hey, bichara hai, poor man. Actually, he's getting 100 out of 100 in zakat. For him, there's no test of wealth. For rich man, there's a test of wealth. You may think, oh, rich man, very good. God has blessed him. It's more difficult for a rich man to go to Jannah than a poor man. That's what a beloved Prophet Muhammad said. We may think it's a blessing. It may be a test. Similarly, on the other hand, the person is poor. For him to do hijab, they stay in one room. For him to do hijab or her to do hijab is difficult. For a rich man who has got a big mansion, many houses, for the lady to do hijab is easy. So there hijab is easier for a rich person, difficult for a poor person. So based on the condition, sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's easy. There are parents who may be pious. Now they have a child who has a congenital heart disease. Maybe God is testing the parents more. Now the parents may say, oh, I've been praying five times a day. Why do I have a son who has a heart disease? God is testing them. If really the parents are good, what they will say? Alhamdulillah, at least God gave me a son. So what if he has a congenital disease? Now more difficult the test, higher is the reward. To pass BA is very easy. Graduation in arts, very easy. To pass MBBS is difficult. But the moment you pass MBBS, you get doctor degree, doctor, DR. More difficult the test, maybe Almighty God wants to put the parents in Jannati Firdos. Almighty God is testing the parents with a son who has a heart disease. Yet if the parents have faith in Allah, it's a test for the parents. Nowhere does the Quran say that if a person is poor, he'll go to hell. It's more easier for a poor man to go to Jannah than a rich man. Nowhere does the Quran say that if a person has a congenital heart disease, he'll go to hell. We feel, oh, bichara hai. For him, actually, the test is easy. We, with our human logic, start thinking, poor man, so poor. Actually, the poor man to go to Jannah is easier. So Almighty God tests different people in different ways. Depending upon the test, the examination, the correction is lenient or strict. That's the reason the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 185, that Kullu nafsin Every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final recompense is on the day of judgment. So based on the test, the final judgment is on the day of judgment. Some reward you'll get in this world, some reward you'll get in the hereafter. Whenever there's any calamity, any calamity, it can either be a punishment or a test. If you're on the straight path, that calamity is a test for you. If you're on the wrong path, it's a punishment for you. Similarly, when you get something good in your life, it can either be a reward or a test. If you're on the straight path, that good thing is a reward for you. Or it may be a test for you. Wealth is not always a reward. It is more of a test for you. God is testing you that with this wealth, do you spend it in the way of Allah or not? So based on this, Almighty God tells different people in different ways. Some people are born rich, some in a poor family, 
Some people are born healthy. Some people are born congenital defect. Depends upon the test. He tests everyone in different ways. And the final judgment is on the day of judgment. Based on that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the human beings in hell or heaven. Hope that answers the question. Uh, in addition, sir, uh, to the same question, I have another. Uh, based upon your answers only, I have uh, one more doubt. Can I question that? Go ahead. All right. Uh, sir, you said that uh, Allah is going to test everybody and like that. But why Allah is doing that? I mean, why God or Allah is doing that? Uh, why, why He created us and for His joy or for, I mean, watching us from uh, up, I mean, up there and uh, Very I mean, good question. why we all, all have been created? Brother, the question, why has He created us human beings? Is He testing us? Is He enjoying using us like puppet? Very good question. That's answered in the Quran. All the other mountains, trees, they are Muslims, they have submitted their will to God. Human being is the best creation of Almighty God. The best creation, why? Because He has given us a free will. He has given human being a free will either to obey or disobey God. All the other creations, the animals, the birds, the trees, the mountains, they are Muslims. Muslims means they have submitted their will to God. Now Almighty God created a new creation which has a free will. The angels have got no free will. They always obey God. Now, after a free will has been given to you, you have a choice to obey or disobey God. After a free will has been given to you, and then if you obey God, you become higher than the angels. After a free will has been given to you, and then you disobey God, you become lower. You may become like a Satan. So it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 72, that... Almighty God asks, who wants to undergo the test? If you don't want to undergo the test, just pass. So trees, mountain, all of them said, we fear to undergo the test. The Quran says, the human beings were fools who said, okay, we want to undergo the test. Now when you undergo the test, you can either become superior to the angel or you can become like a Satan. Now, if you don't undergo the test, just pass. So we human beings, all these human beings, are the people who said, okay, fine, we don't want to just pass, we want to get good marks, and we're undergoing the test. This is a new creation of Almighty God. Not that you want to enjoy. He's giving you a chance to get distinction. We were fools who said, okay, fine. So not to enjoy, to give you a chance to get distinction, not just pass. Now it is on you and me, whether we follow the commandment of Almighty God or not, if you do, you'll get distinction. If you don't, you won't get. Hope that answers the question. Wa akhiru dawan. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Thank you. Jazakum Allah khaira. That is all the time that we do have for the question and session. So may Allah reward you immensely. Adiyah Sheikh, Dr. Zakir Naik. A big thank you. Jazakum Allah khaira.